16. Hellsbane regarded the pile of dead and wilted grass under her nose with uniquely equine doubt. She gave Caro a sorrowful look, one as filled with entreaty as any spaniel could have managed, and pawed the hard-packed snow. Sorry, girl, Caro told her wearily, all too conscious of her own hunger and of the cold that made her feet and hands numb. That's all there is. And you should be glad you can eat grass. You're doing better than I am. She doubted that the worst he'd understood any of that, but the mare was at least someone to talk to, and talking kept her mind off of how tired she was. She'd avoided settlements since she began this run back up north, figuring that whatever Ardana had decided to do about her, it wasn't going to be to Caro's advantage. They'd ridden from dawn to sunset every day since she'd left the Sky Bolt's camp, while the rain became sleet, then real snow, and the snow cover grew thicker all the time. She'd been grateful then for all of Tarmus' training, for without it, she'd never have been able to live off the land in late winter. She and Hellsbane were both in sad condition, but they were at least alive and still able to travel if they had to. The hard run was almost over now. By nightfall, she'd be at the Skybolt's winter quarters. She'd collect her gear and get on out of there. Once she had her gear, which included her mercenary guild identification, she'd be in a position to take her case to the guild itself. She looked up at the leaden sky and thought bitterly that it was too bad that Ardana would never be called to account for her blundering. Caro had no hope that Ardana would be punished in any way. After all, there was no point in punishing someone for being stupid. But at least there'd be that much warning in the guild for anyone thinking of joining the Skybolts. And Caro would get her name and record clear of any charges Ardana levied against her. Then I can go freelance, she thought chewing on some nourishing, if tasteless, cattail roots she'd grubbed up for herself out of a half-frozen stream. Her teeth hurt from the cold, and her hands ached as much as her teeth. Damn that bitch. I'm guiltless. She's the one who should get it in the teeth, but I'm the one who's going to suffer. With a record of insubordination, even if it was legal and justified, no bonded company is ever going to be willing to take a chance on me again. I've got a brand of troublemaker on me for all time. But better that than dead. She waited until Hellsbane had eaten her own rations down to the last strand of grass, tightened the girth, and remounted, the ache of her feet only partially relieved by tucking them in close to the mare's warm body. Riding your horse just after she's eaten isn't exactly good horsemanship. Sorry, Hellsbane. I don't have much of a choice. I'd spare you if I could. The mare shook herself and snorted, but settled to the pace willingly enough. They rode on at a fast walk under lowering skies, just as they had for days past counting. Long, dull days that meant nothing more than so many leagues toward their goal. But Caro's calculations had been right on the money. Sunset saw her riding up to the village that supported the Skybolt's winter quarters, a kind of snow-capped, stockaded heart in the midst of a cluster of buildings. Caro looked up and saw it in the distance and felt the same kind of rush of relief and homecoming she'd felt on riding up to the Skybolt's camp. She quickly suppressed it, but not without a lump in her throat. This wasn't and would never again be home. Not for her. The village was made up of fairly unusual buildings, if one supposed this to be an ordinary village. Three inns, a blacksmith, an armorer, and several other less identifiable places that were obviously businesses of some sort. No sign of a village market, no signs of craftsmen or farmers. The one aspect that dominated everything was that stockade at the heart of the place. Every town that served as winter quarters to a company looked like this, more or less. The company would build or buy an appropriate establishment. Several buildings were needed for a company of any size. Barracks, for one thing, and you could add armory, training ground, stables, and administrative office at the least. Once the place was up and tenanted, and past its first year of occupancy, the rest would follow. The only craftsmen that would establish themselves would be smiths and armorers. For the rest, 
members of the Merchants and Traders Guilds would take care of anything material the wintering troops needed to spend money on. And for their non-material needs, the innkeepers would take care of anything they might desire. The Skybolts hadn't been established long enough to acquire an entire town about their walls, as old members retired and chose to stay nearby and raise families. Hawk's Nest, the Sunhawk's wintering quarters, supported a thriving population of non-combatants. A token force stayed behind, even during fighting season, to train new recruits and see to the upkeep of the place. Those were usually members of the company that were no longer fit for field duty, but couldn't or wouldn't retire. If the captain judged them fit enough, and if there were positions open, they could become caretakers and trainers, especially if they'd been officers. There was no sense in wasting resources. Evidently, word of her defection hadn't preceded her, for the guard at the front entrance to the stockade, a taciturn one-eyed fellow she knew only vaguely, welcomed her in through the gates with no comments, opening the smaller side gate for her rather than forcing the great gates open against the piled-up snow. She was mortally glad he was the only one on duty. He seldom spoke more than three words in a row, and then only if spoken to first. She didn't want to have to answer questions, and she most especially didn't want to have to lie. She feigned a weariness only a little greater than she felt. She knew she and the mare were thin and worn, and those things evidently were all the excuse she needed for silence. The snow-covered training ground was silent and looked curiously unused as she rode past. She thought perhaps all the new recruits were eating dinner. But when she dismounted and brought the mare into the darkened, redolent stables and saw how few horses there were there, she realized that, for the first time in her knowledge, there were no new recruits. Evidently, since the Skybolts weren't going to be there to train them, the riders recruited and rough-trained during the summer months had been sent down south to join the rest of the company, which meant that in order to take any kind of job in the normal fighting season, what was left of the company would have to accept green recruits or freelancers who'd never been with a company before and put them right into the front lines with the rest. That was just more evidence of the kind of short-sighted thinking Ardana had been displaying all along. While it was true that the Skybolts had only accepted seasoned fighters, without proper drilling and practice, new recruits were twice as likely to die as old hands. And that was in a non-specialist company. In a company of skirmishers, Caro wouldn't have given a new recruit a rat's chance of surviving the first fight. But that certainly explained where all the new faces had come from while she'd been across the Carsite border. And it would give Ardana a fine excuse for why the casualty figures were so high if the guild made inquiries. She left Hellsbane under saddle, just backed her into the nearest empty stall and gave her a good feed, then went off to the empty barracks to retrieve her gear. There wasn't much of it, but there were warm winter clothes to replace her threadbare garments, some weaponry to replace things lost or left behind. And as for the personal gear, every little bit would help. She'd undoubtedly have to sell the semi-precious gems she'd stored to carve into little figurines this winter. The carving equipment itself wasn't worth much and didn't take up a great deal of room. She'd keep it a while, on the chance that she would one day be able to carve again. The barracks were dark, with most of the windows shuttered. Her footsteps echoed hollowly, and her breath showed white in the gloom, telling her that the place hadn't been heated at all this winter. Somehow the very emptiness oppressed her more than the entire trip back. Maybe it had something to do with actually seeing the place that should have been full of people, standing deserted. She didn't bother with pulling off her worn gloves or cloak. It was too cold. She had no intention of sleeping here. If she found herself with enough breathing space, she'd draw on the little credit she had at the woolly ram and spend the night there. She felt her way across the building and climbed the creaking stairs to the veteran's floor and sought her own little niche in the barracks. Cold penetrated her cloak, and depression weighed heavily on her shoulders. She threw open the shutter to get the last of the light. Beside her bare bunk was her armor stand with her spare suit of chain, which could be sold easily enough. At the foot of the bunk was the locked chest where she kept the smaller objects she didn't want to carry with her on campaign, 
and under the bunk was the clothes press that held the rest of her wardrobe. Winter clothing, all of it, and she bundled it all up and bound it into a pack with a spare blanket. She unlocked the chest and looted it just as thoroughly, though there was considerably less in it. Knives, her jewel carving supplies, a couple of pieces she'd finished, various odds and ends. Some were too bulky to take with her, some impractical. It was only after she'd made it all up into packs that she saw the letter, lying on the shelf above her bed, with the odd bits and carving she'd picked up over the years, the sentimental things she could not take with her. Who would send me a letter? My brother? But the seal was unfamiliar, and the handwriting on the outside none she'd seen before. She picked the folded parchment up, her hands trembling for no reason that she could think of, and opened it, breaking the strange blue and silver seal. It contained two pieces of paper. The first was a simple note, of two lines and a name. I kept the letter of our agreement, but you can't fault me for arranging the terms to suit myself. It read, If you want to redeem this, you'll have to come here, and you'll have to see me. And it was signed, Simply, Elden. The other paper was a draft, in Valdemar and Scrip, for the amount of the Herald's ransom. She would have to go to Valdemar in person to cash it in. More specifically, she would have to go to the capital of Haven, as the draft had been written on a crown account there. And it had to be countersigned by the issuer, which in this case was Elden himself. To claim her reward she would have to confront him on his own ground and deal with him and all her tangled feelings about him. It was a bitter sort of salvation he offered. If she went to him, to Valdemar, her troubles would be over, temporarily at least. She would have ready cash to tide her over until she managed to land a freelance position. She might even be able to get a position within Valdemar. Surely they needed bodyguards, personal guards, and caravan guards even there. But if she went, Eldon would undoubtedly try to persuade her to stay with him, perhaps even teaching at that collegium of his as he had suggested. And right now she had no better prospects than to give in to that persuasion. But if she did give in, she'd be right back in the situation she had fled from in the first place, first from Lorden's keeping, then from his. The idea of being completely dependent on someone else made her feel as if she was being stifled, if she did that, she wouldn't have proved anything, not even to herself. But she'd be with the one man she'd ever been able to love, to give herself completely to, heart and mind and soul, because he had given himself to her in the same way. She stood there, staring at the blank wall above the shelf, unaware that she had crushed both papers in her hand, until a clamor from beyond the gates of the stockade woke her out of her trance. There was no mistaking that kind of noise. Friendly shouts, whinnies, someone pounding on the gate. All the sounds indicating a crowd of riders wanted entrance. She stuffed the papers into her belt pouch hastily. She could decide what to do about them later. Right now, she needed to get out of there, and quickly. Artana's messengers must have been right behind me, she thought shutting out panic. I have to get to the guild before they throw me in detention. She had no doubt that Ardana would court-martial her if the captain ever got her hands on her. If Ardana had her way, Carol would never even see a guild arbitrator. She grabbed up her packs and bolted down the stairs just as she heard, from the open window behind her, the sound of the great gates being forced open, groaning against the load of snow pressed up against them. She thought about her possible exits as she ran down the stairs and out the side door of the barracks. There was a back postern gate that self-locked right behind the barracks. Caro waited for a moment until she was certain that no one was in a position to see her, then dashed across the open space between the buildings into the stables. She fumbled open the stall door and grabbed Hellsbane's reins to lead her out. Now she heard people and horses milling around just inside the gates. At least twenty if not more. It would take them a few more moments to get organized, 
Then they would have to explain their mission to the guard, and the guard would have to remember what direction she'd taken. That would all take time, precious time, time she could use to make her escape. She threw the packs over Hellsbane's rump without fastening them and led Hellsbane in back of the stables, past the odorous manure pile, to the back of the stockade itself. There was the postern gate, narrow, scarcely tall enough for a led horse, not tall enough for a rider, and a real test of a rider's ability to get his horse to pass through something the animal judged to be too small. But the mare would follow wherever Caro led. Such was her training and breeding, and the trust they had built together. Caro had to pull the packs off and pitch them into drifts beside the gate to get her through, but the mare gave no trouble with squeezing through the gate, even though the saddle scraped on the stockade walls on either side of her. The counterweighted gate swung shut behind her horse's tail, and the lock clicked. Hellsbane flicked her ears at the sound and wickered nervously. Caro pulled the packs out of the snow and swung them back up behind the saddle, fastening them as best she could to the lean packs that were already there. She mounted as soon as the packs were in place. Every heartbeat counted at this point. I had no idea that was so close behind me, she thought worriedly. I know we didn't make the best time, because we had to keep backtracking to avoid the towns, and I know Hellsbane wasn't in the best shape either, but I thought we were farther ahead of them than that. There was another possibility as well. If Ardana had wanted her badly enough to mount up the freshest horses and the best riders in the company to go after her, with enough money to permit them to change horses at every posting house, they could have caught up with her quite easily. And that made getting to a town with a strong representation of the Mercenaries Guild all the more important. Even if it meant riding all night. It had meant more than riding all night. It had meant riding past dawn. Caro had never known a person could be so tired, so deep down exhausted, and still be standing. She stifled a yawn as she recited her story for the third time before the representatives of the guild. Each time she had faced a different set of people. The first time was right after she'd come through the city gates. She wanted bed and food, but with Ardana's flunkies out there looking for her, she knew she didn't dare stop for either. She'd breathed a whole lot easier after she passed the door of the guild, a sturdy stone edifice that didn't look a great deal different from the guild hall of any other guild. Once inside, she asked for directions to the arbitrators. She had been sent up a flight of worn wooden stairs to a tiny office where she told a shortened version to a stone-faced secretary of some kind. He gave her a chair when she'd finished and went off somewhere. When he came back, his stone-like demeanor had thawed a little, and he took her to another office. That was where she had told the story a second time, to a much friendlier and sympathetic official, one who seemed to strive to make her feel comfortable and to convince her that she could trust him. She did, but mostly because she was convinced she was in the right, and she was only trying to protect herself and her standing within the guild. She could see how someone with a falsified tale could easily get himself in deep trouble with this man. He had asked many careful questions, all designed to make her incriminate herself or uncover flaws in her story that would reveal it to be a fabrication. That had taken the better part of the morning, and she was dizzy with fatigue when he was finished with her. She didn't try to touch his thoughts but she had a very real sense that everything he said was part of a carefully prepared script, and that he wasn't about to deviate from it except in the most extreme circumstances. She couldn't help but wonder how many cases the arbitrator saw that never got beyond this man. Probably quite a few, judging by his reactions to her. Although he didn't actually say anything that, probably, fell outside his prepared speeches, she got the distinct impression that he was warming to her, outside of the hail-fellow-well-met facade he presented. Once again, she was sent off to wait, this time in a little room with three other people, all as silent as she, and two of them looking considerably more harried. The third was black and blue, with splints on one arm. She got the feeling that this man was desperate, under the fog of his painkillers, 
If the arbiters denied him his perceived justice, he might well do something, something excessive. He was the first called, and she didn't see him again. Evidently, petitioners did not leave by the same door they came in, because the other petitioner was called a few moments later, and when Carol was summoned into the room, there was no sign of either of them. She found herself in a large, well-lit, barren room, empty of everything except a long table with three chairs behind it. In those chairs sat the arbitrators, two men and a woman, all three of them the very image of the perfect soldier. All three sat as erect as if this was a parade ground. All three wore identical long-sleeved tunics of brown leather, and all three wore their graying hair close-cropped. This third and final time she recited her entire story to the panel of the three guild arbitrators, who all remained as impassive and unemotional as statues. She thought that was probably a good sign. This town of Selina was completely outside Ardana's immediate reach, and had a strong town council of its own, and the administrative branch of the guild here was well known for fair play. Their completely impartial attitudes let her know they would be weighing not only everything she said, but how she said it. By now, she was exhausted, and she greatly envied Hellsbane, safely and warmly installed in the guild stables, fed and groomed, and probably now asleep. She tried to tell things simply and clearly, with as little emotional weight as possible, tried to act as impassive and neutral as her judges seemed to be. But she heard herself slurring words as if she was drunk. And so she was, but with weariness, not wine. It wasn't hard to sound impassive after all. As she did her best to make sure she kept all her facts straight, she discovered that right at this moment, she didn't care much about anything. All she was really aware of was her acute need to sleep and the hollow emptiness of her stomach. Too late, she thought perhaps that her approach was all wrong. Maybe she should have been passionate and full of righteous anger. Maybe she wasn't convincing them. Maybe they read her stoicism as the facade of someone who was making everything up. But it was too late to change now, and besides, she was too tired. It was all she could do to keep her narrative clear and answer their questions with some semblance of intelligence. Finally, she came to the end of her story, and the arbitrators came to the end of their questions. They sent her out through a second door on the opposite side of the room, where she found a small chamber identical to the one she'd waited in before her audience. It was a tiny windowless box of a room, stuffy and airless. There were three chairs, all empty, all equally uncomfortable, which was just as well. She wouldn't have been able to resist the implied comfort of a padded chair, and once settled into something like that, she'd have fallen asleep for certain. She took her seat to await their decision in the middle of the three chairs, a high-backed, unyielding piece, so tired that only the deep ache of hunger kept her awake. That, and the fact that her imagination began to run wild. Being alone like this, with nothing to think about except her performance and possible fate, only made her worry more. What if they don't believe a word I said? What if they think I'm lying? There had been no way to tell what they were thinking while she was talking. If they hadn't been breathing occasionally, she would have taken them for corpses. But what possible motive could I have for lying? Ambition? I was promoted under Ardana. Revenge? She never did anything to me directly. But that might not make any difference. People had mutinied against their leaders with no apparent reason before this. She worried the fear until the edges were frayed. But she couldn't dismiss it. It seemed to be taking forever for the arbitrators to make their decision. She got up and paced the floor, hands clasped tightly behind her back, trying to walk softly, but unable to keep her boots quiet against the hard wooden floor. What if Ardana's flunkies went here first, instead of the winter quarters? What if they told Ardana's version, and the arbitrators believe her? It was possible. If they had changed horses and gone by the trade roads, 
they could have beaten her here easily. But she can't argue away the casualty rate. She can't argue away her lack of strategy. There were plenty of excuses Ardana could make for those things, though, and Caro's imagination was quick to supply them. Illness, inexperience, treachery on the part of their allies, unfamiliar territory, a chain of command fundamentally new to their positions. She had managed to work herself up to such a pitch that when the door opened behind her, she jumped and uttered a muffled and undignified squeak of alarm. She was so rattled that she turned and just stood there staring at the newcomer, heart pounding, unable to speak for a moment. Standing framed in the doorway was her second questioner, the friendly middle-aged man who had cross-examined her so skillfully. He stared at her for a moment, obviously taken aback by her nervous response to the simple act of a door opening behind her. I... I'm sorry, she stammered. I'm kind of jumpy. I'm letting my nerves get the better of me. He recovered his aplomb and smiled, and this time she had the feeling it was a genuine smile and not the facade he'd worn for her the first time they'd met. I'm the one who should apologize, he said. I knew very well what you'd been through, and I didn't make allowances for it. I'm lucky all you did was jump. With that poor fellow whose case was heard first, I might have found myself on the floor with a knife at my throat. She smiled wanly, and he waved her through the door. The arbitrators have decided in your favor, Carowin, he continued, tugging his leather tunic straight with a gesture that seemed to be habit. But they want you to hear it from them. Even though this is a decision for you, it may not be everything you were hoping for. All of the tension drained out of her, leaving her limp and ready to accept just about anything. She obeyed his direction and found herself back in front of the table, facing the three granite-faced arbitrators. Now that she knew they'd decided for her, she looked at them a little more closely. All three of them were older than she'd first thought, old enough to be grandparents, though she had no doubt that any of the three could challenge her at their chosen forms of combat and quite probably beat her. They all had that indefinable air of the professional mercenary, cool, calm, unruffled, and quite able to take on whatever needs doing. Two men and one woman. All three had probably worked themselves up from the ranks. She smiled a little to herself. If they had come up from the ranks, they weren't going to appreciate what the Skybolt's captain had done to her people. Ardana was going to get short shrift from them, if she hadn't already. The woman spoke. She had the seat on Caro's left, and looked a little older than the other two. We've decided in your favor, Carowin, she said, her voice surprisingly soft and melodic. We agree that you had every right and every reason to sever your contract, and that you did so legally. That was all she had ever wanted to hear. Thank you, she started to say. But the woman interrupted her with an upraised hand. Your captain was and is a fool, she said. But there's nothing in the guild code preventing fools from being in command, or from getting their people hurt or killed. We aren't in the business of telling captains how to command. We only deal with violations of the code. The guild allows only one kind of retribution for captains of her sort, the kind you took, severing contracts neatly and legally, until she is in command of nothing. Do you understand me? Caro put a lock on her reaction of disappointment and nodded. What you're saying is pretty much what I'd expected, she replied, trying not to think of those friends still trapped under Ardana's command until the end of the company contract. Only then could they sever their relations with her. Of course, they would have one advantage over Caro. There would be no record of insubordination in their files. The woman smiled ever so slightly, the barest hint of a curve to her weathered lips. Unfortunately, no matter what we put in your record, it is unlikely that any bonded company will ever accept you again. I hope you realized that, if not when you severed, 
at least when you'd had a chance to think all this out. Mercenaries who sever contracts in the field, even under extreme provocations such as you experienced, tend to be viewed with a jaundiced eye by other commanders. After all, by their way of thinking, if you do it once, what's to stop you from doing it again? To them, it's just another form of desertion under fire. Well, that was what I thought, although I'd rather she hadn't said it. Carol sighed. I understand that, sir, she said, rocking a little back and forth to ease her aching feet. But I wonder if you really know what that means in terms of the immediate present, the woman persisted. This is the lean season. The only places hiring right now are companies. I understand that you have very little in the way of savings. You are going to find it all but impossible to find work here in Selina, and you won't have the wherewithal to go elsewhere. Carol blinked. But what about going bonded freelance? She asked, wondering what on earth she was missing. I thought bonded freelancers were always in demand. All anyone is going to check is whether or not I am bonded. If you can find work, the woman told her. You have no experience outside of a company. This is winter. No caravans, no warfare, no hunting, where someone might need a tracker who is also a fighter. No work as a city guard and damned near no bodyguard work. Nothing's moving. No one is going anywhere. I can promise you that there is no work in Selina for someone of your talents. Caro swallowed. I never had any idea it was going to be this bad. But groveling isn't going to help. I have to put a good face on this. Falling apart is not going to earn me anything, certainly not their respect. I think I have that now. I don't want to lose it. She stiffened her back and raised her chin. I'll have to manage, she replied. I have other skills. I can handle horses or train them, no matter how difficult they are. I can work a tavern if I have to. I even have some experience with medicine. Tama, my teacher, told me to learn other things because I might have to fall back on them. The other two nodded, although the woman looked dubious. Even if you get freelance work, you've never worked anywhere except within a company. She persisted. You have no idea what it's like to work freelance. It's hard enough for a man, but for a woman, I'll manage, Carol replied. I'm tougher than I look. Thank you for your judgment in my favor. I had heard that the guild was fair, and I will be very happy to confirm that. The woman shook her head, but said nothing more. Carol bowed slightly and turned. The friendly man was still standing beside the second door. He beckoned a little, and she followed him out of it. You're entitled to three days here in the guild hall, he told her. Three days, bed and board, for you and your beast. She sighed. That was one worry out of the way. Three days of grace. Three days where she wouldn't have to fret about where she was going to lay her head. I'll take you up on that, she told him. Because right now I couldn't find my way to an inn even if I could afford to pay for it. I thought as much, he replied, with real unfeigned sympathy. I took the liberty of having your things taken to one of the rooms. The food is nothing to boast about, and the room isn't fancy, but it's safe. And it has a bed. And right now, that's all I need, she said wearily. I'll work on solutions for my problems when I've got a mind to work with. Maybe I'm being too optimistic but I can't believe that someone with my skills can't find work. After a day and a night of solid slumber and half a day of hunting, she came to the conclusion that the woman arbitrator was right. There was no work in Selina for a merc of any kind, much less a female. That left other options. First, before the day was over, she sold everything she didn't actually need. That left her with one suit of armor, her weapons, her clothing, and Hellsbane and her tack. The guild gave her a decent price for the armor and weaponry. Decent by the standards of a town in midwinter, at any rate. Decent, considering that her second best suit of chain was now her best, and the suit she was willing to sell had been immersed in a river, 
drenched with rain, covered with mud, and generally abused. What she wound up with would pay for room and board for her and Hellsbane for a fortnight. She counted the pitiful little pile of coins carefully, but they didn't multiply, and the numbers didn't change. She started to put them back in her belt pouch, and her hand encountered something that crackled. She pulled it out, puzzled for a moment, then felt the blood drain from her face as she recognized Eldon's letter and voucher. It would be the easy answer. Her fortnight's worth of coin, if augmented by living off the land, would take her to Valdemar. And I don't have to do anything, she thought reluctantly. All I have to do is go. I can just collect my money and leave. I don't have to listen to anything he says. She was lying to herself, and she knew it. She shoved the parchment back into the pouch and dropped the coins on top of them with a little groan. She lay back on the bed and rubbed her aching temples. I'll go up there, and he'll tell me how much he loves me, and he'll offer me some sinecure, and I'll take it. I know I will. Then I'll be trapped, because it'll be his job, and probably it'll be no more than a token, a pretense job, to make me feel less like he's giving me everything. And gods, I do love him. It'd be so easy to accept that. But love wasn't enough. Not for her. She had to have freedom, too. She had to know that she was earning her way, not just playing someone else's shadow. No. She gritted her teeth stubbornly. No. Not unless there's no choice. I'll go to the plains first and become a nomad like my crazy cousins. And I haven't exhausted all my options. I still have two more days. As it happened, it wasn't until sunset of her third grace day that she found work. It wasn't what she had expected. She was looking for work as a groom. She tried all the places Merck's frequented, then the places that were the haunts of the city guard, and finally started trying tradesmen's inns. No one had a place for her, not even after she demonstrated her ability with a couple of surly, troublemaking beasts. One of the last places on her mental list was a peddler's inn, a cheap place mostly used by traveling peddlers and minor traders. It wasn't a place where she would have worked if she'd had a choice, but the fact was, she didn't have a choice. She walked into the stable yard and right into a fight. The conflict was complicated by the involuntary involvement of a donkey and a pony, both kicking and protesting at the tops of their lungs. Kara was tempted to wade straight in, but years of tavern brawling had taught her not to get involved in an ongoing fight without reinforcements. There were an assortment of servants and stable hands gawking at the fracas. She grabbed them all and formed them into an assault force, which she led into the fray. When the pony and donkey were on opposite sides of the yard, several heads had been knocked together, and calm had been restored. She turned to what she thought was the head groom, who now sported an impressive black eye. I need work, she said shortly. I'm a bonded freelance merc, but I'm willing to do just about anything, especially if it has something to do with horses. Think your master could find a place in the stables for me? The man squinted against the light of the setting sun, holding a handful of snow against his eye. There's nothing open in the stables, he said with what sounded like mixed admiration and regret. She turned to go, without waiting to hear what else he would say, the bitter taste of disappointment in her mouth once again. Wait, she heard behind her. She almost hurried her steps, not wanting to listen to another offer of a meal, or worse, an offer that she whore for the owner. But this time something stopped her, Perhaps it had been the honest admiration in the man's voice. Perhaps it was her own desperation. She stopped and slowly turned. We don't need anyone in the stables, the man said, limping toward her. But we sure's far need a hand like you in the top room. I don't hole, she said shortly, knowing that this inn's serving girls were expected to do just that. Hole? The man seemed genuinely surprised. Hellfires, no. Ye'd be wasted as a whole. 
Need in the top rooms for a peacekeeper. Ah, uh, what? She raised both eyebrows, trying not to laugh. Peacekeeper. Break up fights. Throw him as makes too much trouble out on the air. The man seemed earnest enough, and Carol kept a straight face. Ye understand. Men won't reckon on picking fights with a wench. See? Big hulking breed. They kick up dust just to challenge him. Wench. They don't see as worth making trouble with. Then trouble does start. They won't be looking to a winch to stop it. See? Oddly enough, Carol could see the sense of it. How did you figure this out? She asked. The man sighed. I had a winch as peacekeeper for years. Lost it to the wolflings. That's cause all we can give is room and board. Been hoping to replace her, but ain't seen nobody I'd trust, much less a bonded, that'd work for that. Carol was still skeptical, but her time was running out and she needed somewhere to go. This was the only decent offer she'd had. And how do I know your master will go along with this? She asked. The man grinned. Cause the master's me. And you're hired. If you'll take just room and board, starting tonight. It was better than she'd feared, but no place to rest or recover. Hellsbane had to winter in the corral, since the stable was reserved for paying customers. She had to sleep on the floor with the rest of the help, with the exception of the serving girls, who spent the nights with customers. The floor was packed dirt and cold, and half-healed wounds ached at night. She could understand his reasoning. He only had three sleeping rooms upstairs. But that didn't make her position any easier. The food was fresh and filling, and she could eat all she could hold. But it was poor stuff. Thin soup and coarse bread for the most part. She never felt quite right, and never regained her lost weight, even though she was stuffing herself at every meal. The inn master, a cheerful little squirrel of a man, was fair and decent to her and backed her on every decision she made. He was all right, but the rest of the staff avoided her, especially after she brained a peddler who caught her out in the stable and tried to rape her. She lost track of the days. She was exhausted by the time the inn closed and never seemed to get enough rest. Each day blurred into the next, and she was never able to get up enough energy to go out and hunt down other jobs as she had intended to. Her little store of coins steadily dribbled away, as she had to replace clothing that wore out and repair armor and tack. Even the sword seemed to have given up on her. She never felt so much as a prod from it anymore. She leaned up against the bar, carefully positioning herself in the shadows, and surveyed the crowd. There was a larger group than usual here tonight, which had Rudy bouncing with joy, but didn't exactly make her feel like singing. More people meant more chances of fighting, and more people meant that some of them would likely buy places on the floor. Paying customers got the places nearest the fire, leaving the help to shiver in their blankets. A cold night meant aches in the morning. Maybe I can talk Rudy out of something hot to drink, she thought rubbing one thumb along Need's grip. Or maybe wine. Then I can at least fall asleep quickly. Goddess, I'm tired. I wish I could have a bed for just one night. There was a little eddy of raucousness over by the door. She wasn't sure who or what was causing it, but she decided to keep a sharp eye on it. The disturbance moved nearer. Laughing and cursing in equal amounts marked the trail of one customer, as he made his way toward the bar. Finally, the cause of the commotion got close enough for Caro to see him, and she grimaced as she realized why no one was willing to take exception to his behavior. It was a city guardsman, drunk as a lord and throwing his weight and rank around. No one here wanted to touch him and risk arrest, and he was taking full advantage of the fact. Her heart sank when she saw him peering around as if he was looking for something, then grin when he finally spotted her. He shoved a couple of drovers aside and shouldered a potter out of his place next to her. Well a day, he said nastily. 
If it isn't Reedy's little she-man, what you still doing here, sweetheart? Ain't never found a man to take you out of them britches and put you in a skirt. She ignored him. At first he didn't seem to notice that she was staring off into the crowd with a completely bored expression on her face. She'd learned long ago that the worst thing she could do would be to respond at all to bullies like this one. Her only possible defense was to do nothing. Eventually they tended to get bored and go away. This one was remarkably persistent, though, and he got in one or two shots that came too damn near the bone and made her blood boil. But Tarma hadn't taught her control in vain. She kept a tight rein on her temper and continued to ignore him, even though a crowd was collecting around them, waiting to see if he could goad her into a fight. He was drunk, but only enough to make him belligerent, not enough to slow him down or fox his reactions. She'd be a fool to give him the fight he wanted. Twice a fool, since it was against the law to lay a hand on a city guardsman. So she kept silent, and finally he did seem to get bored with his game. He started to lean close, and she saw what was coming. The old ploy of accidentally spilling liquor on someone. Her, to be specific. She decided she'd had enough. Just a heartbeat before the guardsman moved, she reached out and pulled one of the watchers into her place, then slipped into the mob before the guardsman could stop her. Since she was shorter than most of the patrons, it wasn't hard to keep herself hidden long enough to get into the safe haven of the kitchen. The kitchen staff stared at her as she passed through and out the rear door, but they didn't say anything. She waited just inside the kitchen door for a moment, making sure the kitchen yard outside was clear. There wasn't so much as a cat moving out there. She closed the door behind her and rubbed her eyes with the back of her hand. They felt gritty and sore from all the smoke, and she wondered just how long it was going to be before Rudy closed up. Dear God, I'm tired. Even though her stomach was full, she felt empty, without any energy. That guardsman, I hope he leaves. I don't want to have to take him on. I don't think Rudy could protect me from the town law if I had to hit him. I'm not sure the guild could, and I'm not sure they'd be willing to either. She walked slowly across the uneven kitchen yard, treacherous where snow had melted and refrozen in ruts. The moon was in its last quarter, and cast thin light that did little to help her in seeing her way. Might as well check on the stable. Maybe by the time I get back, that drunk will have gotten tired of looking for me. Or maybe he'll get so drunk he'll pass out. Either will do. There were only two horses in the stable tonight, and both were asleep. One of the stable boys dozed beside the door, but leapt to his feet when she passed him. She patted his shoulder, suppressing a tired smile. Good lad, she said calmly and with reassurance, as she would to a dog. Just checking on things. He stared at her with wide, half-frightened eyes, and she felt the sting of rejection. She turned away without saying anything more. She knew there were several other animals in the paddock with Hellsbane, but she seldom bothered to check them. The mare herself was more than enough guard. She stopped by the fence, suddenly lonely, for any kind of a friendly face, even a horse's, but Hellsbane was asleep, and Caro decided on reflection not to wake her. What would be the use, after all? The war steed was only a horse, not an intelligent creature like a companion. Hellsbane couldn't talk to her, and probably wouldn't even know how unhappy her mistress was. She turned her back on the paddock and began the long walk back to the inn. Just as she passed the stable, something jumped out of the shadows of the stable door. Her reactions, numbed by weariness and inadequate food, were not what they had been. Before she could turn to meet or attack her, he was on top of her and hit her in the back with a scabbarded blade. She saw stars of pain and went down, breath driven out of her. The unknown grabbed her arm before she had a chance to recover and hauled her to her feet. She tried to make her arms and legs move, but they wouldn't obey her. 
she was hauled around to face her attacker, and he seized a handful of her tunic and pulled her nose to nose with him. His ale-sour breath made her cough, and even in the dim light, she had no trouble recognizing him or his uniform. It was the guardsman, still drunk and obviously ale-crazed. So you'd slip out on me, she-man, he snarled. Couldn't face a real man. Minded to give you a lesson in the way a wench should mind herself. A hand as massive as the business end of a club holding a sword hilt, connected with the side of her face, so hard her teeth rattled. That was a mistake, for the blow managed to knock her out of the stunned daze she had been in. She brought up her knee, not into his crotch, which he was expecting, but in order to stamp down hard on his instep. She was wearing riding boots with a hard heel. They were the only foot covering she had. He was wearing soft town shoes. Something cracked under her heel. He screeched and let go of her. But only for a moment. He'd taken in so much ale, or possibly other things, that the pain was only temporary. While she was still trying to get her breath and to clear her eyes of the tears of pain, he swung out and bashed her in the side of the head with his still-sheathed blade. She cried out and grabbed automatically for the hilt of her own sword as she went down to one knee, and need took over. Even while her mind was still reeling, her body jumped to its feet, unsheathed blade in hands driving straight for the guardsman. He parried clumsily with his weapon. Need came in over the top of his blade, and only by slipping and falling on an ice patch did he escape a heart thrust. He scrambled back up to his feet, if anything, more enraged than before, while Caro slipped on another bit of ice. The blade's control faltered for a moment. Still half stunned, she tried to get control of her own body back, as Need reasserted control and forced her to attack again and again, while the guardsman scrambled backward. After the second attack, he seemed to have gotten the idea that he was in imminent danger of being killed. Now, he was only trying to get away from her. Finally, the guardsman fetched up against the wall of the stable. There were lights and shouts behind Caro now, but she paid no attention to them. She was far too busy trying to get the upper hand before the blade killed the man. Need caught the man's blade in a bind and disarmed him. Caro thought for a moment, that the sword would release her then. But it held her as tightly as ever. Evidently, the man's crimes against women were such that the blade had no intention of letting him get away. The guardsman's eyes were wide with fear, reflecting the torchlight behind her, and he flung up both his hands in a futile attempt to ward her off, as Need drove toward his throat. And at the last moment, Carol got just enough control back to reverse the blade and punched the man in the chin with the pommel. As he slumped to the ground and the blade's control over her vanished, hands seized her from behind. Caro lay on her stomach on the hard wooden shelf that served as a bed in her damp, unheated cell. It hurt too much to lie on either her back or her side. She hadn't been treated badly. They'd brought her food and water earlier but stabbing pains ran down both legs every time she tried to move. So she ignored both. Her back hurt so much, she was afraid that the guardsman might have broken something. Not that it mattered. Drawing steel on a city guardsman was an offense punishable by a flogging and exile from the city, stripped of all possessions, which in her circumstances was tantamount to a sentence of death. Right now, she couldn't have moved to save herself even with need in her hand and in full control. They'd taken the sword away from her, of course, which meant she was without its healing and pain-blocking powers again. She'd collapsed in agony the moment it had left her hand. But it wasn't likely anyone had made the connection. Probably they'd assumed she'd been in the same kind of berserk rage as the guardsmen. Certainly they wouldn't have left it with her even if they had known she was injured. She didn't expect anyone to speak for her. Most city guardsmen had one or more influential friends. Rudy wouldn't dare go against anyone who could close down his inn. The guild had already told her not to expect help if she caused trouble. 
and even if he dares to speak for me, he'll have to fire me, which will put me right back in the same situation, only inside the city gates. In fact, it probably would take less time for someone to find me and kill me. I don't think even Need can fix this back in a few moments. Worst of all, she was more alone than she'd ever been in her life. There was no one in all this city who would be willing to stand by her or take her in or even offer a friendly word. Her entire family was somewhere in the South, assuming that even they still felt kindly toward her, which might be assuming a lot after what she'd done. At least if they convict me, anyone who tries to take Hellsbane is going to see a lot of hoof, she thought, between the stabs of pain from her back. I hope it's that bastard who tried to beat me. Serve him right to get his brains bashed in by a mare. She knew she should be trying to think of a way out of her trap, but she couldn't muster the energy to think at all, much less to plan a defense. All she could do was try and lie as quietly as possible and endure the pain of her back and bruised and swollen face. Slow, hot tears trickled down and pooled under her cheek as she listened to heavy footsteps passing outside the door of her cell. It sounded like a regular patrol. She had no idea how long she'd been in here, and the windowless cell gave no clues either. The fellow with the food and water had come in once, which might mean a day or only a few hours. The sound of those boots on the stone only made her more acutely aware of her own isolation. Faced away from the door as she was, her only warning that some of those footsteps were for her was the rattle of the key in her lock. She tensed herself against seizure and gasped as her back sent rivers of fire down her legs. For a moment, she couldn't think of anything but the pain. Gildsman Carowin, said a strange masculine voice. Please don't move. Please don't move. She had expected to be hauled summarily to her feet. The request came as such a surprise that she probably couldn't have moved if she'd wanted to. A gentle hand touched her back awakening agony beside which the previous several hours had simply held common aches. She yelped once and passed out. When she came to again, most of the pain was gone, subsided to a dull but bearable level. Whoever had touched her back was gone, but she sensed that there was still someone in the cell with her by the little sound she heard beside the door. She levered herself up and turned toward the sounds, Another city guardsman stood there, a real giant of a man, a good two heads taller than anyone Caro had ever seen before. Caro gawked up at him, a tiny idle part of her mind, wondering how on earth he ever found uniforms to fit him. Guildsman Carowin, the man said, in a surprisingly soft voice. Several witnesses have come forward to testify that Guardsman Dane provoked you and you took no action in the inn. The stable boy has come forward to testify that the guardsman struck the first blow. Your guild has said that you are a sober and reliable professional, with no history of troublemaking. Based on all these testimonies, it has been determined that you acted only in your own defense. Although we strongly recommend that in the future you choose a weapon other than an unsheathed blade within the city walls, she blinked at him, feeling more than usually stupid. Because he provoked the fight, the guardsman continued, Guardsman Dane has been fined and the proceeds used to pay for a healer's services which you just received. The giant paused and seemed to be waiting for her to say something, and finally she managed to get her mind and mouth working enough to string a couple of words together. So that means what? she asked. Your injuries have been treated. You'll be in released, he explained patiently, and stood aside. The door behind him was wide open, and she rose shakily to her feet to stumble out of it. The guardsman took her arm to help her. She had no doubt that if he wanted to, he could have picked her up like a loaf of bread and carried her off. But he limited his aid to only what was necessary. They stopped at the room at the end of the long stone corridor, and he took her weapons from the guard station inside and gave them to her with his own hands. As she buckled Need back on, 
she felt a hundred times better. The remaining pain vanished. That healer had been good, but need was better. She was still numb with surprise, though, as the guardsman led her up the stairs to the wooden building above the jail cells and opened the door for her to walk out. Rudy spoke for me. And the stable boy. And the guild. Is this more of Need's magic? Or is it something I've done? And if it's me, what on earth did I do to make them speak for me? But that surprise was nothing to the one waiting for her outside the prison gates. There was a crowd waiting there. A crowd wearing the silver and grey tabards she used to sport, with a device of crossed lightning bolts on the sleeve. A crowd that cheered the moment she came stumbling out into the sunlight, squinting against the sudden glare. What? She stuttered. What? Someone took her arm. She turned at a flash of familiar golden hair. Shallon stood right at her elbow, grinning like a fool. You sure do get yourself in messes, don't you, Captain? She said. Several hours later, she finally had a glimmer of the story, but only after putting together all the bits and pieces of it that had been flung at her during the long ride back to the Skybolt's winter quarters. And it took a good meal, a sleep from dawn to dawn, and another good meal before she was ready to try to make sense of it all. She called a half-dozen of her old friends together in the outer room of the captain's quarters. That, she still had trouble with. She didn't feel like a captain. And no matter how often someone called her that, she kept looking over her shoulder to see who they were talking to. She ordered hot tea all around from the orderly, feeling very uneasy about doing so, even though the one-armed twenty-year veteran who'd served Laren seemed equally content to serve her. Let me see if I've got this straight, she said, as the others nursed their mugs in hands that looked fully as thin as hers. When I walked, you lot kept Ardana from sending a hounds after me. Then you called a vote? Oh, it's an old law, part of the oldest part of the code that goes right back to the oath-breaking ceremony, Trey said solemnly. Nobody uses it much, but nobody's ever revoked it. What it means to is any company that's lost more than half its officers and a third of the rest can call the captaincy to vote from the ranks. Me and Shallon, we'd been talking about that since ye got hurt. Lots of the rest was thinking it was a good notion, but nobody wanted to start it. He took a sip of his tea and smiled ruefully. Not even me. But when you woke like that, and Aldana was going to hold you back in chains for taking your rights, well... It made everybody mad. Shallon ran her hands through her short hair and scratched at a new scar. So since we knew everybody being told about vote right, we started hollering for it. Next thing you know, Ordana's out. Out of captain and out of the company. Trey took up the threat again. So we needed a captain, and the only person everybody could agree on was you. Blessed Agnara. She covered her face with both hands. This isn't something I'm ready for. But who is? Asked a little voice in the back of her mind. The guild representative that had come with them spoke for the first time. Neither Trey nor Kynan are trained in tactics, logistics, and supply the way you are, Carowin. Their expertise stops at groups larger than a squad, and neither of them care for mages. Which is a definite liability, she thought, reluctantly. One thing this company needs badly is a couple of competent hedge wizards. How do you know I'll be any better? She asked, dropping her hands. You can't be worse, Shallon replied emphatically. You've seen for yourself how vulnerable a company is to bad leadership, the guildsman said solemnly. We think that, judging by your past performance, you would step down, rather than cause the company harm. She stared at his impassive face. He was cut of the same cloth as the arbitrators, if a great deal younger. You know I would, she thought at him, as if he could hear her. These are my friends, my family. 
It would be hell on earth to spend the rest of my life leading them into situations where some of them are going to get killed. But it would be worse watching someone well-meaning but incompetent or untrained double those deaths, and worse to ride off on my own, knowing it was going to happen. I haven't a choice. They're my people, and my responsibility. And in that moment... She suddenly understood Eldon, and the way he felt about his duty and his own people. His company was simply very much larger than hers. She tightened her jaw and raised her chin a little. All right, she told them all. You've convinced me. Shallon let out a whoop, and the others started to congratulate her, but she held up a hand to forestall them. Let's first find out if we actually have a company left. She turned to the company accountant and quartermaster. Scratcher, how bad is it? The man she queried did not much resemble a scholar. He was as lean and hard as any of the rest of the skybolts. But there was a shrewd mind behind those enigmatic eyes. He chewed the end of his pen, studied the open book before him, and muttered to himself a little. Finally, he looked up. With all the losses we took in people and supplies, Captain, we're going to exhaust the bank just replacing them. We aren't going to have enough to take us out again in the spring. We may not have enough to last the winter. The guild representative stirred a little, and Carol took the chance to read his thoughts. We could, or should, extend them alone, but I don't have the authority. She ground her teeth silently. Take a loan that would be years in repayment? And what if we have a bad year? Or a bad run of years? What then? She shifted her weight, and a crackle of parchment in her belt pouch made her frown. What in... Then she remembered. Eldon's ransom, which she couldn't get. But the guild? She smiled slowly and pulled it out, leaving the letter within. Here, she said, handing it to the guildsman. This is from the herald I pulled out of the fire. I think you can see he's played fast and loose with the conditions. Think the guild can do something about that? The flat-faced mercenary took the parchment from her, opened it, and his lips pursed in a soundless whistle. Oh, that for a mere herald? Oh, you certainly wasn't a prince. She shrugged. All I care about is that right now that little piece of paper can make us, if we can redeem it. The guildsman scrutinized the writing carefully, then suddenly, unexpectedly, smiled. It specifies that the holder of the note is the one who has to redeem it in person, he pointed out. If you signed it over to us in return for an immediate sum minus, oh, ten percent, our representative would be the holder. He'll never forgive me. Done, she said, reaching for Scratcher's pen. Send it half in supplies and weapons. The guild, I trust. The rest was over quickly, leaving Carol alone in the wardroom, her hand clenched around the letter still in her otherwise empty pouch. Slowly, she drew it out. She stared at it for a long moment, her mind tired and blank. Then she folded it and tore it into precise halves, then quarters, then repeated herself until there was no piece larger than the nail of her little finger. She stared at the pile of pieces, stirring them a little with her forefinger. A noise from outside made her look up and through the window that gave out on the practice grounds. Shallon was running a new recruit against the archery target at a trot. He jounced painfully, and his arrows went everywhere except in the straw dummy. Her own buttocks ached in sympathy. She looked down at the collection of tiny white scraps, then abruptly swept them into her hand and cast them into the fire. She stood up and strode to the door. Her orderly was waiting for her with her cape in his hands, as if her thoughts had summoned him. She paused just long enough for him to flick it over her back and settle it across her shoulders before striding out onto the practice grounds. Her practice grounds. 
her recruits. Her mouth opened, and the words came without her even having to think about them. As Shallon saw her and snapped to attention, the recruits following her raggedly. So, these are the new ones. She nodded, as she remembered Laren doing. Very promising, Sergeant. Carry on. Book Three The Price of Command 17. Carol rubbed her eyes. They burned, though whether from the smoke or her dimming lantern or from the late hour, she didn't know and didn't really care. Maps, she muttered under her breath, the irritation in her voice playing to even her ears. Bloody maps. I hate maps. If I see one more tactical map or gosh Kana supply list, I'll throw myself off a God's be damned cliff happily. The command tent was as hot as all of the nine hells combined, but the dead still air outside was no better, and full of biting insects to boot. At least whatever healer apprentice Hovan had put in the lamp oil that made it smoke so badly was keeping the bugs out of the tent. Shadows danced a slow pavon against the parchment-colored walls as the lamp flame wavered. She stared at the minute details and tiny claw-track notations of her terrain map until her eyes watered, and she still couldn't see any better plan than the one she'd already made. She snarled at the blue line of the stream, which obstinately refused to shift its position to oblige her strategy, and slowly straightened in her chair. Her neck and shoulders were tight and stiff. She ran a hand through hair that was damp at the roots from sweat, and she wished she'd brought Raslier, her orderly, along. One-armed he might be, but he had a way with muscles and a little bit of leather oil. But he was also old enough to be her grandfather, and the battlefield was no place for him. He might find himself tempted beyond endurance to engage in one little fray, and that would be the end of him. The wine flask, set just within her reach, looked very inviting, with water forming little crystal beads along its sides, and the cot beyond the folding table beckoned as well. She hadn't yet availed herself of either. She stretched, as Worrell had taught her, slow and easy, a fiber at a time. A vertebra in her neck popped, and her right shoulder joint, and some of the strain in her neck eased. Either I'm getting old or the damp is getting to me. Maybe both. The lamp set up a puff of smoke, and she waved it away, coughing, as she reached for the wine flask. And despite her earlier vow to throw herself off a cliff if she had to look at another list, she glanced at the tally sheet and smiled. She could smile, still, before the battle, before she actually had to send anyone out on the lines to kill and be killed. If only I never had to send them out to fight in anything but the kind of bloodless contest we had last year, then I could be entirely content. But a year like the last, where all they had to do was show themselves, was the exception, rather than the usual, and she well knew it. Still, the tally sheet was impressive. Not bad, if I do say so myself. It had been ten years since she'd been made captain, and there had been no serious complaints from any Skybolt, or from their clients, or the Guild, in all that time. And from the beaten force that had come up from Sajay, tails between their legs, she had built the foundations for a specialist company that now tallied twice the number Laren had commanded. And in many ways, it was four companies, not one, each with its own pair of lieutenants. For some reason that she could not fathom, shared command had always worked well for the Skybolts, though no one else could ever succeed with it. The largest group was the Light Cavalry. Next came the Horse Archers. Those two groups made up two-thirds of their forces. The remaining third was divided equally between the Scouts and the true specialists. Those specialists included messengers on the fastest beasts Karos, Shana, and Cousins would sell her experts in sabotage, and the non-fighters, two full healers and their four assistants, and three mages and their six apprentices. The chief of those mages, and the jewel Carol frequently gloated over, 
was White Wind's master class mage, Quentin, a mercurial, lean, and incurably cheerful carrot top, sent as a journeyman straight to the Skybolts by Caro's uncle. He will tell you that he wants, God's help him, adventure. The young mage's letter of introduction had read, and for a moment, Caro had hesitated, knowing that a lust for adventure had been the death of plenty of mercenary recruits and the disenchantment of plenty more. But then she had read on, Don't mistake me, niece. He is as patient as even I could want, with a mind capable of dealing with the tedious as well as the exciting. What he calls adventure, I would call challenge. There isn't enough outside of the magics of warfare to sharpen his skills as quickly as they can be sharpened. So although we are a school of peace, I send Quentin to you, knowing you will both be the wealthier for the association. So it had proved. She'd never known her uncle to be mistaken. So she took the young man on, and rapidly discovered what a prize she had been gifted with. He had, over the course of the years, managed to convince Need to extend her power of protection against magics, to cover all of the company. When she asked him how he had done it, he grinned triumphantly. I did something to make it look as if you were the company, and the company was you, he said, a light in his eyes that Carol had responded to with a smile of her own. And if Need was aware that her magic had been tampered with, she hadn't bothered to do anything about it. Now the Skybolts were in the unique position of having mages whose concentrated efforts could be directed to things other than defensive magics. No one else could enjoy that kind of advantage. It made their three mages capable of doing the work of six. Only the armies of nations could afford that many mages deployed with a group the size of a company. Most companies couldn't even afford to field more than one mage, and the Skybolts used that advantage mercilessly. After all these years, Caro still wasn't certain of how aware the sword was of the things that went on around her. In her first years as captain, it had still occasionally tried to wrest control away from her. Yet she had the impression that the blade wasn't really awake when it made these periodic trials. She sometimes thought that it reacted to her self-assertion, the way a sleeping person would to an irritating insect. When was the last time it tested me? She pondered, taking a long, slow sip from the wine flask. The water slicking the sides of the pewter flask cooled the palm of her hand, and the chill liquid slid down her throat and eased the tickle in the back of it. She closed her eyes and savored it. About five years ago, and I know I got the feeling that it wasn't going to try again. Gods, I hope not. Not now, anyway. Damned thing is likely to decide for the enemy. That was because the current campaign was against her old enemies, the Carsites, and that recollection made her smile with bitter pleasure. She had quite a debt to collect from the Carsites, and this was the first time in ten years that she'd had a chance to do so. The Skybolts were fighting beside the Rethwellen regular army, on behalf of the male monarch of Rethwellen, against the self-styled female prophet of the Candace, and that could bring trouble from need, if the sword noticed. Caro recalled only too well the time the blade had refused to fight against one of the Carsite priestesses. She didn't relish the idea of it turning on her again. If there's one thing I can't stand besides maps, she muttered to herself, it's a holy war. These religious fanatics are so damned unprofessional. Messy. That's what it was. Seems like the moment religion enters into a question, people's brains turn to mush. Messy wars and messy thinking. Messy thinking causing messy wars. The Carsites had been causing trouble since long before the disaster in Menmolith, and had continued to do so afterward. But this was the first time that the followers of the Sun Lord had ever actually moved openly against Rethwellen. The so-called Prophet, claiming to be the original prophet reborn into a female body to prove the oneness of the deity, had managed to raise a good-sized army on the strength of her charisma and the miracles she performed. 
she had moved that army into the province south of Menmelith during the winter, while travel was hard and news moved slowly. By spring, she had taken it over and sealed it off. The king of Rethwellen made no secret of the fact that he suspected collusion on the part of the provincial governor. Carol was fairly sure, from her sources of information within the guild, that he was right. The governor was an old man, a man who had suffered through a series of serious illnesses. Carol had seen his kind before, and sniffed cynically as she thought about him. Odds are he's figured out that he's as mortal as the rest of us for the first time in his life and he's been looking frantically for someone, anyone, who'll promise him a quick and easy route into some kind of paradise when he kicks over the traces. She sipped again at her wine. Carefully, it wouldn't do to have a head in the morning. But wine was the only thing that kept the dreams away. She resolutely turned her mind away from those dreams, not because they were unpleasant. Quite the contrary, they were too pleasant seductively so. The trouble was they featured Eldon, and he was a subject she was determined to forget. He can't have forgiven me for sending the guild up to collect that ransom, instead of going myself. Either that, or else by now he's completely forgotten me, assuming he's even still alive. She dreamed of him often, far too often for her own comfort. The dreams had come frequently in those first years, when she was unsure in her command, and unhappy, and lonely. Sometimes in those night visions they hadn't done more than talk, and she'd come away with answers she desperately needed. But sometimes, especially lately, they'd done a great deal more than talk. Since she was half convinced that her dreams were simply fantasies conjured up by her sleeping mind, those dreams were a cruel reflection on her current state of isolation. And while those incorporeal rolls in the hay might be what she wanted, they didn't make waking up any easier of a morning. She told herself over and over that her self-imposed loneliness didn't matter. Look at what she had built in the past few years. Most male mercenaries never made captain. Most male captains had not achieved their rank until well into their late forties. That it had cost her little more than hard work Sleepless nights and a lack of amorous company was hardly something to complain about, and she knew very well the reasons why she needed to keep herself free from amorous entanglements. Tarma had explained that aspect of command to her in intimate detail, with plenty of examples of what not to do. A captain of a company did not take lovers from the ranks. That was the quickest way in the world for suspicions of favoritism to start, and that led in factionalism and divisiveness. A captain always remained the captain, even among old friends. The hired charms of the camp followers were not at all to Caro's taste, and her peers either regarded her, rightly, as possible competition, or at best, a rival and equal power. But there was more to it than that, though most of Caro's peers would have laughed, if uneasily, if she told them her chief reason. It was asking for trouble to take someone into your bed with whom you might well find yourself crossing swords one day. You never know who's going to be hired to come up against you. Having someone on the other side who had that kind of knowledge of me, in no way am I going to take that kind of risk. She put the flask down and traced little patterns on the table with her wet forefinger. That's the one thing Tama never warned me about, she reflected, waving away another puff of sharp-scented smoke. She never told me that rank and holding yourself apart makes for lonely nights. She always had grandmother for friendship, and she never wanted a lover, thanks to that vow of hers. God's know being sword-sworn would be easier than overhearing some of what goes on in the tents after dark. She could ignore it. I try but can't always. Being captain didn't necessarily mean an empty bed, even if you didn't much care for whores. More than a few of her fellow captains went through wenches the way a ram goes through a flock of ewes. They tended to pick up country girls, bedazzled by the glamour and danger. 
and abandon them when their lovers got a little too possessive. Caro had never been able to bring herself to just lure off some wide-eyed farm boy, as if she was some kind of mate-devouring spider. And besides, more than half the men she met these days seemed overwhelmed by her. I've been awfully circumspect, she thought, with perverse pride, looking back over the years. There were three, no, four minstrels. That worked. All four of them were too cocky to be intimidated by me. The only problem was, while the skybolts make good song fodder, they don't offer much more to a rhymester. So I lost all four of them to soft jobs in noble houses. There were a couple of merchants, and that didn't last past a couple of nights. And there was that healer. But every time I went out, he was in knots by the time I came back, figuring it would be me that got carried in for him to fix. That alliance was doomed from the start. It's been cold beds for the past two years now. Unlike Darren. She had to smile at that, because this campaign against the Carsites had brought her back into personal contact with the boy, as she had continued to think of him. Meeting him again had forced her to change that memory, drastically. He'd matured, not his face, which was still boyishly handsome, if a bit more weathered, but in the expression around his eyes and mouth. Not such a boy anymore. They hadn't renewed their affair. It would have been a stupid thing to do in the middle of a war, for one thing, and for another, while they found themselves better friends than ever, they discovered at that first meeting that they were no longer attracted to each other. Darren had achieved his dream of becoming the Lord Marshal of his brother's standing army. One thing about him had not changed. He still worshipped his older brother. Caro toyed with the flask, holding its cool surface to her forehead for a moment, and wondered if the king knew what a completely and selflessly loyal treasure he had in his sibling. She hoped so. Over the past several years, she'd learned that loyalty in the high ranks was hardly something to be taken for granted. Darren was as randy as Caro was discreet. He hopped in and out of beds as casually as any of the captains she knew, and there'd even been rumors of betrothal once or twice. But nothing ever came of it. We're too much alike. She smiled, thinking about how even their battle plans still meshed after all these years. Far too much alike to ever be lovers again. Just as well, I suppose. He just makes me feel too sisterly to want him. Captain? Her aide-de-camp stuck his head just inside the flap of the tent. Shallon and Gaia to see you. Gods, I forgot I sent for them. Must be the heat. She stifled a yawn. Good. Send them in. She made certain two special bits of cloth were at hand, and fished one particular map out of the pile, and smoothed it out on the table. Captain, Shallon said doubtfully. Come on in, she replied easily. No formality. Her old friend, whom Caro wanted to make lieutenant of the specialist corps, slipped inside, followed by a man Caro intended to make Shallon's co-commander. A year ago, Shallon had lost Relly to a chance arrow, and for a while Caro was afraid they were going to lose the surviving partner to melancholy or madness. But given the responsibility of command of a squad, Shallon had made a remarkable recovery. She and Gayer had never actually worked together. Caro had a shrewd notion they'd do fine, not the least because they were both Shechorna. They looked like total opposites. Shallon still a golden blonde, as ageless as the mysterious Hawk Brothers, and Gayer, a native of some land so far to the south, Caro had never even heard of it before he told her his story. A true black man, from his hair to his feet. The two of them stood a little awkwardly in front of her table. She stayed seated. Even though she had said no formality, she intended to keep that much distance between them. They were friends, yes, but they had to be captain and underling first, even now. How's Belle? Shallon asked immediately. 
the scout lieutenant had been taken victim, not by wounds, but by the killer that fighters feared more than battle. Fever. That same fever had already struck down one of the co-commanders of the horse archers. I had to send him back, like Dendi, Carol replied regretfully. The healers think he'll be all right, but only if we get him up into the mountains where it's cool and dry. That's why I wanted you here. I want to buck Losh over to command the horse archers and put you two in charge of the specialists. Shallon's mouth fell open. Gare looked as if he thought he hadn't rightly understood what she'd said. He scratched his curly head as Shallon took a deep breath. She waited for them to recover. Shallon managed first. But, but, you've earned it, both of you, she said. I've been short-handed with the horse archers, and that's really where Losh belongs. The troops know you, and you've both been handling squads up until now with no complaints. I think you'll do fine. What about the dogs? Geyer asked slowly, the whites of his eyes shining starkly against his dark skin. Do I keep on running the dogs? Damn bet you do, Carol told him. The only difference this command will make in that is that now you and I will be the only ones deciding when to run them and when it's too dangerous. I know you and Losh didn't always agree on that. Geyer grinned showing the gold patterns inlaid in his front teeth. Kala iredehi ishuna, he replied, in the tongue that he alone knew. Blessings follow, and luck precede you, liege lady. I and mine thank you. You're welcome, she said, with a little weary amusement. She had yet to get Gayer to understand the difference between mercenary's oath and swearing fealty. Maybe in his land there were no differences. She turned to Shallon. What have you to say, Lieutenant? I... Shallon swallowed hard and tried again. Her eyes dilated wide in the lamplight. Thank you, Captain. I accept. She glanced out of the corner of her eye at Gayer, and Caro saw her face grow thoughtful, her expression speculative. This isn't an accident, is it? She stated, rather than asked. You picked us both because we're Shechorna, and we'll be able to work together without getting sex into it. Caro chuckled. One reason out of many, yes, she admitted. And by seeing that, I think I can safely say you're starting to think like an officer. Good. She rolled up the map in front of her and passed it across the table to them. Shallon took it. This is the initial battle line for tomorrow. I want you two to study it and come back to me if you have any changes you'd like to make. Otherwise, that is all I have to say to you for now. She picked up the two lieutenant's badges that had been hidden under the pile of papers at the side of the table. Both her new officers took them gravely, saluted her with clean precision, and took themselves out. The tent flap closed behind them, letting in a breeze that was a little fresher, but no cooler. It's going to be impossible to sleep tonight without some help. Caro sighed, reached once more for the wine flask and downed the rest of the contents in a single gulp. Better risk a bit of a headache than no sleep. She peeled herself out of her clothing before the wine could fuddle her and left the uniform in a heap for her aide to pick up, falling onto the cot as a flush of light-headedness overtook her. Maybe it's a good thing I don't have a lover, she thought muzzily as she allowed sleep to take her. Between battle plans and supply lists, I'd never see him, unless he disguised himself as a gods-be-damned map. What are you trying to do? Work yourself into an early grave? Eldon crossed his arms over his chest and glared at her. Or are you planning on drinking yourself there first? Carol matched him, glare for glare, anger and shame burning her cheeks. She knew very well she'd been hitting the wine flask a little too hard, and she didn't like being reminded of the fact. I don't drink that much, just enough to put me out for the night, and you ought to be thanking me for working this hard. It's the enemies of your precious Valdemar I'm up against this time. Inside, she was quaking 
a cold fear clutching at her heart. She'd had her wine. She shouldn't be having this dream. Drinking had always kept the dreams away before. Oh, you're up against one faction of Kaas, all right. One minor faction of Kaas. And meanwhile, the real power in Kaas is free to... What? Free to what? Nobody's made a move in Kaas since the Prophet started a power play. So what's the big problem here? She turned her back on him and spoke to the vague gray mist that always surrounded them in her dreams, hoping he wouldn't see how her shoulders were shaking. She wasn't sure of anything. She was terrified he'd touch her. And she wanted him to touch her so badly, so very badly. You know what I think? She said before he could form a reply. I think the big problem is that I'm fighting for money. That just sticks in your throat, doesn't it? And it sticks in your throat that I'm good at it, that I could probably teach your people a trick or two, that... A hand touched her shoulder, and the words froze in her throat. Caro, he said humbly, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. I worry about you. You do work too hard. I don't have much of a choice, she reminded him, tartly, without turning around. She was afraid if she did, she'd never be able to stay under control. There are people depending on me, and you know what's really bothering you. It's that I do this for money. Eldon stepped slowly and soundlessly around her, so that he was looking into her eyes. She averted hers, looking down at her feet. This is only a dream, she kept telling herself. It doesn't mean anything. That does bother me, he said earnestly. I think it's wrong. There are other things you could be fighting for. You could be killed. And is money worth dying for? Honor. That word again. That stupid, suicidal word. It made her cheeks flame, this time with unmingled anger. Honor. Won't put food on my trooper's table. Or pay in their pockets. She snapped. Honor won't pay for much of anything. It's all very well to prate about honor when you're on a first-name basis with the queen. But my people rely on me to see that they get the means to live. But, he began, more stupid wars have been fought over honor than I care to think about. She continued inexorably, raising her eyes just enough to stare angrily at the middle of his chest. Seems to me that honor is a word that gets used to cover a lot of other things. Things like greed and ambition, hatred and bigotry. It's honorable to attack someone who doesn't believe in the same things you do. It's honorable to fight someone over a strip of land you covet. It's honorable. She looked up at his uncomprehending face and threw her hands up in the air. I don't know why I bother. At least I'm honest about my killing. I do it for money. I try to pick the side that was attacked, not the attackers. Most of the rest of the world wages war to support one lie or another. Not here, he said softly. Not us. She would have rather he argued with her. She would have much rather he'd shouted. Instead, this hurt expression, the look in his eyes pleading with her to believe him. I only know what I've seen, she said gruffly. And what I've seen says that most of what people call honor is no more than self-deception. Maybe you people in Valdemar are different. We are, he said. Please, Caro, you know me. You know what I'm like. You've been inside my mind. Right, she interrupted hastily. All right, you are different. Maybe all you Harolds are. That doesn't make what I do any less valid. The rest of the world isn't like you. And if there are going to be people out there making war on other people, don't you think it's a good idea for some of those people to at least follow a code of ethics? Not honor, but something you can pin down and be sure of. Something with the same rules for everybody. That's what we're doing. And if we do it for money, so be it. At least someone is doing it at all. She looked back up to see he was smiling, ruefully. You have a point, he said with a sigh. Caro, that wasn't why I came here. 
Before she knew what she was doing, she had responded to that smile, to the invitation in his eyes, and was locked in a mutual embrace with him. Part of her was in terror. This was real, too real. Eldon's arms felt too solid, his body too warm against hers. I'm going crazy. I must be, being alone. But the rest of her welcomed his embrace, the warmth of his lips on her forehead, the only intimate human touch she had, even if it wasn't real. I didn't want to argue with you, he said in her ear. I am worried about you. You're trying to do too much. You take too much on yourself, and you bottle up your own feelings, never let anything out. You're going to destroy yourself this way. You can't be everything to everyone. I thought you said you didn't come here to argue with me, she heard herself saying. Keep that up and you'll start another one. Oh, Carol. He shook his head, and she looked up into his eyes. Carol. What am I going to do with you? You might try. He stopped the words with a kiss. A kiss that led to more kisses, and then to something more intimate than mere kisses. Hands warm on skin, illusory clothing vanishing as they touched each other in wonder and pleasure and joy. Blessed Agnera! Carol woke up with a start, and the moment she was actually awake, she began to shake with terror. The wine hadn't worked. The dreams were back, more vivid than ever, and the wine hadn't helped. This one? It had been real. Too real. Too close to home. Part of her had wanted it. That was the worst thing. Part of her had welcomed not only the dream, but the fantasy lovemaking. She flung off the light blanket and sat up on the edge of the cot, shaking. I'm going mad. I'm truly going mad. It's all been too much for me. Easy to believe she was going mad. Easier than to believe that she had created the dream because she missed Eldon and wanted him so much. Before she realized it, tears began to burn her eyes and her throat closed. She buried her face in her hands. It wasn't a mistake. It never could have worked. We... Oh, gods. Oh, Eldon. Seizing the flask of water that stood beside her bed, she drank it dry, hoping to drown the tears. Instead, they only fell faster, and she was helpless to stop them. As helpless as she was to stop the loneliness that was the price of command. She seized her tunic, groped for her cloak, and went out into the cool night, hoping to pace away the doubts, the fears, and most of all, the memories. This place had been pretty, before warfare had scarred the land. Low rolling hills covered in grass, tree lines that marked stream beds and river bottoms. Now the grass was trampled and dust rose above the scuffling armies like smoke. Sun burned down onto the battlefield like Vicandus's own curse. Caro stood beside her old friend, magnificent in his scarlet cloak of the Lord Marshal, and squinted into the distance. Beside her, Geyer stood as impassively as a black stone statue. She could not imagine how he was able to stand there and look so cool and unmoved. Maybe he doesn't feel the heat. Maybe this isn't that bad to him. If that's so, I don't think I ever want to visit his homeland. Up until now, the Prophet had held several groups of infantry in reserve. It looked as if those last groups on the Prophet's side had finally joined the battle. This is it, Darren said quietly, confirming her observation. The Prophet just committed herself entirely, and so have I. If we don't win this one, you'll lose the war the province, and a hell of a lot of face, Caro finished for him, wiping her sweaty face with a rag she kept tucked into her belt. But that won't be the worst of it. If you lose, she'll have a power base, and you'll have to fight her every time you turn around, or you'll lose the country to her a furlong at a time. 
she scowled, though not at him, but rather at the thought. Beside them, a handsome and very young noble assigned as Darren's aide looked puzzled. Why is that, my lord? he asked. Won't she be content with what she's won? Darren snorted and wiped his own face with a rag no cleaner or fancier than Caro's. Not too damned likely. If we don't eliminate her now, it'll prove that her god really is on her side. And we'll be fighting religious fanatics all over Rethwellen. This kind of holy war is like gangrene. If you don't get rid of it, it poisons the whole body. If we can't burn it out, it'll kill us all. The young aide gave Caro a sideways glance, as if asking her to confirm what Darren had said. She'd already discovered that she had a formidable reputation among Darren's high-born young fire-eaters. She was using that reputation to reinforce his authority. There could only be one commander of all the forces, just as there could only be one captain of a company. You're dead right about that, my lord, she said, answering the boy's glance without speaking to him directly. I can't think of anything worse than fighting a religious fanatic especially one that's sure he's going to some kind of paradise if he dies for his god. That kind will charge your lines, run right up your blade and kill himself in order to take your head off. She peered through the sun, the heat haze, and the dust, and cursed again under her breath, resolutely shaking off the weariness that was the legacy of her sleepless night. It was pretty obvious that both armies had stalemated each other. Her people were out of it, for now. They'd done what they could early this morning, and now they were behind the lines, taking what rest they could and awaiting further orders. And with only a handful of dead and twice that wounded. New recruits, mostly, and no one I really knew well. Gods pass their souls. For once, she wasn't having to prove herself and her company to anyone. Darren had made her pretty well autonomous. He trusted her judgment and her battle sense. He knew she had twice the actual combat experience he or any of his commanders had. He knew that if she saw an opening where the Skybolts could do some good, she'd send them. That was more trust than Caro had gotten from any other commander, and she wondered if he treated all mercenary captains like that, or only her, because he knew her. Right now, the action was all afoot, and hand to hand, and there was no place for a mounted force to go except for the heavy cavalry, who kept trying to plow through the enemy lines without getting trapped behind them. A glitter of sun reflection caught her eye, and she grimaced at the shrine of the Candace anchoring the left flank. The damn thing is the rallying point for the entire line, she thought angrily. Every time those idiots haul it forward a couple of paces, the whole left flank follows it. It was pulled on clumsy rollers by nearly a hundred of the most manic of the Prophet's followers. Every day now, they'd added captured booty and ornamentation to it, making it more impressive, more elaborate, and doubtless making it heavier as well. The latest trick had been to gild the roof. That was what had caught her eye, the shine of sun on gold leaf. She wondered how many poor peasants had been starved to pay for the ornamentation. Another blur of motion caught her eye, and one more familiar, the yellow-gray streak that marked the passage of one of Geyer's messenger dogs behind the lines. The poor beasts looked like nothing more than bags of bone, but they moved like lightning incarnate. Geyer had brought them with him when he joined. Carol gathered that in his country, men raced the pups the way the folk of the North raced horses. He had the notion that they could be used as messengers, but only Caro had been willing to take a chance on his idea. They were amazingly intelligent for their size, once they knew that a particular human carried a horn full of lumps of suet or balls of butter on his belt. They had that person's name and scent locked in memory for all time, and anyone could put a message in their collars and tell them to find that person, and they would, no matter what stood in their way. The scrawny little beasts would literally race through fire for a bit of fat, Geyer had once said, laughingly, that if you buttered a brick, they'd eat it. The little dog evaded people and horses with equal ease, then stopped dead for a moment. 
Before Caro had a chance to ask Geyer what was wrong with it, the beast was off again, this time streaking in their direction, so low to the ground that his chest must be scraping the earth. Meant for me, which means you, Captain, Geyer muttered, as the dog dove fearlessly among the hooves of the Skybolt's horses and out the other side of the picket lines. She recognized it now by the scarlet collar. It was the one they'd sent with Shallon's scouts. It flung itself through the air, landing in Geyer's waiting arms, panting, but not with exhaustion. This punishing heat was no more bother to Geyer's dogs than to Geyer himself. The black lieutenant gave the little animal his reward and passed the message cylinder from its collar to Caro. She opened it and scanned the short scrawl with a sinking heart. Shallon had seen something important and had dutifully reported it, and Darren would most certainly see the way to break the deadlock that Shallon's observation opened up. She knew how he thought, and it was the only logical course of action. Only now, it was no longer counters on a sand table they put at risk. It was her men's and women's lives. But something had to be done, or they'd risk more carcite intervention before they had neutralized the prophet. Even if it meant her people would die. And if by some chance he doesn't see it, I'll have to point it out to him. Gods have mercy. Her throat closed. She passed him the note without comment. His brows creased as he puzzled out Shallon's crabbed and half-literate printing. Then he looked up into her eyes. She says there's a way to get to the shrine, coming up the bed of the stream. Carol nodded and cleared her throat discreetly. They know what they're getting paid to do. But if you send foot, they'd see you coming in time and reinforce the lines there. But if I sent horse archers with fire arrows, they'd move too quickly for the Prophet's commanders to see what we were up to and maneuver foot into place. And if the shrine goes, the whole army will panic. Carol closed her eyes for a moment to think. There might yet be a way to spare her people. We've tried this before, she reminded him. Getting the shrine was one of the first things we thought of, and we couldn't even touch it. But not using the horse archers, he retorted. We didn't have a clear shot at it with the archers before. We tried for it using magic. It's shielded against magic, but I'd be willing to bet it isn't shielded against plain old fire arrows. It wasn't shielded against that ballista shot that took off a corner of the roof. If it can be hit, it can be burned. Dear gods, there's no hope for it. Either they go in, impossible odds and all, or we lose. Her stomach nodded, and her throat ached with sorrow for the slaughter to come. Bad enough to send her people into an ordinary battle, where the odds were in their favor because of their strike-and-run tactics, but this? She swallowed stared off into the distance and tried to think of them as markers on a table. Running the tactic straight, she'd lose about half of those that went in. But she had the only force that could get in, get the job done and get out. It's a suicide mission, half of her cried in agony. It's necessary, said the other half, coldly, logically. She took a deep breath lowered her eyes and looked straight back into Darren's, and saw that he didn't like the odds any better than she did. He hated the cost of this as much as she. She saw the same pain she felt in the back of his eyes, and it steadied her. All right, she said. Give me time to set this up, write to requisition what I might need from your quartermaster, then get us an escort in and out. Leave the rest to us, Gaia on me. She turned on her heel and walked off without another word. How can I even up the odds? There has to be a way. The black man whistled to his dog and followed after her as she strode down toward the picket line and the rows of horses drowsing in the sun, oblivious to the battle beyond. Get me Quentin, she called as she reached the lines and lounging fighters jumped to their feet. She scanned them, looking for the bright white of lieutenant's badges. She spotted one and, providentially, 
It was exactly the person she needed most. Losh, she ordered, not slacking her pace in the least as she kept straight on through the lines. Get the horse archers to the healer's tent. The rest of you, at ease. A third of the sky bolts went back to their scraps of shade. Veterans enough to know and follow the maxim that a fighter rests whenever he can. The rest left their beasts in the care of friends and followed after her to the healer's tent. Quentin turned up just as she got there, popping out of the healer's tent so suddenly he seemed to appear out of the air, like one of his illusions. And seeing that started an idea in the back of her mind. She left it there to simmer a while as she gathered her troops around her and explained the mission. The horse archers sat or stood, each according to his nature, but all with one thing in common, absolute attention and complete silence. As Caro drew a rough map in the dust and laid out the plan, she couldn't help but notice how appallingly young the gathered faces were. One and all, they were veterans, yes, without a doubt, but none was over the age of twenty-five. Most were under twenty. Young enough to believe in their own immortality and invulnerability. Too young to really understand what bad odds mean, or really care if they do know. Each and every one of them thinks he can beat the odds and the omens, however unfavorable. She felt sickened, as if she was somehow betraying them. As she completed her explanation, the glimmering of an idea burst into full flower, and she turned to Quentin. You're in on this because I want you to do something to make them harder to hit. Maybe make them harder to see, she told him. They're already going to be moving targets. I want you to make it so hard for the enemy to look at them that he has nothing to aim at. He scratched his peeling nose thoughtfully. Like most redheads, he sunburned at the merest hint of summer. That was probably why he had been in the healer's tent, either sensibly avoiding injury or getting his burn seen to. I can't make weapons bounce off him, Captain, he replied uneasily. I think I know what you're thinking of, and I'm not as good as your grandmother was. You haven't got the power to pull that spell that makes them look like they're a little off where they really are. And I sure as hell can't make them invisible. That wasn't what I had in mind, she said, impatient with herself for not knowing how to explain clearly what she did want. You're damned good at illusion. There's a lot of sun out there today. Hellfire is the way it comes off that shrine roof you get spots in front of your eyes trying to look at it. What about if I get really shiny armor issued for everybody? Can you do something to make it brighter? Quentin brightened immediately. Now that I can do, he enthused. I can double the light reflecting off of it, at least, maybe triple it. Good man. She slapped him lightly on the back, and he grinned like a boy. You work on that while I see what I can do about armor. In the end, she scrounged shiny breastplates and helmets from Darren's stores for all of her horse archers, and Gayer had the clever notion of fixing mirrors to the top of every nose guard and the nose band of every bridle. Quentin worked a miracle in the short time she gave him. Not only did he concoct the spell, creating it literally from nothing but the light-gathering cantrip mages used when working in a dimly lit area, but he managed to cast it so that the sky bolts themselves were immune to its effects. That's the best I can do, he said finally. Carol watched the effect on some of Darren's troopers. They winced and squinted and eventually had to look away. She nodded. It wasn't full protection, but it would tilt the odds farther in their favor. Now all they have to worry about are the arrows shot at them unaimed, and hope none of the prophet's officers get the bright idea of just letting fly en masse. Quentin, You've outstripped what your training says you should be able to do, she told him honestly and gratefully, mopping her neck with a rag. You've managed a brand new spell in less than a candle mark. I think my uncle would salute you himself. Quentin glowed, and not just from his sunburn. Caro turned to one of the junior mages, a grave, colorless girl whose name she could never remember. Jana, that's it. Jana, is the way still open to the shrine? 
Jana's eyes got the unfocused look she wore when she was using her powers to see at a distance. Yes, she said, in a voice as flat and colorless as the rest of her. As open as it's ever going to be. Carol looked over Jana's head at the rest of the horse archers. The plan is simple enough. You with the fire arrows, ride in the middle. The rest of you try to keep them covered and yourselves alive. Get in and get out. We're not in this for glory or revenge, so don't take stupid chances. Got that? The fighters grunted, or nodded, or otherwise showed their assent. At least the foolhardy were weeded out early, she thought, watching them mount up with an aching heart and an impassive face. If they wanted out of this life, they could get out. She saluted them as they wheeled their mounts and took off at a gallop. Losh was leading them in a feint toward the center of the left flank. Only at the last moment would they turn and rush up the watercourse. By then, they would be out of unaided sight, and she would not have to watch them fall and die. They'd do this if I wasn't captain, she told herself for the hundredth time. This is what they're good at. It's their choice. And if I didn't lead them, someone else would. Someone with less care for them, maybe, or less imagination. And as always, as she waited for the survivors to return, the words comforted her, not at all. 18. Darren finished the last of his dispatches and slumped at the folding desk in his tent, very glad that he'd brought an aide who knew massage. Right now, he was torn equally between a tired elation and a sense of deep and guilty loss. When the horse archers had moved in, the shrine went up in a glorious gout of flames, just as he and Caro had planned. And exactly as he and Caro had known it would, the prophet's line collapsed in a panic. The only thing they had not predicted was how total the rout would be. But now that he thought about it, the reaction only made sense. The Candace Sun Lord was a god of the sun, hence fire, and when his own shrine went up in flames, it must have seemed to the prophet's followers that the god himself had turned against them. After that, it had been so easy to defeat them that an army of raw recruits could have handled the job. The worst casualties were from men who had gotten between the fleeing Carsites and the eastern border. He'd heard the Carowinds people got in and out with about 25% loss, which was excellent for such a risky undertaking. Excellent, except that these aren't just numbers we're talking about, or the counters we used to plan strategy with. Those numbers represented people, Caro's people, fighters that she's recruited and trained with, and promised to lead intelligently. He stared at the papers on his desk without really seeing them knowing how she must be feeling. It wasn't quite so bad for him now that he was Lord Marshal of the entire army. He didn't, couldn't, know every man in his forces the way Caro knew every fighter in hers. But he remembered very well how it had felt to lose even one man, back when his commands were smaller. He stood abruptly. I'll go see her. It helped me to have Lord Vole to unburden myself on. Maybe I can do the same for her. I'm supposed to see if she's willing to come talk to my brother anyway. And I can bring a horse arch as a bonus at the same time. Gods know they've earned it. My coffers are plump enough. I can afford it. Bin, he said, not quite shouting, but loud enough for his orderly to hear. The grizzled veteran of a dozen tiny wars slid out of the shadows at the back of the tent, coming from behind the screen that kept his sleeping area private. The man saluted smartly. Zuh he said, and waited for orders. They were not long in coming. Saddle my palfrey and get me, hmm, two gold per head for those horse archers Captain Carowin sent in. The orderly nodded and saluted again. Sir, general funds or your private coffer? Private, Bin. This is between me and the captain. If my brother decides on an extra bonus, that'll be a crown decision. Sir, Begging the Lord Marshal's pardon, but they deserve it. Don't generally see mercs with that kind of guts. The man's face remained expressionless, 
but Darren fancied he caught a gleam of admiration in his eyes. That, in itself, was a bit of a surprise. Ben seldom unbent enough to praise anyone, and never a mercenary, not to Darren's recollection. No pardon needed. As it happens, I agree with you. He straightened his papers and locked them away in the desk as the orderly moved off briskly to see to his orders. He mounted up and rode off as the first torches were lit along the rows of tents. He had left his scarlet cloak back in the tent, so there was nothing to distinguish him from any other mounted officer, and the men paid him no particular heed as they went about their business. The dead had been collected and burned. The wounded were treated and would either live or die. The survivors tended to themselves now, either celebrating or mourning. Mostly celebrating. Even those who mourned could be coaxed into forgetting their losses for an hour or two over the strong distilled wine he had ordered distributed. They'd have wicked heads in the morning, those who were foolish enough to overindulge. But that was all right. If their heads ached enough, it would distract them from the aches of wounds, bruises, and hearts. He passed over the invisible dividing line between the camp of the army and that of the mercenaries, and was, as ever, impressed by the discipline that still held there. Victory or no? Caro's people still had sentries posted, and he was challenged three times before he reached the camp itself. The skybolts had lanterns instead of torches, and innovation he noted, and made up his mind to copy. Torches were useless in a rainstorm. Lanterns could be used regardless of the weather. And lanterns, once set, didn't need the kind of watching torches did. It was just the kind of detail that set the skybolts apart from the average mercenary company. By the time he reached the actual bounds of the camp itself, word of his coming and who he was had somehow, in that mysterious way known only to soldiers, preceded him. Since he was not in uniform, he was hailed only as Milord Darren. But it was obvious from the covert looks at his bulging saddlebag and the grins of satisfaction, or envy, from those who were not archers, that these men knew of his penchant for delivering bonuses, and knew who those bonuses were due. He asked after Carowin and was directed to the command tent. All about him were the sounds of the same kind of celebration as back in his own camp, but more subdued, and there were fewer bonfires, and nothing like some of the wildness he'd left back there. He dismounted at Caro's tent, and handed the reins of his horse to one of the two sentries posted there, taking the saddlebag with him. When he pushed back the flap and looked inside, Caro was bent over a folding table identical to his own, going over lists. The lantern beside her seemed unusually smoky, and the pungent odor it emitted made him sneeze. She looked up, smiled wanly, and nodded at a stool beside the table before going back to her task. Her eyes were dark-rimmed and red, her cheekbones starkly prominent. Dear gods, she looks like hell, worse than I expected. He got a good look at those lists before he sat down, Lists of names, and he had a feeling that they were the lists of the dead. He had always left that task till last, and he didn't think she'd be any different. She was writing little notations after each name. Most looked like other names, which made him think she was probably noting who inherited the dead fighter's possessions. Before a very few of those names, she made a little mark. Those must be the ones with relatives the one she has to write the letter for. He craned his neck a little, shamelessly curious. That was the single task he had hated the most. Still did hate, since he still had to write letters for the families of his officers, from lieutenant upward. There don't seem to be a lot of those. He grimaced a little. Dear gods, what a sad life they must lead that so many of them live and die with no one to mourn their loss except their fellows. Caro sighed and reached for a scrap of cloth to clean her pen. Well, that's done, she said, tossing her long blonde braid over her shoulder. All but the letters. Damn. For a moment, she was silent, 
chewing absently on the end of her pen, and he couldn't help but notice that her nails had been chewed down to nothing. At least most of my people don't have anyone outside of the company, and a damned good thing, too. Darren couldn't help himself. He was so surprised to hear her voice and opinion so exactly opposite his that he blurted out the first thing that came into his mind. Good, he exclaimed. You say that's good, demon fire, Caro. How can you say something like that? He could have bitten his tongue and waited in the next instant for her to snap some kind of angry reply. When she didn't, when she only gave him a raised eyebrow eloquent with unspoken irony, he was just as amazed as he had been by her initial bald statement. She's changed, he thought numbly. She's really changed in deep ways that don't show. Maybe that's what's wrong. She feels things even more now. But there seemed to be a deeper trouble there, something more personal. If you're going to make your living by selling your sword, she pointed out dryly, pointing her pen at him like one of his old tutors used to, it's a pretty stupid idea to burden yourself with a lot of dependents, who don't or won't understand that you're basically gambling with your life, betting on the odds that you won't be killed. But, he started to object, no buts, my friend, she said emphatically. My people, by the time they've seen one whole season, know exactly what they're getting into. To tell you the truth, it's your people I feel sorry for. You have all these farm boys and merchant sons, minor nobles and conscripts swept up off the streets, all of them burdened with parents and sibs, friends and lovers. And when they become just another target, how do you explain to those people that their precious, immortal child is embracing the shadow lover? Hmm? He hung his head, unable to answer, because he'd never been able to find a way that convinced even himself. War is a waste. It's my job to keep it from wasting as little as possible. At least my people and their people know what they're getting into, she said, her voice going dull with weariness and perhaps with emotion that she refused to display. And if it so happens that they find someone who makes them think again about laying their life on the line for nothing but cash, they tend to get out before it ever comes to the letter. Your people don't have that luxury. They're in it until you let them go, or they're dead. He squirmed on his stool. Her words had cut much too close to the bone. Trust Caro not to be polite about it. And maybe she's right. If we're going to have fighting, maybe the only ones who should do it are the ones willing to fight for pay. I don't know. Right now I'm just glad it's over for us. He quickly changed the subject. And it's a good thing I have a new subject right here with me. He dropped the saddlebag on the table, and Carol smiled knowingly at the clink it made as it fell. Bonus for the archers? She asked and at his nod picked it up and dropped it into a little chest beside her table. I'll hand it out in the morning, and I hope you'll accept my thanks for them. That kind of appreciation means a lot to us. He nodded, embarrassed to be equating the kind of bravery that last charge had taken with the sum of two paltry gold pieces. Then again, that's their job, isn't it? The laborer is worth the hire. Where are you going now? he asked. We finished this a lot faster than I'd thought we would. It's barely past midsummer. Have you got another job lined up? She shook her head, which surprised him a little. We'll go straight to winter quarters, she said. Remember, you hired us before Vernal Equinox because the prophet had stolen a march on you in the winter. It's been plenty long enough for us. We don't need to take another job this season and we haven't needed to take winter jobs since the second year I was captain. Ending early in the season will give us a head start on training the green recruits, schooling new horses, healing up. She noted his surprise and chuckled. That's right. Tama never taught you all that, did she? Winter quarters is what makes a good company stronger. When we can winter up, we get a chance to learn without killing anybody, 
and we get a chance to get everything healed right. There's another side of it, too. Wintering is where we become, well, a kind of a family, if that doesn't sound too impossible to you. And since the Skybolts don't need to take the extra jobs anymore, I'll be damned if I cheat them out of that rest time. She fixed him with a sharp glance, a look that told him that if he'd been considering offering them hire for the winter, he'd better change his mind. But since that wasn't what he'd had on his mind at all, he smiled right back at her, and her expression softened and relaxed. Is there any reason why you can't leave them for a month or two? He asked, innocently. Well, no, she replied, obviously wondering why he would ask that particular question. She waited for a reply, but he simply smiled at her, until she said impatiently, All right, why do you want to know that? Because my brother wants to meet you, and this seems like a good time. He grinned at her blank stare and continued. Tama trained the lot of us, remember? But she trained us a little differently than the way she trained you. She knew you were going to end up a higher sword, so she gave you things she never gave us. My brother wants to pick your brain. On what? She asked, with a hint of suspicion. Nothing you wouldn't be able to tell us, Darren assured her. He wants to know about all the bonded companies doing business, for one thing. Things the Guild won't tell us, like who can't work with whom, what weaknesses each captain has. You're the best, Caro. Everybody says so. We want to know why. We want to know if it's something we can copy. We know you'll be honest with us, and we'll make it worth your while. I don't take bribes, she replied harshly. You won't get me to tell you guild secrets. We don't care about guild secrets, and it's not a bribe, he said quickly. Just a bonus for the information. Free run through the Royal Armory. Your choice. Whatever you can carry away in three wagon loads with two horse teams. We've got a lot of good horse gear in storage, because we don't have a lot of mounted fighters. Besides, I want to catch up on what's happened to you the last fifteen years. She started to answer, then gave him a careful, measuring look, and hesitated. Darren, she said slowly, and a little sadly. I hope this isn't a try at reviving the old romance. That's dead, lad, and there's no mage with the spell strong enough to resurrect it. He stared at her for a moment, at the expression on her face that reminded him irresistibly of someone sitting on a tack, then relieved her by bursting into honest laughter. Romance, he squeaked unable to get his breath. Romance! With the fire mare herself! The woman who thinks a seductive garment is one that doesn't have armor plating on it? With the captain my own people look to before they trust my strategy? Caro stiffened. Then, as he continued to howl, began to unbend a little. Well, Caro, you're a handsome woman, but God's help me. I don't fancy sharing my bed space with you and that. He pointed, and she turned to see that her sword was lying across her cot with the hilt resting on her pillow, as if it were a person. She stared for a moment, then started laughing too. That set him off again, and after a moment both of them were so convulsed that they had tears running down their faces. He recovered enough to wipe his eyes and handed her the goblet of watered wine on her table so that she could take a drink and get herself under control. Goddess Caro, I never thought you saw me as that much of a romantic. He chuckled again and stole the goblet from her for a sip. No, I promise you I like you, but you're the last woman I'd want to have a liaison with. You're too damned outrageous. She took another sip and made a face at him. I did warn you, all those years ago. Still, I've learned a few things since then. I can be a lady for a couple of months if- Oh, no, he interrupted her. I want you to be yourself. In fact, the wilder the better. My brother's looking forward to it. He wants you to shake up his court a little. He says they could do with some shaking up. She threw her head back 
and laughed wholeheartedly. All right, then. I'll take you up on this. I'll be there before the end of summer, as soon as I get things arranged so I can leave. This may work out really well, actually. The cousins bring horses up every summer, and I always miss them. This time I won't. I was afraid that when the second batch came up in the fall, my people would still be in the field. Perfect, he replied happily. Just send word ahead so we can give you the proper reception. She covered a yawn then, but not before he caught it. You're tired, he said, rising. I'll let you get some sleep. I'd be polite, but I'm too exhausted, she admitted as he opened the tent flap. And thanks for everything. You're welcome, Captain, he said, hesitated a moment more. She still looked haunted, and he didn't think it had anything to do with this last battle. Garrow, he said, as he held open the tent flap. I... I don't know how to ask this discreetly, so I'll be blunt. Is there something wrong? Something I can help you with? Something personal? She stared at him for a moment, her eyes shadow-laden, and looked as if she was about to say something. But then a clot of her troopers passed by the tent, talking in the slightly too loud voices of those who are just drunk enough to be convinced that they're sober. She jumped and smiled with a kind of false brightness. Nothing that a few days of rest and a few nights of solid sleep won't cure, she said, and waved him away. Thanks for the concern. I wish all my employers were that interested in my well-being. That was a dismissal if he ever heard one. He shrugged and grinned as he let the entrance flap fall. He mounted his horse, still being held by the patient sentry, and turned the palfrey's nose back toward his own camp. It's funny. We have become so different in the little things, which is where we used to agree. But in the important things, where we didn't agree before, now we think exactly the same. Responsibility, caring about your people, making sure they get treated right, holding to a personal code. It's amazing. We're more alike than ever. And I suspect she figured that out within half a candle mark after we met again. The Skybolt's camp had settled. He heard singing, softly, over by one of the fires, and the murmur of conversation somewhere nearby. But there was nothing like the riotous celebrating still going on ahead of him. She's really changed in other ways, too. She seems completely comfortable and stable, even happy, being entirely alone. Even if she does push herself too hard, trying to be everywhere and everything at once. And I still feel like there's someone out there, somewhere, another person who could be my complement and partner. And that's what I want now. I don't want a lady. I don't want someone to show off for. I want a woman who will back me when I need backing, fight at my side and take me down a notch when I need that, and who wants me to do the same for her. A real partner. He let the palfrey amble on at his own pace, saluting the sentry who stood beside the entrance to his own camp. I don't know where on the face of this earth I'm going to find someone like that, though. It'd take a miracle. Then he chuckled. But at least I know one thing. If she exists, whoever she is, she isn't Caro. The sunlight that had been such punishment on the battlefield now poured over Bolthaven like golden syrup. Balm instead of bane. Caro stood at the open window of her office and smiled. Five years ago, when she'd ordered the new watchtower built onto the barracks, she'd had a new office and her own quarters incorporated into the plans. The old office Laren had used was over in the warehouse building, not a bad place for it, except when you had to get to it on winter mornings when no one sane went out of doors. This office had the triple advantages of convenience, proximity to the barracks, and the best view outside of the platform above her. Any day that the weather was decent, she flung open the shutters to all four windows and enjoyed an unobstructed panorama of her little domain. 
Beyond the gates, the town of Bolthaven spread out in the sun like a prosperous, basking cat, asleep atop the fortress-crowned plateau. Beyond the town, acres of tended fields alternating with fenced pasture stretched eastward, and acres of grassland dotted with white patches of grazing sheep went westward. Here on the southwestern border of Ruthwellen, so close to the Pelagier Hills, no farmer settled land without having protection nearby. The town itself was less than ten years old, and she would never have anticipated its birth or growth when she'd returned to the winter quarters as the Skybolt's new captain. Besides the ransom, the single thing that had most contributed to the salvation of the Skybolt's the first year of her captaincy had been her own relatives. And not her brother, either. Her Shana'in cousins, who'd heard, by some mysterious means, of her need. They had brought their entire herd of sail horses up through the Pelagiris forest to the winter quarters that fall, camped at the gate, and informed her that they had told the world that she was having a Shana'in horse fair. That, in other words, they'd just made her their agent. They settled back and let her do all the bargaining for them. When the dust had settled and the last of the purchases had been escorted off, she found herself in possession of enough coin to bring the company back up to full strength and equipage, and the sum representing half of the difference between what the cousins would have gotten at their regular venue at Kadashana Inn and what she'd won for them this far north. Then, as if that wasn't enough, They'd brought out the horses they'd saved for her company, the replacement mounts her people couldn't afford. By the next year, when they appeared again, a small army of merchants had begun the town of Bolthaven. By the third year, it was a real town, supporting farmers who sold their produce to the fort, and shepherds providing meat for their tables and wool for a new contingent from the craft guilds. And now... The Bolthaven Horse Fair was the talk of Rethwellen, attracting far more than just horse merchants, and more horse traders than just her cousins. By the fifth year, Bolthaven was so prosperous that whole families of craftsmen were in residence. That was the sign of a really good bonded company, that ordinary people were willing to come settle beside their winter quarters. A town like Hawksnest or Bolthaven meant that the troops were reliable, steady, and stable even when idle. The captain could be relied upon to keep order, and that there was money to be had. So Caro smiled at the town, and at the brightly colored tents springing up at the edge of the town, like so many odd-colored mushrooms. Her cousins had arrived on schedule, and had been surprised and delighted to see her company back so soon. Eldon had commented on it last she resolutely shoved the false memory away, along with the memory of his sitting in this very window, with moonlight shining down on him instead of sunlight. Rest. That's what I need. And distraction. The cousins can take care of that. As soon as they get things settled, we'll have a chance to talk, she thought. I need to replace Hellsbane soon. Carol's current mount was actually the second Hellsbane she'd ridden. Following Tarma's example, she'd simply kept the same name for the new mount. It was less confusing for her and her horse. She's too good not to send back to breed, and there should be a mare from Number One's foaling ready for me by now. I'm glad they have the training of her. I don't have time to school my own horses anymore. That thought sent her to the east window, looking down on the arenas and the stables, where she checked up on the current batch of new recruits. She was just in time to see a rangy gelding with a lot of plains pony in him blunder into a barrel at full gallop. He managed to pull himself up, but the impact sent his rider somersaulting over his left shoulder as he stumbled. Caro caught her breath. Even the best rider can take a bad fall, but the recruit kept right on rolling in a perfectly controlled tumble and jumped to his feet. She let out the breath she'd been holding. The gelding didn't bolt. He stayed obediently where he'd stopped. The rider planted hands on hips and read him a description of his parentage that didn't once mention ponies. Caro chuckled as the gelding lowered ears, then head, in a gesture of submission and conciliation. 
Horses were generally not the brightest of beasts, but this one was evidently smart enough to figure out he'd done something wrong. The recruit finished his recitation, limped up to his horse's side, and remounted. He called something to one of the other recruits, backing the gelding up and evidently checking his action for signs of injury, before finishing the rest of the course. The Skybolts simply did not accept recruits that couldn't ride well, which saved them a great deal of trouble when starry-eyed shepherds, daughters, and plowboys showed up at the gate. They generally took one look at what the recruits were doing, blanched, and went back to their sheep, their plows, or to another company. Unless, of course, it so happened that besides tending sheep, they were superb riders. Most recruits brought at least one mount with them, but their beasts generally weren't up to Skybold standards. The gelding, just completing the course, was an exception. He was tough, strong, and smart, and he would probably be accepted. But for those with beasts that weren't, there was a simple solution. Every Skybolt, without exception, received a Shana'in bred saddle beast, hand picked by the cousins. That included the recruits. But Shana'in bred horses were not cheap. They amounted to half a year's pay for a recruit. That meant that for the first six months a recruit was in the Skybolts, he only got half shares, and once in the field and getting battle pay, got only three fourths of it for the remaining six months. Every would be recruit knew this before he or she signed on, which tended to weed out the ones who thought being with the Skybolts meant glamour and easy money. Already this year, four would be fighters had choked on the idea that they weren't going to get full pay and gone to find a company with less exacting standards. Carol noted with approval that the fellow who'd been spilled also had a Shana in remount on the side. As soon as his gelding had completed the course, he switched to the other horse, leading the gelding down to the farrier's end of the stables to be checked over. From what she could see of him, she thought he might be from Reuven, which meant the gelding might be a Shana in cross with a plains pony. That was a good outcrossing, excellent for working the herds of half-wild cattle down there. And from the way the rider held himself, he might be one of those mounted herdsmen, which meant he could use a bow. If he can shoot as well as he can ride, and use a sword with the care he takes with his beasts, he'll do. He obviously had not objected to paying what seemed to the untutored to be an outlandish amount for a horse, when he already had a good one. In point of fact, every veteran had two horses, and often took an entire string on campaign. Veterans knew there was never a problem with paying for remounts, not when there were bonuses to be had, like the bonus Darren had paid the horse archers and the cash from permissible looting. There was a lot of looting when the Prophet went down, she thought suddenly. Some of it good stuff from the Prophet and her priests and from that shrine. I had the stuff I knew about checked, but the troops may have traded with Darren's people, and who knows what they got. Besides, religious magic isn't always like secular magic. I'd better tell everybody to bring their booty in before trading it, and I'll have Quentin and the shaman check trade goods for curses. Intensive training and the very best mounts and equipment were what made the Skybolts in demand. Horse units were expensive to maintain. Most standing armies didn't bother. That meant that there was always work for them and very little competition. Two blades had taken the long view, and Caro continued his philosophy. Given the access to excellent horses, it was worth the time, mounts, and training it took to keep the Skybolt's corner on their little piece of the war market. Not everyone could manage that long view. Even the Sunhawks had gone back to being a company of foot after Idra's death, with only the scouts and other specialists going mounted. That sent Carol back to the north window, and she strained her eyes to estimate the number of horses the cousins had brought up with them this year. They were out in temporary corrals, ten to an enclosure, sorted as to age and sex. She grinned a little. This was going to be a very profitable fair. They told her that they had managed to talk Liha Irden into making Caro their outside agent, pointing out their high profits and the security of trading here in Bolthaven. Here, under Caro's eye, 
Not only would they need only enough clansmen to see the horses safely to the fair, if anyone so much as cheated them of a copper, the Skybolts would descend as a group to enforce the fair trade laws. And Caro always, always sent a squad back with them to see them safely to the plains with their trade goods and their profits. She moved automatically to the west window. That many horses needed a lot of fodder. But the hay and grain wagons were rolling in too, right on schedule. Not like last year when they'd been late and every recruit in the fortress had taken his turn out mowing grass for the hungry horses. I don't think there's a single clansman that really enjoys the conventional horse fairs. They worry about security for their horses when they arrive. They're constantly on guard and frequently harassed on the way there. And none of them have ever forgotten what happened to Talisadrine. They are at a disadvantage in bargaining, and there's no one out here willing to protect their interests. Except, of course, me. The hay wagon stopped at a very special checkpoint before they were ever let inside the grounds of the fair, an inspection point manned by more recruits. Each wagon was inspected from the ground up, and the recruits themselves had been very carefully instructed and frightened to within an inch of their lives by Geyer. Quite an impressive little talk he gave them. If any of you let anything past that either harms the horses or breaches our security, I'll hamstring you myself. And him standing there slapping a gelding knife into his glove over and over. And this year, Geyer had a new twist on the inspections a set of enormous mastiffs as tall as a child's first pony. Geyer claimed they had noses keen enough to track the west wind. He'd acquired them on the march home last year, but had been looking for something like them ever since a load of poisoned grain killed two horses on campaign. He wanted to use them as additional camp guards and on scouting runs. Carol was a bit doubtful of the latter. She couldn't see how Geyer would keep them from barking, for one thing but she had agreed to try them out as wagon inspectors. Their sense of smell was certainly as good as Geyer claimed, and they could be trained to recognize any scent and alert their handler to it. And their sheer size had the wagoners as terrified of them as the recruits were of Geyer. I suppose now the other companies are going to start calling us the Dog and Pony Show, she thought with a sigh. I could keep those little messengers out of sight, but I'm never going to be able to hide those monsters. On the other hand, Warrell had been damned useful to the Sunhawks. What these Mastiffs lacked in intelligence, they might make up for in strength, size, and numbers. I wonder where he got them. She still suspected they were from the Pelagiers. He had spent quite a bit of time in the company of Krahira, the cousin that just happened to be an apprentice shaman. What the shaman didn't know about the Pelagiers, the Hawk brothers did, and the Hawk brothers and shaman were probably talking more than most people guessed. We were coming up through Reuven, along the Pelagiris forest. We met up with a couple of the cousins on the way, after I'd left word of our route with one of the outriders. I remember that he and Krahira vanished about the same time, telling me he'd get back to the fort on his own. Then in he comes, just before the first snow, with the bitch and a half-grown litter of fourteen. That kind of fertility, all by itself, is suspicious, and smacks of the Pelagiers. The Shana Inn didn't use dogs much, except for herding sheep and goats. But the Hawk brothers might well have been able to produce something like Geyer's dogs on very short notice. She watched them checking out the wagons, one on each side, and it did not escape her notice that they performed their duty with a brisk efficiency that reminded her of her own veterans. Certainly, there was an odd look of intelligence in their eyes, unlike Geyer's little messenger dogs, who had brains that would shame a bird, or at least acted like it. They knew three things only. Eat, run, and be petted. I tried mind touch, but all I got was images not the kind of real speech I got from Warrell or Eldon's companion. Damn. Thinking of the companion always made her think of Eldon, and she'd had another dream last night. She caught herself caressing the smooth fabric of her sleeve at the mere thought, and clenched her fist. 
Damn him. You'd think after ten years I could forget the man. Maybe Krahira could suggest something to make the dream stop. Though she'd have to tell him why she wanted them to stop, and that could be... embarrassing. Her Shanaan cousins had much the same dry sense of humor as Torma, but they occasionally got a bit odd, even for Caro, and the Shanaan notion of what was funny didn't always match hers. It was amazing how fast the clan had grown. Once the children that had elected to take clan membership were of an age to claim it. They'd had as many young adults join them as they could provide tents for, Part of it had to be the glamour, the mystique of the clan that could not die. Certainly orphans and extra children had flocked to the Talisadrine banner once it was raised again. But part of it, no doubt, had to do with my cousin's sheer good looks. They're all damned attractive, and with grandmother's green eyes and grandfather's blonde hair, they must have been as exotic and fascinating to the Shana'in suitors as the Shana'in are to us. None of them had lacked for potential partners, and in the end, all but one had taken up multiple marriages. Like queen bees with entourages, or stags with harems. No, I don't think I'll tell Grahira about the dreams of Elden. He'll only give me a hard time about it, and ask me why I didn't just knock the man in the head and carry him off with me like a sack of loot. Besides, he's young enough to be my own child. I just can't confess something like that to a person who looks like he's waiting for me to tell him a story. Gods, they make me feel ancient. Though still small, the Talisadrine clan was as thriving as any on the plains, boasting no less than three shaman, a healer, and even a kalenadral. The last was sword-sworn by choice, rather than because of the kind of circumstances that forced Tarma to her vow. Carol liked him the best of all of them. He never turned her away when she asked for lessons, and his sense of humor was a little less mordant than the rest of her cousins. Her thought of them might have summoned them. They made no noise on the stairs with their soft boots, but she heard their distinctive chatter echoing up the shaft of the staircase long before she saw them. Hela, cousin! Eistren, one of the two horse trainers along this year, and the only one of the three who was actually related to her by blood, sprang into the room as if he were taking it by storm. He was followed at a more sedate pace by the other trainer, Sadasan, and the shaman in training, Krahira, where Eistren boasted the dusky gold skin of his Shana'in father, and his father's black hair, his mother's startling green eyes flashed at Kara with excitement. Second cousin, to be precise. Sadasan said mildly, her Shana'in blue eyes as tranquil as a cloudless sky. And both a captain of the company and your elder. A little more respect, youngling. Eistren ignored her. When a normally reserved Shana'in became excited, it was pretty hard to get them calmed down. Have you heard, Cousin Carol? Have you seen? What do you know about these Northmen, these Valdemar men? For one startled moment, Carol thought he was talking about her dream and Elden, and her tongue seemed glued to the roof of her mouth. But Krahira solved her dilemma for her by snorting. What? Do you think she is a mage like our uncle? She can't possibly know anything. These Valdemar men have only just arrived. She shook herself out of her paralysis. What Valdemar men? she asked. We have heard, heard only, that there are men from the north come to buy all that we will sell them, Sadasan said, with a fine precision of speech. We wish you to come and look at these men. You can speak their tongue and say the things that will call the thoughts that we wish to read to the surface of their minds, like little fish to crumbs on the stream. Krahira can then judge their thoughts and perhaps you also, for you had converse with one of their kind before, not so? I did, she said, slowly. The man that I knew, if he is a good representative of his people, was a good and honest man, and one who would treat your gel sutho Edrine as children of his own heart and hearth. But he was only one man. Exactly so, 
Sarasan replied. Will you come with us, cousin? I think I had better, Carol replied, catching up her weapons belt from the back of her chair and buckling it on. There's a saying among the mercs, you know, when the wind blows folk out of Valdemar, prepare for heavy weather. They tend not to stray too far from their borders. Whatever brought them here, it's going to affect us all, she thought, with a shiver of premonition. And the sooner prepared we are, the better off we'll be. 19. Captain! One of the recruits came pelting up to her and skidded to a halt. He was all out of breath, but that didn't stop him from saluting crisply. Message, Captain! He gasped as a trickle of sweat ran down his cheek. He must be first year. He hasn't learned to pace himself yet. She nodded. He gasped it out, trying not to seem as if he was winded. Definitely near. Second year on, they'd get their breath before reciting a message. People at the North Gate, Captain, from Valdemar. Official papers in order, Scratcher says. Want to see you. Shall send you to the guest house. Says to tell you that making him go to the inn didn't seem right, even if the inn wasn't already full. Good. Thank you. Is Shallon still with them? The youngster shook his head. Put Laker on him. He knows Valdemar and pretty well. She nodded. I always thought Shallon had good sense. If they have anything to say, Laker will overhear it. Fine. Tell Laker I'll be there shortly, and that he should go ahead and tell these people that. Tell him to use trade tongue. No use letting them know we're multilingual. Have you seen them? He shook his head. Pity. Oh well. Go run that message to Laker, she said. Then go on up to the north gate and let Shala know where I'll be. The young man saluted again, turned and ran off like a rabbit. Caro envied him his energy, but not the way he was going to feel in a moment after running that much in this heat. I'd give a lot to know if these are Harolds or not in advance of seeing them. She turned her steps toward the guest house inside the fortress walls, followed silently by the three Shana'in. Have any of you seen these people? she asked. Can you tell me what they're wearing? They are not Harolds, cousin, Sadasan said, surprising her with her easy use of the term in its correct context. Not even Harolds in disguise. Such a one would not be able to conceal his nature from Krahira, even without his companion to betray him for what he was. Had a Harold ridden into this place, Krahira would know, without seeing him with the outer eyes. Oh, really? That was news to her. Krahira had the grace to blush. It is only what I was born with, he said disparagingly. It is no great virtue or ability earned by study. It may not be a virtue, but it's nothing to be discounted either, she replied. Thank you for once again pulling an egg out of your ear, cousin. Or rather, Krahira's ear. So what do they look like? Do you know? Eistrin spoke up as they turned the corner of the barracks and came into view of the guest house. I had heard they were all in dark blue and silver, sober, like a kind of kalenidrol. That there are two with much silver who speak with authority, two with the little who speak only to the first, and four with none who speak not at all. Dark blue and silver. That would be the royal army. What in the gods' names are royal Valdemar and guards doing down here? Just on that alone, I'd say you were safe to sell to them, she said, as in the distance the noise of the fair carried over the walls. But I think we ought to check them out anyway. If there's something going on up north that sends them down here, we had all better know about it. Krahira nodded. It is said that war respects no one's boundaries that are not guarded, and I can think of nothing that would bring those secret folk to us except war. Pot calling Kettle black, a Shinarin calling someone else secretive. She hid her amusement as they reached the door of the guest house and the sentry, posted there any time there were guests, saluted her and opened it for them.
The guest house included a small common room, and there they found the first four of their visitors, seated at the table there. Somehow they had managed the seating so that no one had his back to the door. All four were sitting with military stiffness that they couldn't seem to drop, even over four flagons of chilled ale. They rose slowly to their feet, looking from her to the Shana'in, and back with uncertainty. Obviously, since she had no uniform or insignia they'd recognize, they had no idea who or what she was, nor how to treat her. And the Shana'in, in their brightly embroidered vests and trappings of barbaric splendor, had them severely puzzled. She ended their suspense, though not after a struggle with temptation. I'm Captain Carowin, she said in their own tongue, and accepted their belated attention and salutes with a nod. These are my Shana'in cousins. I am the agent for their horses. What can we do for you? She watched them work that through. A mercenary captain, who knew their language, related to the purportedly unfriendly Shana'in, who was also acting as a merchant agent for those same unfriendly Shana'in, who were standing beside her with undisguised curiosity, eating them alive. That was at least two outright contradictions and three real surprises. We're here on behalf of Queen Selene, said the one with the most silver braid on his sleeves, a man about a decade older than the other three, and military from his teeth to his toenails. We need cavalry mounts, good ones, horses we can depend on with very little training. While we normally wouldn't seek this far for them, word has come as far as Valdemar of this fair. Everyone knows about the quality of the beasts of the Shinar in breed and it seemed more than worth our time to come here. While we ordinarily might not trust that these horses for sale were full Shinar in bloods, the he Our information is that you are very honest, and that the fair and the beasts are what rumor claims them. Our query with the mercenary guild supported that. She hadn't missed his slip. He'd been about to say the Heralds, or even the Herald Eldon. She translated quickly for her cousins, trying to ignore the little thrill of elation that Eldon, at least, still thought well enough of her to call her honest and fair. Ask them how many they want, Sadasan said, coming straight to the point. All you have, one of the younger guards said eagerly when she repeated the question. We saw them as we were coming in. The mounts your people were training with. Wonderful. We'll take everything. The older man looked at him oddly, but didn't contradict or reprimand him for speaking out of turn. So that's the one who holds the purse strings. The older one is in nominal command, but this is the important one. Hmm. Noble. Younger son would be my guess. The other two are probably breeders or trainers, brought along as consultants. Right. Now I know who's what. She explained her observations to her cousins then turned back to the visitors. This is where I put on my merchant hat, she said. Only it's an odd sort of merchant hat, because I am not going to urge you to buy everything with legs in sight. First of all, only about half the horses here are Shana in blood, and of those, not all of them are going to be suitable for cavalry mounts. Yes, they've all been broken, and given some training that involves fighting, but it may not be what you want. The Shanaan feel very strongly about their beasts. The name they call them means Younger Sibs. If they think you're going to put one horse to a task for which it isn't suited, they won't sell you any. The purse holder opened and shut his mouth twice, without saying anything. The one in charge blinked, as if he was so surprised by her response that he wasn't certain he'd heard it right. And in any event, these are light beasts good for skirmishes, horse archers, and light cavalry. So, has Valdemar ever run any troops like that before, so that you know what to look for? She waited for a response. The one in charge gave it. Not in the standing army, no, he admitted. Some of the nobles on the border are private troops like that. No one else. That's why we came here for the mounts. She nodded and translated. Krahira put in his own discoveries. I have been watching their minds, cousin. The one who speaks out of turn is a wealthy man of highborn, 
who breeds the Ashkevron hunters and heavy horses. The ones who do not speak are trainers of skirmishers. The one who speaks much is a war leader. It is as he has said, and these are fighters they wish now to have. He has not told you why. There is to be fighting upon their eastern border, and soon, he thinks, very, very serious fighting. Caro nodded. There had been rumors about conflict between Valdemar and Hardorn, but since Kars was between Hardorn and any potential client, and Valdemar never hired mercenaries, she hadn't paid much attention to the rumors. This might involve more for us than just selling horses. If Hardorn is starting a major war and wins, they'll be on Rethwellen's border, and that means we get involved. Another thought occurred to her. Just because Valdemar hasn't hired mercs in the past, that doesn't mean they won't start. Troops like that aren't trained in a day, she warned. It took us ten years to get where we are. Most standing armies don't bother. But if you're sure of the need... Purseholder nodded, and he wasn't entirely happy about the need being there either. Well, if you'll trust my judgment on what beast will suit you, she told him. I think we can come to the bargaining table. Purseholder tapped one in charge on the shoulder, and they spent a moment in huddled conference. One in charge finally turned back toward her and nodded. Is this all right with you? She asked her cousins. They looked at each other, then Sadasan shrugged. We had rather our younger sibs did not go to war, but if they go to hands that will care for them... They are as safe as may be in this world. It is well. All right, gentlemen, she said, waving to the cousins to precede her. If you'll follow me, we can expedite this transaction as quickly as even you might want. Sadasan weighed the first of three heavy pouches in her hand as she held the other two in the crook of one arm. She smiled, watching as the last of the Valdemar horse handlers urged a straggler to catch up with the rest of the herd and out past the corrals. Caro coughed at the dust they raised, and quirked her eyebrow at the Shana in trainer. Well, they certainly paid enough. Are you content, cousin? More than content, Sadasan said with certainty. Krahira has kept watch on their minds. Their ruler is a good one. This, their queen, has sold some of her wedding gifts to give to these men that they might purchase the best mounts they could find. She thinks first of her people, their lands and their beasts, and only then of herself. That's what I'd heard from El... from a herald, I knew, Caro said, hastily avoiding Eldon's name. I didn't know whether to believe it or not, frankly. You know, if all monarchs took care of their people that way, there might be fewer wars. Perhaps... Sardasan put the pouch with the others, cradled like a baby. Perhaps. We, we do not place much store in kings and the like. You have a good one in this year. Who is to say that the one that follows him will be as good? Nothing. Unless you have a system like the Rethwellens have, with a sword that chooses the king. She shrugged. And then, of course, you could lose the sword, or someone enchants it, or puts in a substitute. Besides, if there were fewer wars, I'd be out of work. So, what do you plan to do now? You've sold most of your string all at once. Sardasan glanced toward the temporary corrals. It has been a good three years, she observed. Our mares bred widely, and many fold twins and the first of the young ones are coming upon the market. We had a fear to glut it and bring prices down. Carol laughed to hear the Shina'in, reputed to be the most ruthless fighters in the world, talking like a merchant. Which was one reason, no doubt, why Liha Irden sent their string with ours. Carol raised her eyebrow a little higher. So what did you have in mind? that I shall intercept those clans going to the Andurus Fair in Jakarta and send them here. It is not so far from here, a week's ride, and they were going out behind us. Some clans drew lots to send their beasts abroad, 
beyond Katashina Inn, and that was one of the places. They were to wait for us and your armed escort before returning to the plains. The last time that the Shanaan had gone to Andorra's fair was when Talisadrine had been ambushed on the way home, and only Tarma left as a survivor. Carol clamped her teeth on her first reaction, that the fear of glut must have been very great to send horses again to a place so ill-omened. As I said, they set out after us, and Andorras is not so great a distance that we cannot coax the buyers here to wait, I think. Sadasan smiled slyly, and Caro chuckled. And in return for that coaxing, you will, of course, get a percentage of their profits. She shook her head. Sadasan spread her hands wide. Value for value, and reward for the deserving. That is how the clans have always been, cousin. Unless you hold up to me that first fare and the horses we brought you, let me point out that you are clan by blood, and we only delivered to you your own share that had been unclaimed. Caro shrugged. I won't argue with you, if that's the way you see it. But look, will you trust me and mine with your earnings in return? You're going to lose time going down and back, and the best is going to be gone by the time you return. If you'll leave your needs and your coin with Scratcher, I think you can get everything you want at the price you want. Sarasan thought the idea over with her head tilted to the side, then nodded. He provisions your people. Doubtless he has the skill and the contacts. Done, then. And that is a kinly offer. I think they're going to get a pleasant surprise, Caro thought, leading Sarasan back to the accounting office and Scratcher's domain. They're good, but he's better. He hasn't lost a bargaining session once that I ever heard of. With that settled, the Shanaan saw no reason to linger. They left their tents, but gathered up their belongings and headed south with a speed and efficiency that Carol could only envy. She saw them off, then made her rounds of town and fortress. Only to discover that everything was running perfectly smoothly. By nightfall, she had inspected every aspect of fare and training and provisioning, and concluded that she might as well not even be there. She sat down on her bed, pulled off her boots and looked out of her window, as a cool breeze stirred her hair. The fortress was quiet. The recruits and veterans alike were kept too busy by training and the fair to carouse much in the barracks after the sun went down. Besides, why carry on at home? when there were both the old familiar haunts of the town and the new amusements of the fair, to tempt you out of the gates each night. Lights burned out beyond the walls, and the sounds of music and voices drifted toward the barracks on the breeze. Both the town and the fair kept late hours. She found herself wondering where on the road those Valdemar men were tonight. They had been in such a hurry that they hadn't even looked at the fair. And that made her think, think ahead. Tarma had taught her to think in terms of the greater picture, as well as her own little part of it. You never knew when something happening hundreds of leagues away would affect you. If I were a queen, looking to strengthen my forces, what would I do? Assuming that I have a stupid prejudice against hiring mercs. For a moment, as she stared out at the lights of the fair and the colored shapes of the tents lit up from within, like fire flowers. She thought she heard Eldon's voice, faint and far off, protesting, That's not fair. She ignored that imagined voice. You're not real, and you aren't here, and anyway you aren't interested in me anymore. She thought sternly, to exercise the persistent ghost. There were no more outbursts from her overheated imagination. Well, as far as she, a strategist, was concerned, it was a stupid prejudice. Merc companies had, more than once, won wars. People who refused to hire them had, more than once, lost those wars. The young and idealistic fight for medals and honor, she thought cynically. The experienced and worldly wise fight for money. You see a lot more retired mercs than old farmers with a chest full of medals. That was, after all, the goal of a successful merc to live long enough and collect enough to retire, 
usually on one's own land. Many Mercs came out of multi-child families without a chance for land of their own, and this was their only way to earn it. But that was a digression. If Caro were this queen, what would she do? Conscript those private troops the guardsmen talked about. Get them equipped with the best. While they're in place, start calling up volunteers. And if you can't get enough volunteers, start conscription. Rush those troops through training and start calling in any debts my allies owe me. She had a mental map of everything as far north as the mountains above Valdemar and as far south as the Bitter Sea, west to the Pelagiers and the Plains, east to the High Kingdom of Brendan. And the only allies she could think of that Valdemar might possibly have in this conflict would be Iftel and Rathwellen. Iftel would be logical, but dear gods, they are strange there. The Shanaian warrior doesn't intervene half as often as the Wind Lords. I can't see Iftel mixing up in this unless they're threatened. Which leaves Rethwellen. Now, Kars is between Rethwellen and Hardorn, but they might be able to persuade King Ferramentha that Hardorn could threaten Rethwellen if they overran southern Valdemar. Which means the next logical step will be for the Queen to send an envoy to the Rethwellen court. The fair really interested her very little, these days. Most of her entertainment came from acting as her cousin's agent. She used to help train the new recruits, but that was back in the days when they were short-handed. There were others that were better trainers, and she knew when to get the hell out of the way. Basically, all she did in winter quarters was keep herself in training, study strategy, keep the book straight, get familiar with the strengths and weaknesses of the recruits, study the political situation with an eye to offers in the spring, and carve her little gemstones. Of all of them, Scratcher could keep the books by himself. The new recruits wouldn't be showing anything distinct for another couple of months. The gemstones could wait, and the rest could be done elsewhere. Furthermore, right now, living here at the fortress was... painful. She kept looking for faces that wouldn't be here anymore. It happened every year, certainly, and it took her a couple of months to get over it. But they'd never made it home this early before, and she kept seeing the backs of head that looked familiar, until the owner turned, and it was a new recruit. It would be a relief to get away, until the pain faded with time. The pain that always came when she sent someone out who didn't come back again. It will be a relief to sleep in a strange bed. Maybe the dreams won't find me there. And yet, part of her wanted them so badly. No. Before she realized it, she'd made up her mind to leave. And that trip to Rathwellen seemed a bit more important than it had before. Lord Baron Dudlin had plainly just begun his diatribe. Darren jabbed his heel into the side of his hunter, making the gelding jump and dance in surprise, and giving him an excuse to concentrate on the horse. Because if he didn't, he was going to laugh in Lord Baron Dudlin's face. The hunt's hardly started, and already he's complaining. Too bad we're out of walk. I wish the dogs would scent something besides rabbits. Once we take off, he'll be left behind. The old man moved his fat old palfrey out of the way of the gelding's path, and actually shook his finger up at Darren. I tell you, I don't know what this cold is coming to, he shouted querulously. It's a disgrace, I tell you. Your brother is king of this land, and he can't go accepting barbarian mercenaries that are no better than bandits as equals to members of his court, and ambassadors from other realms. That mercenary female, that so-called captain, is making a mockery of all of us. I haven't seen such a disgraceful display since that wild Shinoin female showed up back in your blessed father's day. Darren decided to end the lecture by dancing his gelding out of the Lord Baron's vocal range. Not that the Lord Baron didn't try to increase his volume. But aged lungs can only produce so much wind. He grinned as he spurred his gelding to catch up with the front of the hunting party. His brother was up there, as the king had to be, 
which had left Darren to be polite to the old dotards, show-offs, and those with more bravado than sense in the rear. For a while, anyway. Depending on what the hounds turned up next, at least half of the party might well be left behind or turned back voluntarily, as they had during the morning hunt. I haven't had so much fun in a year, he thought with glee, as the gelding spotted his stablemate and put on an extra burst of speed to catch up with him. It's a good thing that Caro and Ferrum hit it off so well, though. Otherwise the Lord Baron might not be the only one complaining, and it would be damned hard to keep the peace around here. Just as he reached the two of them, Caro on her ugly grey war steed, and Ferrum on his pure Shana'in bred chestnut, one of the hounds flushed a pheasant. Two bows came up at the same time. Two bowstrings hummed at once. But when the retrievers brought the bird back, and the huntsman took it from the dog's gentle mouth to present it to the king. It was obvious that Ferrum's arrow had gone wide of the mark, and Caro had outshot him once again. And for at least the twentieth time this morning, the courtiers were scandalized. There was a hum of comment behind Darren, and he heard the Lord Baron's voice rising unpleasantly above the rest, though he couldn't make out the words. "'You've beaten me again, Captain,' Faram said ruefully, handing the bird to the gamekeepers to stow with the rest. I'm not exactly a bad shot, but I find myself very glad now that you turned down my offer to wager on the outcome of this contest. He looked back over his shoulder, past Darren, and the corners of his eyes crinkled as he suppressed a grin. I am afraid that my courtiers don't approve of your manner, however. No subject is supposed to outshoot the king. Caro chuckled as Darren pulled up next to Caro, putting her in between himself and his brother. My lord, she replied, I may live in your kingdom, but I've seen the mercenary guild charter for Rethwellen. I'm a freeholder by that charter and no subject of anyone's. An excellent point, and it seems that you are as much a lawyer as a fighter. The king looked across Caro at his brother. You did warn me, didn't you, Darren? I did, about her scholarship and her skills. I said that Tama called her a natural when we were learning together. I said I didn't think she'd let any of her skills slip just because she was a captain. And you kept saying I was exaggerating. Darren shrugged expansively. Will you believe me when I tell you something now? I suppose I'll have to. You keep telling me I told you so at every opportunity. Ferrum turned his attention back to Caro, as his horse shook his head. What I would really like to know is how you learned to shoot so well. We both had the same teacher, but you never seemed to miss. I'd suspect you of magic if you weren't so entirely unmagical. Caro bit her lip, as if she was trying to keep from laughing, and replied, My lord, the fact is that you have never been either on the front line or dependent entirely on your own skill to keep your belly full. I think you'd find that the two harshest teachers in the world are survival and hunger. I've had both, and trust me, they make a difference. On the whole, Ferrum admitted, I think I'd prefer to skip that sort of lessoning. I'm too old for those teachers. You're too fond of your comforts, brother, Darren jibed. Ferrum was about to retort, but at exactly that moment, the head of the boar pack belled, and the entire pack started off. Darren's mount lurched from a walk into a gallop, and as he passed the huntsmen who were whistling in the retrievers, he grinned. This was a hunt meant to supply the court with meat for the Sauvan feast tonight. If Sauvan hunt luck meant luck for the rest of the winter, as the old folks said it did, the winter would be a prosperous and easy one. Already they'd brought down a half-dozen deer this morning, several bachelor bucks and a couple of does that everyone agreed were past their bearing prime. That was enough venison that Ferrum had sent back the deer hounds and brought up the boar hounds. The queen and her ladies were coursing the woods and meadows near the palace, taking their hawks out after birds and hare. Most of the ladies, that is. He looked back over his shoulder to see that the handful of women who'd ridden out with the king's party were still there, keeping up valiantly and already outdistancing the likes of the Lord Baron. Last year there hadn't been any women with the king's party, 
but since Caro's arrival and example, there were a respectable number of ladies exchanging their skirts for full-cut breeches and riding neck and knee with the men. And some of those ladies were not young. Lady Sarnadelia, who had a formidable reputation as a rider on her own estate, had hailed Caro's innovation with relief and enthusiasm. She was right up there beside the best of the riders, proving rumor to be truth. And she was fifty if she was a day. I can't help but wonder how many others would have joined us, but weren't willing to risk losing suitors or enraging husbands. I know the Lord Baron's daughter looked as if she'd rather have been with us. His granddaughter is, and I'll bet that's what kicked off that tirade about disgrace. Of course she's safely wedded to young Randall, and she can snap her fingers at what her grandfather thinks, since her loving spouse thinks that everything she does is wonderful. And if I could find a lady that suited me, as well as she suits him, I'd probably think the same. Huh. Wonder whatever happened to that little prig Darren, who was horrified at the notion of Lady Carowan riding to hunt exactly like this. Maybe he grew up. He leaned forward into his horse's neck, ducking a low-hanging tree limb. He saw a fallen trunk just ahead of them and braced himself for the jump. The gelding took it, but stumbled. He recovered quickly, but not before he'd made Darren's teeth rattle. They broke through a screening of bushes into a clearing, and ahead of him, Darren saw Caro's big, ugly mare sail over another fallen tree giant with a twinge of envy. The Shana in blood was taking rough ground with a contemptuous ease that left most of the other horses faltering or outright refusing. About the only ones that were keeping up with her were himself, the king, and the huntsman. And probably only because we have Shana in breads, too. Though not like that. No wonder people would kill to get a war steed. This boar was leading the hounds on a merry chase. He was obviously fast and canny. I hope he's the one they wanted us to go after. He's surely acting as if he was the bad one. The local farmers had reported some trouble with an unusually large and evil-tempered boar to the king's huntsman, a boar who had already killed one swineherd and wounded others. Stealing their herds of pigs for his harem when they took the beasts into the forest after fallen acorns. That was why they'd hunted stag this morning, to give the horses a chance to run off any skittishness before going after such a dangerous beast as a boar. That's the one time I've seen Caro back down from something, he thought, as the trail wound deeper into the forest and the horses were forced to slow their headlong gallop. When she said she'd stay a horse, even Faram was surprised. But then she's never fought on foot, and she didn't even bring a proper bull spear with her, just that saddle quiver full of lances. Curious weapons, those. Darren had never seen anything like them. She had told him that they were used by the Shana'in, and it was obvious that they were not intended for game. Those were man-killing weapons, with narrow, razor-barbed metal heads as long as Darren's hand. Well, maybe if it runs, she can sting it with one of those and turn it for us. The pack was belling ahead of them, and the huntsman sounding the brought-to-cover call on his horn. The horses emerged into a tiny clearing before a covert. That was obviously where the boar had holed up, and now they were going to have to flush him into the open. While Caro stayed on horseback, as she'd pledged, the rest dismounted and went ahead on foot. The pack was still ahead of them, and the huntsman sounded the broken cover call. Darren broke into a trot. He heard Caro's horse behind him, eeling through dense brush that even he was having trouble with afoot. The sound of the pack changed. Just as the huntsman sounded brought to bay, Darren vaulted a tangle of roots and burst out into a clearing. The boar was standing off the pack. He was an enormous brute, with a wide, scarred back. Not a wild boar at all, but a domestic beast gone feral. That made him all the more dangerous. Darren pulled himself up before charging into the fray, and looked at his brother. Ferrum read the plan in Darren's look, and gnawed. They'd hunted boar together for years now, and needed only a glance to determine what the other intended.
This time Darren would be the bait. The huntsman pulled the pack back at his command, and while Farah moved quietly around the edge of the clearing, Darren shouted at the boar, getting ready to drop to his knee or dodge aside at any moment. The success of this tactic lay in the fact that once a boar this big began a charge, it had trouble changing direction quickly, and its poor eyesight interfered with its ability to follow anything moving in a way it didn't expect. You only had to avoid those slashing tusks. Only. Hey! He yelled at it, stamping one foot. Hey! It waved its head from side to side, nose up in the air, seeking a scent that the musk of the dogs covered. Then saw him, and charged perfectly down the center of the clearing. He leapt aside at the last possible moment, saw the flash of a tusk as it made a strike for him, then he leapt back before it had a chance to change direction, jabbing down at the heart with his boar spear, knocked off balance for a moment as Ferrum ran in from the side a heartbeat later to plunge his own spear into the boar's back. It shrieked in pain and anger and struggled forward, tearing up the soft earth in deep furrows with its cloven hooves. But the two of them had it pinned between them. Another moment and its legs collapsed from under it, and it died, as one spear or both found the heart. He started to look up, a grin of congratulation spreading across his face, when a human scream rang across the clearing, cutting across the cheers started by the huntsman. Movement and a flash of red caught his eye. One huntsman was down, his legs savaged, and standing above him with her tushes dripping red was a sow a wild sow as big as the boar they'd just brought down. My gods, it had a mate. She squealed once, trampled the huntsman, and then whirled to face them all. And the first thing she saw was Ferrum. She squealed again with rage and charged. Darren tugged futilely at his spear, but it was stuck fast in the boar, lodged as it was intended to do, and wouldn't come free. Ferrum was on his knees and struggling to get up, but it was obvious he was never going to get out of the way in time. Suddenly, there was a blur of gray, flying between the king and the charging sow. The pig screamed and turned aside, whirled and charged this new target, her eyes streaming blood. The gray warsteed pivoted on a single hoof and lashed out with her hind feet, sending the sow flying through the air. Two flashes of metal followed it, and the sow hit the ground and lay there, thrashing, two of Caro's lances sticking out of its sides. The mare whirled again, but on seeing that the enemy was no longer a threat, snorted once and tossed her head. Caro dismounted, walked cautiously toward the convulsing beast with her knife in her hand, then dived in and slit the sow's throat with one perfectly timed stroke. The beast shuddered and died. Caro rose from the carcass and wiped her knife carefully on the sow's hide. Only then did she look over to where Darren and his brother were sprawled beside the body of the boar. Survival, my lord, she said mildly, has taught me to always leave a mobile scout to the rear. Then she walked over to her mare and mounted leaving the huntsman to deal with the carcass. 20. Caro sipped at her watered wine, turned to the woman at her side and said, Honestly, it was mostly Hellsbane. I've never hunted boar before, and I didn't know what to expect. That was why I stayed mounted. Lady Delia nodded. A good horse is worth twenty armsmen, or so it seems to me. I've never seen a horse quite as well as trained as yours, though. She follows you and obeys you more like a dog than a horse. So I've noticed, Caro told her, without elaborating. Let her wonder. She seems nice enough, but the less people know about war steeds, the better off I'll be. Whether people overestimate or underestimate Hellsbane, I win. She's really the second horse of her line that I've had from the cousins, she continued which allowed Lady Delia to elaborate on her own horse's lines, and ask which of the king's Shana in bloods it would be best to breed her hunters to. 
Carol answered with only half of her mind occupied by the conversation. The rest monitored the feast and the people's reactions to her, a response as automatic as breathing. She couldn't help but contrast the reaction of the Rethwell in court to that of her brothers. Despite the similarity of the circumstances, that she had personally rescued both Dierna and King Ferrum, in her brother's home she had honor without admiration. Here, she had both. An embarrassment of admiration, in fact. Some of the young ladies of the court, those in the hero-worshipping early teens, had even taken to dressing like her. Predictably, Darren found this very funny. But better that than fear. She was as much feared as admired by many of the court. King Ferrum's people had seen her in action, and knew what she could do now, where her brother's people saw her successes as being mostly luck. On the other hand, fear didn't bother her as much as it used to. I guess I've gotten thicker skinned. As long as the babies don't run screaming from me, I think I can handle a little fear. King Ferrum impressed her as much as she had evidently impressed him. I can see why Darren loves his brother, she thought, watching the relaxed and easy manner they had between them, sharing jokes or admiring a particularly toothsome lady. It would have been very easy for Farum to resent what I did for him, but there's absolutely no sign of any such thing. In fact, he had ordered the sow's head prepared and served alongside the boar's head, and presented to her with a full retelling of the story. The court bard was a good one. With very little warning, he'd done the tale up with bangles and bells, making her sigh, and wonder if this song was going to make the rounds the way Carowin's ride had. He had promised her a boon when the song was over. Right now, she had no idea what she'd ask for. But something like that was worth taking time to think about. The feast was a bit more than she was comfortable with anyway. Her people ate well, but nothing like this. She didn't recognize half of what was served, and even though she did no more than nibble at what she did recognize, she was ready to end the meal when it was only half over. Probably that was as much reaction as anything else, though. As always, she got her battle nerves after the fact, when everything was over and done with. If I was standing, my knees would be knocking together, and I never, ever would have been able to pull that one off without Hellsbane. The sow had burst cover at the boar's death squeal. Caro happened to be looking right at the spot, and watched in horror as she savaged the huntsman before Caro or anyone else realized that she was going to attack. She had known that pigs were notoriously short-sighted. She'd spurred Hellsbane straight for the sow, inspired by the thought that only a horse was going to be big enough to distract the pig or make her pause. The lance in the eye had been a purely lucky or God's send hit. She'd hoped only to score the sow's tender snout and distract her. Then, as she'd passed, she'd signaled Hellsbane to kick, hoping to keep the pig's teeth away from the mare's hamstrings. She'd forgotten that Hellsbane had been taught a low kick as well as a high, meant to take out men on the ground who might have strength enough to hurt her. Hellsbane had made her own judgment and had used the low kick, connecting solidly and sending the sow flying before she could charge. Then Hellsbane had wheeled, allowing Caro to launch another lance, and that, too, had connected solidly, as had the third. It had been as close a call as any she had ever had on the battlefield, and she hadn't been entirely sure her legs would hold her when she dismounted. She'd said as much to Darren, who had been just as shaken as she was. As soon as this feast is over, she promised herself, I'm going to have a nice hot bath in my room, with a good fire going and only one candle for light. And tea, not wine. The noise and the mingled odors of food and perfume were beginning to give her a headache. Though it was no bad thing to have the king's gratitude demonstrated so openly, she rather wished she'd be able to get away from the crowd sometime soon. She wasn't used to people like this, undisciplined, so wildly different, and yet so much the same, with such, to her at least, trivial interests. She blinked to clear her eyes as the glitter and color swam before them for a moment. 
thousands of jewels winked at her in the light from hundreds of candles. Fabrics she couldn't even name made pools of rich color all down the tables. The candles were scented. The people were scented. The drink perfumed with flower petals, the food spiced. On one side of the room, the court bard held forth. On the other, a consort of recorders, and near the low table, an acrobat. It was too much. A surfeit of luxury. The door at the far end of the room opened and a man in a black tabard embroidered with Ferrum's arms slipped inside. He rapped three times on the floor with his staff, and somehow the sound penetrated the babble. A hush descended for a moment. The king's herald rapped on the floor with his staff again, to ensure the silence. Heads turned toward him with surprise, including the king's. Ferrum had been so deep in conversation that he had not noticed the herald's entrance. Your Majesty, the herald said, in a rich baritone voice that was nothing like Caro's own parade ground bellow, but seemed to carry as well and as far. An envoy from Queen Selene of Valdemar asks permission to approach. Caro sat up straighter, suddenly much more alert. From Valdemar? But what are they doing here now? Why don't they wait until formal court in the morning? She looked back at Darren and his brother, only to see from their expressions that they were just as baffled as she was. Let them approach, the king said, after a whispered conference with Darren and his seneschal. The herald turned and left to return into expectant silence, escorting two people. One was a tall, raw-boned, blonde man, with an attractive, homely face, a man who looked like a farm boy and moved like an assassin. The other was a small, slightly built woman, with a sweet heart-shaped face, who limped slightly. That was what they looked like, but even Caro recognized them for what they were. Heralds out of Valdemar, in the white uniform of their calling. And the sight of that uniform sent a pang through her heart that she hadn't expected. For a moment she couldn't even think. Queen's own Harold Talia and Harold Dirk, the King's Herald announced. And did Carol only imagine it, or did even he seem to feel the portent hanging heavy in his words? One thing she did know, this Talia was no ordinary Herald, and no ordinary envoy either. The Queen's own was the most important herald in the kingdom, second only to the monarch, and often exercising the power of the monarch when needed. That was what Eldon had explained, anyway, ten years ago. The two approached the head table and bowed slightly. The man stayed about a half pace behind the woman. Interesting positioning. No doubt that's partially because she's the ranking officer, but it's also partially because he's guarding her back. Wonder if anyone else will notice that. The young woman began to speak. She had a wonderful musical contralto, and she knew how to use it to gain her listeners' attention. Carol listened closely and carefully as Talia explained what had brought them. The girl's Rethwellen wasn't bad, but her accent and occasional odd turn of phrase made it very clear that she didn't have complete mastery of the language yet. And so my queen has sent me here, directly, rather than to speak through her embassy. You will have heard, your majesty, of the events in Hardorn these past two years? The young woman asked. Ferrum nodded, and she clasped her hands behind her. Only Caro was near enough to see that those hands were white-knuckled with tension. She's scared to death, Caro realized with surprise. She's nowhere near as casual as she seems about this. It's a life-and-death situation, and she knows it. But she's not going to give that away. She felt herself warming to the young woman, for no apparent reason other than a feeling that she was going to like this Talia. Ankar of Hardorn is a friend to no man, and no nation, Talia continued flatly. 
and there was something in her lack of expression that sent off vague feelings of alarm in Caro. After a moment, she realized what it was. Severely traumatized veterans would speak in that flat, expressionless tone about the battle experiences that had broken them. What on earth could King Ankar have done to the Queen's own herald? And how did he happen to get hold of her? And why? Something terrible had happened to this young woman at Ankar's hands. She was as certain of that as she was of her own name. And so was Need. For the first time in years, Carol felt the blade stirring. Ankar is guilty of regicide and patricide, Talia continued. He has visited terrors that no sane man would countenance on his own people, and he has turned to dark powers to grant him his desires. I have proofs of this with me, if you would care to see them. Faram shook his head, and indicated that she should go on. We stopped him once, we of Valdemar, she said. We held him at our border and turned him back. Now he amasses a new army, one of men and steel, rather than magic, and he marches again on our border. So what is it you want? Faram asked, leaning back in his chair so that his face was in shadow and could not be read. Your aid, Talia said simply. We simply don't have enough armed men to hold him back this time. As the Queen's own herald continued to speak, Carol grew more and more puzzled. I don't understand this. Grandmother must have told me the story of the way she and Tama got rid of Leslak the Bard a dozen times, and every single time she told it, she mentioned the pledge King Stephenson gave to Harold Prince Rold, that Rethwellen owed Valdemar a favor, equal to that of putting a king on his rightful throne, and how Valdemar had never redeemed that favor. She watched as Talia's hands clenched tighter and tighter behind her back, the only outward sign of the young woman's increasing desperation. I know for a fact that Valdemar hasn't cashed in the pledge since Grandmother told me the story. So why is she pleading for help when she could demand it? She glanced back at King Ferrum and saw that he was just as tense as the Herald, and a swift appraisal of Darren, whom she knew better than she knew his brother, convinced her that they were mentally torn. For some reason, she decided at last, Queen Selene purely and simply does not know about the pledge. Faram knows about it, though, and Darren. They figured out that Selene doesn't know of the pledge, and as people, they want to help. But as the king, Faram has to be reluctant to get Rethwellen involved in a war with someone who isn't even on his border, who isn't any kind of a threat to him. So he is not going to remind anyone about the pledge, if it's been forgotten. In a way, Caro could understand that kind of attitude, except that it was ruinously short-sighted. Half of their trade is with Valdemar, and that trade is going to vanish if Valdemar's involved in a losing war. And if Ankar wins, he will be on the border, and he doesn't sound to me like the kind of neighbor I'd welcome. And if Faram can't see that... Thanks to Eldon, Caro knew a bit about heralds and their country, and what she knew, even if only half of it were true, she liked. And besides that, all through the young woman's speech, need had been rousing, putting a slowly increasing pressure on the back of her mind. It was pretty nebulous, confined to a vague feeling of, help her, but it was certainly getting stronger. By the time this Talia had come to the end of her speech, the sword was all but screaming in Caro's ear. She waited for a moment to see what Faram would do. It was always possible that he'd surprise her and offer Talia his help. But he didn't. He spoke of the necessity of remaining neutral, of the problems with Kars and the need to guard his own border. He temporized and said in polite diplomatic terms that he wasn't going to help. As the man's face fell, and the woman grew as rigid as a statue of ice, Caro felt their anguish as if it were her own. Clearly, this had been their last hope. 
I can't take this anymore. Caro sighed, hoped Darren would forgive her, and stood up. All eyes in the room swung toward her, and even the king stopped in mid-sentence as her chair scraped across the amber marble of the floor. Majesty, she said, slowly and distinctly, with every ounce of dignity and authority she could muster. You said in this very hall as the feast began that I could crave a boon of you in return for my actions at the hunt this afternoon. She saw Darren clutch the table just out of the corner of her eye, his expression pleading with her not to say what he was sure she intended to say. She ignored him. Even if need hadn't been goading her, the nagging of her own conscience would have forced this on her. This is what I ask, Majesty, she told him, fixing her gaze directly into his eyes. And I think it is no more than what all our honor demands. As not only the one who is owed a boon, but as my grandmother Kethry's granddaughter, I ask, hold to the pledge your grandfather Stephenson made to Selene's grandfather Rold in the library of this very castle. The herald's faces were equally comic studies in bafflement. Darren buried his face in his hands. She waited for the king's anger to break out. But although he winced, he gave no sign of anger. Instead, he only sighed and shook his head, then looked back into her eyes and spoke softly, directly to her. I never thought that it would be a mercenary captain that would act as my conscience, he said ruefully. Well, since the cat is well and truly escaped from the bag, he raised his voice. My lords, my ladies, we have some private business to attend to, but let the feast continue. We shall return to you when we may. A hum of conversation rose when he had finished and stood up. Darren, Captain, come with me if you will. I have need of both of you. He gestured, and Caro took her place at his side though not without a certain trepidation. She could only remember the old saying, Be careful what you ask for. You might get it. I just asked for him to remember his grandfather's promise. He may well ask me to remember who and what I am. He directed the two heralds to follow him, and led the little procession out a small door behind the head table, down a warmly lit hallway, and into a room Caro had not seen before and there was no doubt what this room was either, not when it was lined in books, floor to ceiling. This was the famous library. The king waved at the various chairs available, all of them worn shabby and comfortable looking, and Caro sat gingerly on the edge of one, not entirely certain that she wanted to be here. The king waited until all four of them were seated, before speaking. You, he said, pointing at Caro in a way that made her want to sink into the chair and hide. Are both a most welcome and a most inconvenient guest, Captain. I am extremely grateful that you were with us on this afternoon's hunt, but I could wish your excellent memory to the Shina in hell. Perhaps it is not to my credit, but I would have preferred not to have my country involved in a war that poses us no danger. She stayed silent since she couldn't think of any way to respond to his words that wasn't undiplomatic at best. He dropped his hand and shrugged. But you reminded me of an unredeemed pledge and saved my honor, if not my country. I suppose I should be grateful for that, even if, like medicine, this is not what I would have chosen. The man, Harold Dirk, raised his hand tentatively. Your pardon. Majesty, he said, when Ferrum responded to the movement by pivoting to face him. But we haven't got the faintest idea of what you've been talking about. Just what is this pledge? Ferrum turned back to Caro. Well, Captain, he said, smiling a little crookedly. It began with your grandmother and your clan mother. Would you care to start? Caro cleared her throat, swallowed to give herself a moment to think, and began. 
It all started, for my grandmother at least, when she and her blood oath sister Tama joined Idra's Sunhawks. In the end, she and Darren and Faram took turns explaining the entire story to the heralds. It was Faram who ended the tale, saying, So as you can see, Rethwellen owes you what you came to beg of us. I have to admit that if the captain hadn't made the question moot, I don't know whether I would actually have continued to allow you to remain in ignorance of that dead. I've been corresponding with my niece, Elspeth, and she's a charming child, but joining my country to yours in a war is not a step to make based on how charming one's niece is. But, Talia began, when Ferrum held up his hand to interrupt her. My conscience, at least, is much happier with the secret out in the open. Even if my coldly practical side is not, the real problem, my lady, is that the Rethwellen army is composed mainly of foot. That is why we hire mercenary companies when we need other forces. Even if I could muster them and start them off of Aldemar immediately, they couldn't possibly be there before. He looked to Darren for his answer and got it. Spring equinox, assuming we started on the road tomorrow, Darren said promptly. And the herald's faces fell again. And there's no way we can get them mustered and on the road for at least a fortnight, so they'll arrive later than that. But... But... said three voices together, as the king raised an eyebrow. The sky bolts are mounted, and really that's exactly the kind of troops you of Valdemar need for the initial encounters. Skirmishes, experts in ambush and strike and run, anything to throw Ankar's army off balance and keep them that way. Caro knows warfare like, like no one except her clan mother. He made a little bow in her direction as she unaccountably blushed. Dear God, blushing, and at my age, and not for a pretty little compliment, but because he says that I'm a better tactician than anyone but Tama. Certainly shows where my priorities have gone. She may even surpass Tama by now. It wouldn't surprise me. Between the skyboats, the Valdemar forces, and Caro's knowledge of tactics, she can distract Ankar for long enough that we'd have a chance to come in to take Ankar's rear. In fact, if I were the captain, I'd lead them chasing wild hares all over the countryside and have them exhaust themselves to no purpose. Caro ran the basic plan in her head and found that she liked it. Huh, she said thoughtfully. I think it would work especially if we let them get just inside the border enough so they think they're winning. Then lead them up along it. Frankly, Harolds, you're better off with us. We get paid whether we win or lose, and we don't have any national pride tied up with appearing to lose. You might have a hard time convincing your own troops to look like cowards, but my people have done it before and accept it as good tactics. Darren, if you let me run them ragged, you'd probably make it to us at exactly the right moment, and he won't be expecting you. He'll probably be completely off guard. I've only got one question. We didn't make any pledges. My lords, my lady, we're mercenaries, and we don't work for free. Who's paying our way? We are, said Talia and the king at exactly the same moment. They looked at each other and laughed weakly. Split the fee, Caro advised. This is going to be a winter march for us, and winter marches don't come cheaply. Talia nodded, somewhat to Caro's surprise. I've done my share of winter marches, she said wryly. I think I can guess what it will be like, going over mountains in a full company in winter. We were told about you, Captain, and advised and authorized to hire you. That was our next job, to find you and negotiate. I hope you realize how rare that is. Elden? Probably. How can I miss a man so much when I spent so little time with him, so long ago? Well, whatever. He's getting his wish. He's got me coming to Valdemar now. I'm just as glad the troops don't know about him, or they'd be placing bets on the outcome of our first meeting. Blessed Agnarar! I never thought becoming captain would mean anything like that. I do understand, and I appreciate that this shows your confidence in me and mine, she said, hoping her voice sounded businesslike, 
and didn't betray how shaky she felt. Nods all around the table, and she found herself vowing silently that she would not let these people down. First things first, since you trust my skill, let's see if we can't work out the actual logistics of this thing. I can't believe this, Caro said out loud, watching from Hellsbane's back as the troops rode past, out of the big double gates of Bolthaven, and up the road to Valdemar. She shifted in her saddle, and Hellsbane shifted to match her. It was a good day for leaving. Not too cold under a bright blue, cloudless sky. Good weather was a good omen, and soldiers are as superstitious as any man. The skybolts rode in march formation, two abreast, which made for a long line. But as long as they were in friendly territory, it didn't matter. It was quite an impressive sight, and the company looked far larger than it actually was. Every one of them had at least one spare riding animal on a lead rope behind him, plus his own pack horse. Those with longer strings rode at the head of the column. They'd be breaking the trail, and being able to switch to a fresh horse every time the ones they were riding got tired would keep the column slogging on at a much faster pace than anyone other than Caro guessed. That was one of the Skyboat's tricks. They had more. A lot more. And in this campaign, they'd probably need every one of them. You don't believe what, Captain? Shallon asked, her breath puffing out of her hood in a white cloud. She and Gayer waited patiently beside Caro for the last of the column to move out. The other lieutenants were spaced at roughly equal intervals along the column, so that there would never be an officer out of effective range to handle an emergency. I don't believe them, she said, pointing her chin at the last of the column, passing out of the gates. Now the quartermaster and his pack strings moved out. Ten years ago, Caro had made the decision that the sky bolts would have no wagons with them. If something couldn't be carried horseback, it wouldn't come with them. Some ingenious lightweight substitutions had been arrived at, due to the quartermaster's ingenuity. The tents, for instance, that could be packed twenty to a horse. New poles had to be cut each night, but it was worth it. There's not near enough bitching and moaning, Caro continued. Here I am, hauling them out of cozy winter quarters for a midwinter march, a march across all of Rethwellen and over the mountains, and hardly a complaint out of them. What's wrong? They're bored, Captain, said Geyer. Campaign ended early. They got all their resting out of the way, and half the winter yet to go. They wanted something to do. Besides, the money on this is worth a winter march, and it's not like we're having to cross enemy territory. Well, it isn't going to be a midsummer picnic either, Carol replied, as the last of the supply strings moved out. The comb isn't a bad range, but I'd rather not cross any mountains in winter. Well, that's the last of them. I'll see you when we camp. Both lieutenants saluted so wrapped up in wool and furs that except for Geyer's black face, Caro couldn't tell them apart. Every trooper in the lot had a new fur-lined wool cloak for this campaign. Normally clothing was their own responsibility, but Caro knew soldiers, and she didn't want to lose a badly needed fighter to frostbite just because the fool gambled away his cloak the night before. Orders were that the cloaks were company property, like tents and standard weapons. Anyone found using them for gambling stakes would find himself shoveling manure, scrubbing pots, and taking the worst of the night watches. Anyone accepting them would get worse than that. Caro nodded permission to go, and they spurred their horses onto the side of the road, to canter up past the pack lines. Shallon would be riding just in front of the quartermaster, Gayer halfway down the line. Tomorrow, the two that had ridden first would move back here, and the other officers would all move up a notch in strict rotation. Except for Caro, who would ride at the very tail. Winter or summer, tailmost was the worst position on the march, which was why she always took it. That was one of the little things that gave her the respect of her troops, as well as their obedience. She gave Hellsbane a little nudge, and the mare took her accustomed place, so used to it now that she didn't even sigh. As the gates closed behind them, 
leaving the skeleton training staff and the new recruits deemed still too green to fight in this campaign. Caro settled comfortably into her saddle and went over everything she had learned once more. The one advantage they all had, and one Caro had never been able to count on before, was that all of Selene's knowledge of their enemy was actually foreknowledge. Evidently, some of these heralds were able to actively, consistently see the future. They knew when he would strike and where. Mostly. And at least for the next six moons or so. After that, according to Talia, they were seeing different futures. The Herald had tried to explain that to Caro, something about how what they did now to alter things would affect what had been seen and make different outcomes possible. It had all been too much for Caro. She'd always thought the future was like the past, a path that started somewhere and ended somewhere else, solid, immutable. It was disconcerting to hear otherwise. She wasn't sure she liked the idea of the future being so nebulous and fluid. It was a pity that they couldn't see what was happening now as well. It would have been useful to know where this army of Ankars was forming up. If Kara had known that, she could have arranged for a little exercise of the Skybolt's other specialty, the one she didn't talk about. A few careful assassinations, some sabotage, some meddling with supplies. That was what helped cut the profit campaign so short. And let us get her cornered. That, and the strikes from behind, ambushes and traps, until she had to find somewhere she considered safe to make a stand. If you can ruin your enemy's morale, and make him think everyone and everything is after him, it doesn't do your side any harm. Oh well, we'll do what we can with what we have. They had guild blessing on this one too, which was no bad thing. She checked with the guild, as required, to find out if Ankar had hired on either guild freelancers or companies, and had gotten a delightful surprise. Ankar had actually had the gall to chase the guild out of his country and deny them access to guild members still inside his borders. So as far as the guild was concerned, it was no holds barred, and anything the Skybolts did to Ankar's troops or on his side of the border was all right with them. That was really phenomenally stupid, she reflected. Not even Castle Valdemar have ever thrown the guild out. They may not be welcome, but they're tolerated because sooner or later, everyone comes to us. Even Valdemar. She shook her head over Ankar's foolishness. But I'd better watch my strategy with him. A fool can kill you, just as dead as a wise man and is unpredictable enough to do so. She saw something bright in the packs of the horse ahead of her, and recognized some of the paraphernalia strapped to the pack of the final horse in the train as an object belonging to Quentin, a remarkable leather-covered box he kept his books in, that had survived floods, fire, and even being struck by lightning. That turned her thoughts toward her chief mage, he should be just about ready for master status, she thought. Maybe he can figure out my puzzle for me. Why there are no mages in Valdemar? For Talia had confided to Carowin, with an unmistakable tone of fear and bewilderment, that Ankar had mages in his employ. She looked at Caro as if she expected the captain to challenge that statement, and had been even more bewildered when Caro had simply nodded. Bewilderment was a pretty odd reaction to magic, especially when the heralds had magic of their own. Mind magic, that was, from all Caro had ever learned from Eldon, equal in strength and refinement to the powers of any master of any school Caro had ever met. And probably there were those who were the equal of any adept as well. Then again, he didn't seem to recognize real magic when he saw it. Even when the Carsites were working it on us and calling it the hand of their god, and I think I remember that it was kind of hard even to talk to him about magic, as if I was saying one thing, but he was hearing something else. The box swayed from side to side hypnotically. Hellsbane had already gotten into her march pace, a steady, head-bowed walk, an easy motion to match. Though not what I'd choose if I had a hangover or a twitchy stomach. I wonder if magic doesn't work inside Valdemar. 
I think Grandmother said something about that once. But if that's true, why is Ankar using mages against them? Unless it is true. But he either doesn't know it, or has a way to counteract whatever it is. Caro gave up speculation as a bad job, and turned her mind toward the immediate future. Instead of supplies, the quartermaster carried cash. Since they would be traveling through exclusively friendly territory and harvests had been good this year, they were going to buy every bit of food they needed, for horse and human alike, except for what they needed to get them over the mountains. That was going to keep them light enough to travel at a good speed, and ensure the locals were always happy to see them. We should meet Darren and the army about halfway between Petrus and the Valdemar Buda, she figured, making rough calculations in her head. And may the gods watch over them. Foot slogging in winter is as bad as anything I can think of. I bet they'll be glad we broke the trail for them. Let's see, about a moon to the Valdemar Buda, then at least a fortnight to get across the mountains if I figure on bad weather all the way then another moon to get to the capital. Not bad. Better than any other company I ever heard of, including the Sunhawks. Of course, without the cousins to help me with pack-horse breeding, we'd be pulling wagons through this muck and making the same kind of time as anybody else. And I don't even want to think about taking wagons over the mountains in the dead of winter. Hellsbane's eyes were half-closed. Caro suspected she was dozing. Although the road was churned up muck, it wasn't really too bad, since it was too warm for the stuff to freeze before the hooves of the tailmost horse went through it. Later, though, it would be bad. Let her doze, Caro thought, settling. This is the easy part. Anything from here on is going to be worse. Pray, gods, not as bad as I fear. Pray, gods. The dreams don't follow me. 21. Snow swirled around Hellsbane's hawks as the wind made Caro's feet ache with cold. Caro and huddled as much of herself inside her cloak as she could and kept her face set in a reasonable approximation of a pleasant expression. She would not dismount until her tent was set up. Her tent would not be set up until the rest of the camp was in order the troops could look up from their own camp tasks at any time and see her, still in the saddle, still out in the weather, for as long as it took for all of them to have their shelters put together. Wonderful discoveries, these little dome-shaped, felt-lined tents. The wind just went around them. They never blew over or collapsed, and instead of needing rigid tent poles, you only needed to find a willow grove and cut eight of the flexible branches to thread through the eight channels sewn into the tents. You wouldn't even damage the trees. Willows actually responded well to being cut back. And the company had passed groves they trimmed in the past, whose trees were more luxuriant than before they'd been cut. The hard part, especially in midwinter, was pounding the eight tent stakes into the rock-hard ground to pin the tents in place. Without those eight stakes, the tents could and had blown away, like down puffs on the wind. That was what took time. Lots of time. And each pair of troopers was sweating long before the stakes were secure. And meanwhile, the captain got to sit on her horse and look impressive, while in reality she wanted to thump every one of her troopers who looked up at her for taking even half a breath to do so, forcing her to be out in the cold that much longer. She'd rather have been pounding stakes herself. She used to help with setup before she realized that helping could be construed as a sign of favoritism. Then she set up her own tent before her own orderlies told her in distress that it wasn't appropriate. So she sat, like a guardian statue turning into a giant icicle, a sodden pile of wet leather, or a well-broiled piece of jerky, as the season determined. The sun just touched the horizon, glaring an angry red beneath the low-hanging clouds. No snow, yet. It was on the way. Caro knew snow scent when she caught it. A wonderful aroma of roasting meat wafted on the icy breeze, making her mouth water and her stomach growl. 
In that much, at least, being captain had its privileges. When she finally could crawl down off Hellsbane's back, her tent would be waiting, warmed by a clever charcoal brazier no larger than a dish, and her dinner would be sitting beside it. She sniffed again and identified the scent as pork. Good. The past three weeks it's been mutton, and I'm beginning to dislike the sight of sheep. Then she had to smile. When she'd last been this far north, she'd have sold her soul for a slice of mutton. In fact, most Merck companies would be making do with what they'd brought in the way of dried meat, eked out with anything the scouts brought in. This business of buying fresh food every time they halted had its advantages. Given the opportunity of making twice an animal's normal price, in midwinter, when there was no possibility of other money coming in, most farmers and herders could manage to find an extra male, or a female past bearing. Just before they'd gotten into the comb, in fact, they'd found a fellow with a herd of half-wild woolly cattle, who had been overjoyed to part with a pair of troublemaking beasts at the price the quartermaster had offered. Them's meanin's, he'd said laconically, as he delivered the hobbled, bellowing, head-tossing creatures to the cooks. The smile on his face when he accepted a slice of roast, and the tale her quartermaster told later of putting the cattle down, convinced her that they had done the man a favor. The last tent went up, and Gayer, currently in charge of the crew digging the jakes, hove into view from the other side of the camp and waved his hand. Caro sighed with relief and dismounted. Slowly, she was having a hard time feeling her feet. Hellsbane let out a tremendous sigh as Caro pulled her left foot out of the stirrup, and the youngster assigned as the officer's groom came trotting up with his mittened hands tucked up into his armpits. He took the reins shyly from Caro and led the mare off the picket lines at a fast walk. Caro made her way toward her tent at a slow walk. First of all, it wouldn't do for the troops to see the captain scurrying for her tent like any green recruit on her first winter campaign. And second, she didn't trust her footing when she couldn't feel anything out of her feet but cold and pain. The command tent was easily three times the size of the others, but that was because the troops' tents only had to hold two fighters and their belongings. Hers had to hold the map table and take several people standing up inside it besides. That was the disadvantage of the little dome-shaped tents, and the reason she had a separate pack horse for her own traditional tent. Her orderly held the tent flap open just enough for her to squeeze inside, without letting too much of the precious heat out. And the first thing she did, once inside the privacy of her quarters, was peel her boots off and stick her half-frozen white feet into the sheepskin slippers he'd left warming beside the brazier for her. As life returned to her extremities, she thanked the gods that she had made it through another day on the march without losing something to frostbite. There has to be a way to keep your feet from turning into chunks of ice the moment the wind picks up, she said crossly to her orderly. It's fine when there's no wind. The horse keeps your feet warm enough. But once there's a wind, you might as well be barefoot. Her orderly, a wiry little fellow from the very mountains they'd just crossed, frowned a little. "'Tis them boots, Captain," he said solemnly. "'Tis nothing betwixt the foot and the wind, but a thin bit of leather. "'Tis not what we do.' She took an experimental sip of the contents of her wooden mug. It was tea tonight, which was fine. She hadn't had any more of those dreams of Eldon since crossing the comb, which left her with mixed feelings indeed. And wine was not what she wanted tonight, even mulled. She didn't want to go all maudlin in her cups, mourning the loss of those illusory love-making sessions. Whatever was wrong with me is cured, she thought resolutely. I should be thankful. I'm back to being myself. But, come to think of it, Need's been as silent as a stone, she realized with a moment of alarm. Nothing. Not even a feel at the back of my mind. She might just as well be ordinary metal. Dear gods, what if she won't heal me any more? I'll deal with it, that's what. It's too late to turn back now. Think about something else. Enlighten me, Hollard. What do your people do? Sheepskin boots, Captain. 
he replied promptly. A wool socks, double pairs. Only trouble is, tis bulky and has no eel. We don't use stirrups, ye kin. She shook her head. That won't do, not for us. I guess I'll just have to suffer. At that moment, the guard outside her tent knocked his dagger hilt against the pole supporting the door canopy and let someone in with a swirl of snow. Quentin, and Caro had a feeling she wasn't going to like what he was about to say the moment he came fully into the light from her lantern. He was haggard and nervous. Two states she'd never seen Quentin in, and the mages had been conspicuous by their absence since they'd crossed the comb. There was something up, and whatever it was, it was coming to her now because they couldn't handle it themselves. Captain, said Quentin, and his voice cracked on the second syllable. She waited for him to try again. Captain, he repeated, with a little more success this time. We have a problem. Gods, need, and now the mages. I'd already gathered that, Quentin, since you look like a day-old corpse and I haven't seen so much as a mage's sleeve for a fortnight. Is it just you? Or do all the majors look like you? All of us, Quentin replied unhappily. We'd like permission to turn back, Captain. It isn't ye, or the company, or the job. We think it's Valdemar itself. There's something strange going on here, and it's driving us mad. He waited for a moment, obviously to see if she believed him. She just nodded. Go on, she told him figuring she was about to have her little puzzle of mages and Valdemar solved, at least in part. He remembered what you told me, about how the heralds seem surprised by magic, and you never heard of a mage up in Valdemar. I thought maybe it was a coincidence or something. His hands twisted the hem of his sleeve nervously. Well, it isn't. The moment we got across the border, we all felt... something. What? she asked impatiently. What is it? If there's something around that's costing me the use of my mages, I want to know about it. Quentin ground his teeth in frustration. I don't know, he said around a clenched jaw. I really don't know. It was like there was somebody watching us. All the time. At first it was just an annoyance. We figured there was just some talented youngling out there thinking he could spy on us. But we never caught anybody, and after a while, it started getting on our nerves. It was like having somebody staring, staring right at you all the time. That goes on day and night, waking and sleeping, and it's like nothing any of us have ever seen or heard of before. We couldn't get rid of it. We couldn't shield against it, and it's been getting worse every day. I can't even sleep anymore. Please, Captain... Give us permission to go back. We'll wait for you at winter quarters. Now, if it had been one of the others who asked that of her with a nebulous story like that, she'd have suspected fakery, slacking, or at least exaggeration. But it was Quentin, as trustworthy as they came, and not prone to exaggerate anything. And he did look awful. And if all this was true... Even if she kept them, they wouldn't do her any good. You can't take time to aim when you have to keep ducking, and that's obviously the way they feel right now. Are the healers being affected? She asked anxiously. Or is it only you? The healers are fine, Captain, Quentin reported with a certain hangdog expression, as if he felt he was somehow responsible for the mages being singled out. Then with luck... Need will still be able to heal me. And with none, she's still a good sword. Besides, a sword probably wouldn't care about being stared at. All right, she said unhappily. You can go. You go back on non-combatant status, though, and we can't spare anyone to get you back home. That's all right, Quentin replied, nearly faint with relief. Once we're across the border, we'll be fine. Thank you, Captain. I think if I'd had to go two more days, I'd have killed someone. We've already had to restrain Arnaud twice. He tried to run off into the snow last night with nothing on but a shirt. Oh, 
Carol replied, wishing that they told her about this earlier. Then it might have been possible to get Quentin to fiddle with Need again, to extend the protections over the mages. Then again, maybe not. Need never had protected mages from magic. They were all probably better off this way, and besides, Need was silent. Who knew if she was actually working or not? She told her orderly to go with Quentin and see that the quartermaster gave them what supplies he could. Something watching you all the time, she thought, bemused, as she settled down to the remains of her dinner. Now that I think of it, that is something that would drive you crazy, especially if you were already unbalanced, which mages are a lot of times, and with good reason. No wonder there are no mages in Valdemar. They're either mad or fled. Clever defense. End of puzzle. Except I hope my blade is still working. Things could get sticky if it isn't. Halfway to the Valdemar capital of Haven, it seemed that their purpose and reputation had preceded them. People came out of the towns along the way to watch them pass, reservedly friendly, but cautious, as if they didn't quite know what to expect of a mercenary company. Caro ordered her troopers to respond to positive overtures, but ignore negative ones. And there were negative responses. Old men and women who remembered the Tedril Wars, and had decided that all mercs were like the Tedrils had been. At least once every time they halted, someone would shout an insult, which more than half the troopers couldn't understand anyway. Someone else would half apologize for Granther, and Caro or one of her lieutenants would carefully explain the difference between guild and non-guild mercs. It got to be so much of a commonplace that the troops began lying bets on who the troublemaker would be the moment they entered a town. Privately, Caro was relieved that the Tedrell Wars had been so very long ago. Years tended to bring forgetfulness, especially in the light of this new enemy. It didn't matter so much anymore that the Carsites had hired fighters calling themselves mercenaries. Those hired fighters had been just like the Carsites who hired them. They fought with steel like anyone else, and could be killed with that same steel. Ankar had hired mages, about which there were only tales, and every childhood boogeyman came leaping out of the closet to become the adult's worst nightmare. So for the most part, the people of Valdemar came out to see these hired fighters, hired to fight on their side, and came away comforted. These were tough, seasoned veterans on fast, slim horses like these farmers had never seen before. But they smiled at children, offered bits of candy, and let toddlers ride on a lead horse. They had faced mages and won. When someone managed to find a skybolt who knew either trade tongue or had a sketchy grasp of Valdemarin, and managed to ask, through the medium of painfully slow pantomime, about fighting against mages. The answer always surprised the questioner, for it was, invariably, a shrug, and a reply of, They die. Caro finally reduced it to a few simple sentences she had the officers teach the troops. Tell them, mage is a human. They bleed if you cut them, die if you strike them right. They need to eat and they get tired if they work magic for too long. And there are things to stop them, and things their magic can't work on. And then would follow the list of all the little tricks every guild merc knew. Salts and herbs, holy talismans, disrupting the mage's concentration, spell-breaking by interfering with the components, sneaking up and taking the mage from behind, even overwhelming the mage with a rush of arrows or bodies, so that he couldn't counter every one before he was taken down. These farmer folk and tradesmen, crafters and herders, were ordinary people. They'd heard all the old tales and nothing they heard gave them any confidence that they could do anything to protect themselves. The power of a mage seemed enormous and unstoppable, like a thunderstorm. To be told, by those who had faced them and won, that mages were just another kind of fighter, with weapons that determination could counter, gave the common people courage they hadn't had before, and a new trust in these foreign soldiers. All of which was to the good, as far as Carol was concerned. A friendly civilian populace is the best ally a merc can have. That was one of Tarma's maxims, 
and Ardenna had certainly proved what kind of enemy an unfriendly civilian populace could become, down in Sajay. The Skybolts knew the maxim and the drill. And even here, where half of them didn't even know the language well enough to ask for the Jakes, they were leaving allies on the road behind them. This kind of behavior was so ingrained in Caro and her troops that when Harold's Talia and Dirk rode in, about a week out of Haven, Carol was more than a little surprised by the broad grin of approval the latter sported. They arrived just after camp had been set up, and Caro was huddling over her brazier. The wind was particularly bitter, and seemed to find every weak point in the tent. The walls alternately flapped and belled, and Caro was hoping to get her cold bones into her bed, where she at least had a chance of getting them warm. She'd been expecting the arrival of an escort at any point, so when a runner brought her word of the herald's arrival, she grumbled a little, threw a little more charcoal on the brazier, kicked loose belongings under the cot, and went back to trying to soak up a bit more heat, until her orderly brought them to her tent, both of them muffled up in thick white cloaks, like walking snowdrifts. But when they entered, and Caro invited them to join her in hot tea, Dirk's open friendliness came as something of a shock. Back in Rethwellen, both the heralds had been close-mouthed, but Dirk had been practically mute, with an overtone of suspicion. Now he acted like she was a long-lost cousin, his homely face made handsome by his genuine smile. Now what on earth caused that? She wondered. They made some small talk, and as soon as the tea arrived, Caro asked cautiously, So, now that we're within a week of Haven, how do your queen and a lord marshal feel about our arrival? Is there anything we should expect? Dirk laughed and shook his head. If you're expecting a cool reception, you aren't going to get it, Captain. You and your skybolts have handled yourselves exceptionally well on the march up. She's very pleased with your diplomacy and restraint and... Diplomacy, Caro said, too annoyed to be polite. Restraint? What did she think we were going to do? Ride down little children, rape the sheep and wreck the taverns? Well, Dirk looked embarrassed. That's exactly what they expected, which we knew, really. Harold, we are professionals, she said tiredly. We fight for a living. This does not make us animals. In fact, on the whole, I think you'll find that my troopers, male and female, are less likely to cause trouble in a town than your average lot of spoiled, rotten, high-born brats. Dirk flushed a deep crimson. Oh, we have to go on the stories. Yes, well, you should hear some of the stories down south about Shana in Warsteeds or Harold's. The latter are demons and the former are basically ugly companions, she said, mustering up a frank smile. Now, one man's demon is another man's angel, and since the lads calling you lot demonic were thieves and scum that would rather do anything than work, I'll withhold any judgment on that. But I ride a war steed, and while she's a very intelligent beast, specially bred for what she does, she's nothing like a companion. So, so we shouldn't have been so quick to give credence to stories. Talia chuckled, bending a little closer to the fire. A well-deserved rebuke. But I have to tell you, Captain, that I think we were rightfully surprised at the way you've made friends for yourselves coming up the road. We were expecting to have to do a lot of calming of nerves on your behalf. Our people aren't used to the concept of mercenaries, and what they know about them is mostly bad. But you've done all our work for us. Caro shrugged, secretly pleased, and put another scoop of charcoal on the fire. Well, one of my clan mother's Shana in sayings is, a slighted friend is more dangerous than an enemy. We try to operate by that in friendly territory, and really it isn't that hard unless the people really have a bad attitude toward mercs in general. In fact, there was only one problem I had, and it seems to be in the family tradition. Oh, Dirk said, he and Talia both looking puzzled. She sighed. All their lives, my grandmother and her she Enidra were plagued by the songs of a particular minstrel. The things he told about them were half true at best, and led to all kinds of problems about what people expected from them. Well, when I was young and foolish and very full of... myself, 
Someone wrote a song about me. It's called Carowin's Ride, and to my utter disgust, it seems to have penetrated language barriers. Dirk looked as if he was having a hard time keeping from laughing. So did Talia. I know the song, the woman said, her face full of mirth. In fact, I've sung it. I was afraid of that. Do I dare hope no one in your court knows it's about me? Talia smiled. As far as I know, they don't, but it's a very popular song. Carowin sipped her tea, wondering for a moment if there was anyone in the world who hadn't heard the song. My troopers are ridiculously proud of that, and I can't get them to stop telling people that I'm that Carowin. And as soon as your villagers would find that out, I'd wind up having to listen to whatever unholy rendition of it someone had come up with in this village. Then I don't even like most music, she concluded plaintively. Dirk was red-faced with the effort of holding in laughter. Caro glowered at him, but that only seemed to make it worse. You should have had to sit through some of those performances, she growled. The Reveny Temple Children's Choir? the oldest fart in Thornton, accompanying himself on hurdy-gurdy. A pair of religious sopranos who seemed to think the thing was a dialogue between the crone and the maiden. And at least a dozen would-be bards with out-of-tune harps, minstrels, I like to strangle the entire breed. That did it. Dirk couldn't restrain himself any longer. He excused himself in a choking voice and fled outside. Once there, his bellows of laughter were just as clear as they would have been if he'd been inside the tent's four walls. Oh well, Caro said with resignation. At least he didn't laugh in my face. Talia was a little better at controlling herself. I can see where it would get tiresome, especially if you don't care for music. I don't like vocal music, Caro explained forlornly. And the reason I don't like it is because every damn fool that can tell one note from another thinks he rates right up there with master bards. I have perfect pitch, Harold. Nothing else. I certainly am no performer. But I do have perfect pitch, and my relative pitch is just as good. Out-of-tune amateurs make my skin crawl, like fingernails on slate. And it's no great benefit to have had a song written about you either. Just you wait. One of these days it'll happen to you. And then that tall fellow out there won't find it so funny to hear it every night for a fortnight straight. And only once in all that time will it be sung well. You're right, Captain, Dirk said contritely from the door flap. I apologize, but I wish you could have seen your own expression. I'm glad I couldn't. Listen, there's something I need to tell you people about. I didn't mention this before, but I had mages with this troop. Real mages practicing real magic. She watched them carefully to see what their reactions to this would be. Most merc companies do, if they can afford them, and we can. Hard, Dirk replied, after a long moment of silence. Does that mean you didn't bring them with you? She couldn't read anything from either of them and this was not the time to try prying into anyone's mind, especially not a herald who might catch her at it. No, she said, honestly. I tried to bring them with me, but they were stopped at the border. By what? They couldn't tell me. Only that it felt as if something was watching them, waking and sleeping. It finally got so bad they begged me to send them home before they went mad. That is evidently the reason why you don't have real mages here in Valdemar. Something doesn't want them here, and stares at them until they go away. Like the time with Eldon, she was having to fight something to get every word out, and she spoke slowly so that the effort wouldn't be noticed. It doesn't explain why something around here doesn't want you even knowing about magic. That's not my problem. As long as it doesn't freeze the words in my throat, I don't care. Need's been awfully quiet, but it really doesn't feel like the sword's being tampered with. It's beginning to feel as if Need doesn't want to draw attention to itself, which is fine with me. It means she is still working. The wind howled around the corners of the tent, 
and Talia pulled her white cloak closer. It certainly does explain a lot, she said, slowly, though I'm not sure what it means or where it comes from. It would probably take a very powerful mage to get around something like that, Dirk put in. Maybe by somehow disguising his nature. Caro shrugged. You could be right. But other than the fact that I've lost the use of my majors, it really doesn't matter. And if I were you, I wouldn't count on this effect saving Valdemar from majors in the future. My grandmother always said that every spell ever cast could be broken. And if Ankar has a strong enough mage in his back pocket, he can take the thing down altogether. Since I have lost the mages, I'm going to have to talk with more of you heralds to find out what you can do. I'm pretty certain you can make up for them, but I'll have to know what your limits are. One other thing. You might let the Queen know that, having worked pretty closely with all my mages and having watched my grandmother at work, I would say I'm a fair hand at judging mage powers and what they can and cannot do. That's easily enough done, Captain, Dirk said standing up. Is there anything else we can do for you? No, not until we get to Haven. And we can get into a real barracks building and I can get warm again. Carol remained seated when Dirk waved her down. Unless you can conjure me up a tent that's tighter than this one. I'm looking forward to meeting Queen Selene. Well, she's looking forward to meeting you, Talia said with a smile as she smiled back over her shoulder. I think you're going to like each other a great deal. Queen Selene was the sister Caro would have chosen, if she'd been given the power to make that choice. Caro knew it the moment their eyes met, blue to blue-green. They could easily have been sisters, too. Caro judged herself to be Selene's senior by no more than two or three years. Captain Carowin, the Queen said, rising from behind her desk and holding out her hand with no formality at all. I'm very glad to finally meet you, and equally glad that the years have brought you the kind of fortune Eldon said you deserved. Please, sit down. The mention of Eldon's name startled her. She swallowed with difficulty, and she searched the Queen's face carefully before accepting her hand. That could be considered faint praise, Your Majesty she replied cautiously as she took a chair. There's a Shana in curse considered to be very potent. May you get exactly what you deserve. Selene laughed, a velvety sound with no sign of malice in it. I'm sure neither of us meant it that way, and I am not your majesty among my commanders. On the field, the Lord Marshal ranks me, so I'm just plain Selene. There was nothing in the Queen's appearance to suggest that her statement was either coy or false modesty. She was dressed almost identically to Talia, who now stood at her side in the uniform Caro had learned was called Harold's Whites. Here in Valdemar, it seemed, Harold's dressed all in white, bards in scarlet and healers in green. Caro rather liked that last. It would make finding the healers much easier in battlefield conditions. On the other hand, on that same battlefield, as she had once pointed out to Eldon, those white uniforms must surely shout, I'm a target! Hit me! The only difference between Talia's and Selene's uniforms was that Talia openly carried a long knife and wore breeches, and Selene wore a kind of divided riding skirt that gave the appearance of a little more formality without sacrificing too much in the way of mobility. The queen's thick, shoulder-length blonde hair was confined by a simple gold circlet. There was no other outward sign of her rank. Even this office, the first room of the royal suite, was furnished quite plainly. There were two old tapestries on the wall, a few chairs chosen more for comfort than looks, and a dark wooden desk cluttered with papers. There was no indication anywhere that this room was used by anyone with any kind of rank. We're under wartime conditions here, Captain. Selene continued, accepting Caro's scrutiny serenely. I don't know what you are anticipating, but I am expecting a certain amount of work out of your troops until we take the field. Hmm. Better make some things plain. 
like we aren't miracle workers. I'll tell you this honestly, you're... Selene, Carol replied. If you're expecting us to turn to and help with everything except training green recruits, we'll be able to do what you want. But if you thought we could take plowboys and make specialist cavalry out of them in less than a fortnight, you might as well just send us straight out to where you expect Ankar, because we can't do it. Nobody can. Selene nodded quickly, as if that was what she had expected Carol would say. I realize that. What I'd like your people to do is work with the mounted troops we've gotten from some of the highborn, privately recruited, maintained, and trained. I expect some of them will be dreadful. I'd like the dreadful ones weeded out and put somewhere harmless. Some will be marginal, and those will put with the mounted guard units, the ones I had out chasing bandits. The good ones I'd like you to train as much as you can, so that they'll work together without charging into each other. Which is what they're doing at the moment, Talia added from behind the queen. If the situation wasn't so bad, I'd advise keeping them around for entertainment. Carol managed to keep her face straight. Selene's mouth quirked up at one corner, but she did likewise. Keep the Lord Marshal appraised on a daily basis. I've appointed a liaison for you. Carowin was impressed and relieved, both. Selene had a good grasp of what was possible and what was not, and was willing to settle for the possible. That made her job that much easier. Can do, she replied, relaxing. Who's my liaison to the Lord Marshal? My daughter, Elspeth, Selene said, and Caro's heart sank. Just what I need. And now everything princess at my heels. I wonder if I can convince Anders to charm her and get her out of my way. With those big brown eyes, the beautiful body and all the rest of it, he should. A rap on the door to the queen's quarters interrupted them. And as Caro turned, startled, another slim young woman in white slipped inside. A brown-haired, brown-eyed girl, with a startling resemblance to Ferrum. Mother, I'm sorry I'm late, but there was a... She stopped instantly as Selene held up her hand. You're here now, and you can tell me what delayed you later. Elspeth, this is Captain Carowin. Captain, your liaison, my daughter. The girl's eyes went round with surprise, and she crossed the room quickly, to take Carol's hand in as firm a clasp as her mother had. I'm dreadfully sorry, Captain, she said in accentless Rethwellen. If I'd known you were arriving today, I'd have arranged things differently. We Harolds have to spend our first year or two acting as arbitrators and judges under the supervision of a senior Harold. Normally that's outside Haven, where we can't run home to Mama when a thunderstorm hits. But since I'm the heir, they won't let me do that. Go out in the field, I mean, not run home to Mama. Carol blinked. Well, this is amazing. First highborn child I've ever met who wasn't either spoiled or convinced rank alone conferred wisdom. I can understand the constraints, she replied in Elspeth's tongue. All it would take would be one stray arrow. Elspeth sighed. I know, but the problem is that since I'm not out of reach, the weapons master seems to think I have all the time I need for lessening and practicing and Harold Presson keeps assigning me to another city court, and I still have all the council meetings as heir, and, Mother, Terran said to tell you that I have the war council, I know. So do you, and I'm bringing the captain along. Selene smiled fondly on her offspring, and Caro didn't blame her. Caro echoed the smile. There wasn't going to be any trouble in working with this one. Then, out of nowhere... Need roused, for the first time since crossing the border, focused on Elspeth, and for one moment, sang. Carol felt as if someone had dropped her inside a metal bell, then hit the outside with a hammer. She and the sword vibrated together for what seemed like forever, with everything, everything, focused on Elspeth, who seemed entirely unaware that anything was going on. She kept right on with her conversation with her mother, while Caro tried to regain her scattered wits. There was no doubt in her mind that Need had found the person she wanted to be passed on to. But now? 
She thought that question at the sword as hard as she could. But the blade was entirely quiescent once more, as if nothing had happened. Blessed Agnara, Caro thought, mortally glad that Selene and her daughter were still deep in conversation. Is that what the thing did to Grandmother the first time I showed up on her doorstep? No, it couldn't have. For one thing, she wasn't wearing it at the time. But I'd be willing to bet this is how that old fighter that passed it to her felt. Well, at least this stupid thing wasn't going to insist on being handed over immediately. Maybe it sensed that Kara was going to require its power in the not-too-distant future. And surely it knew, if it was aware, that she'd fight it on that point until this war was over. Fine, she decided, as Selene turned away from her daughter and gestured that the two of them should follow her out the door. I'll worry about it later. We all have other things to worry about. And I'll be damned if I'll give this thing to a perfectly nice child like Elspeth, with no warning of what it can do to her. And she thought straight at the blade. So don't you go trying your tricks on her, or I'll see that she drops you down a well. 22. Spring is a lousy time to fight, Caro thought, peering through the drizzle as droplets condensed and ran down her nose and into her eyes. She wiped them away in bleak misery. And if that fool is going to attack, you'd think he'd pick better weather than this. Fog and rain. What a slimy mess. She stood beside the mare on the only significant elevation in the area. Though it stood well above the surrounding countryside, it wasn't doing her any good. This miasma had reduced visibility to a few lengths and the only way she was going to find anything out was through the scouts and outriders. Hellsbane shivered her skin to shed collected water droplets. Kara wished she could do the same. If Selene's people hadn't insisted that here and now was where Ankar was going to make his first attempt, expecting no resistance, she'd have gone right back to the tent where it was warm. Her hands ached with cold, and there was a leaky place in her rain cloak just above her right shoulder but the tent was already packed up, and the heralds with the gift of foresight hadn't been wrong so far. The only troops on the field today were the Skybolts in Valdemar colors. To them would fall the task of harrying Ankar for the first couple of engagements, of wearing him out before he ever encountered real Valdemar troops, and of confusing him with tactics he wouldn't have expected out of regular army troopers. They'd staged their defense with an eye to making him lose his more mobile fighters early on, the troops Ankar would meet for the next several days were all mounted. The foot troops would meet up with them farther north. At that point, hopefully, his foot soldiers would be exhausted from trying to keep up with the horse, while their foot would still be fresh. Caro's plan was to make every inch of ground Ankar gained into an expensive mistake, and to lure him northward with the illusion of success, when all the time he was only moving along his own border. When Caro had explained, as delicately as possible, her company's other specialty, Selene had given her another pleasant surprise. You mean your saboteurs? She'd exclaimed with delight. A whole company of dirty tricksters! Bright Astera! Why didn't you say that before? For haven's sake, if anyone questions your tactics, send them to me, I'll back you. So now Caro and the Skybolts had carte blanche to do whatever they needed to which was just as well, really, since they would have done so anyway. I thought some of the things we'd run into before were odd, but this is stranger than snake feet, she thought, recalling her presentation to the War Council once she'd finally worked out a general plan based on the tentative one she'd put together with Darren. First, the watchers, whatever they were, then the fact that it's like driving nails into stone to talk to people around here about magic. But then there's the business with Iftel. It's like the country was invisible from inside Valdemar. It's on the map, but their eyes slide right by it. We basically have to get Ankar in a pinsa and leave him with only one avenue of escape. Our best bet right now is to get him right up against the Iftel border and trap him there, she'd said to the War Council. And they had, to a man and woman, looked absolutely blank. 
Finally, if tell, faltered Talia, as if she had trouble even saying the name. Why if tell? Because of what I've been told by the guild, Caro had said to them all, that if tell protects itself by making you forget it exists and keeping you out if it doesn't want you in. I think you've just confirmed the first, which makes me think the second is true too. If tell is strange, Selene admitted. I do have an ambassador there, a non-Harold. They... How odd. They didn't want a Harold there at all. Yet they have never, ever threatened us in all our history. And they have signed some fairly binding treaties that they never will. From all accounts, though, the country is just as strange as the Pelagias, and that is very strange indeed. That matched with what Caro had been told by the Guild. They didn't have a representative there, but it wasn't because they'd been barred from the place. It was because every time they'd sent someone in, he nearly died of boredom. Iftel had no bandits. Iftel had its own standing militia, organized at the county level. Iftel hired no mercenaries because Iftel needed no mercenaries. Occasionally young folk got restless enough to leave. But that was the only time the guild ever got members from Iftel. And they never went back home. Iftel took care of itself, thank you. Well, that made it a good place to take a stand. Ankar's forces would be squeezed against the Iftel border to the north. Valdemar's forces would be to the west, and Rathwellen's, hopefully, would be coming up from the south. Kara wiped rain out of her eyes without doing much good. She still couldn't see past the bottom of the hill, but somewhere out beyond in the fog, the specialists had been at work. And if the four seers were right, in the next candlemark or so, Ankar's forward troops would run right into something nasty that wasn't supposed to be there. The skirmishers stirred restlessly below her, waiting for their chance. Today was likely to be the only easy day of the campaign, which was why Caro had wanted only her company in on it. They knew that a war is neither lost nor won in the first battle, and they knew very well that one easy day is the exception, not the rule. But if Selene's greener forces were in on this, when the going got rougher and rougher, they might see every day after the easy one as a constant series of defeats and lose heart. In fact, Caro hoped she wouldn't lose a single fighter this day. But she knew as well as anyone on the field that engagements like that came once in a career and never again. So we'll do one. The sound of muffled hoofbeats came through the fog. Years of practice had enabled Caro to pinpoint where the sound was really coming from on days of rotten visibility. It's from the ambush side. I think we're about to get some action. One of the scouts materialized out of the drizzle and pelted up the hillside, his horse mired to the belly. They're coming on, Captain. Straight for the trap. Her heartbeat quickened, in spite of years of experience. Good, she replied and the herald beside her silently relayed that on to the rest of his kind, which included Selene and Elspeth. Tell the rest that if it looks like he's straying, tease him into it. Sir, the scout saluted, and pelted off again, vanishing back into the mist like a ghost. The trap was a swamp, a swamp that hadn't been there a week ago. But last month, Caro's experts had diverted a small river from its bed, several leagues away, and had confined its waters behind an earthen dam just above the flat, grassy meadow the four seers said Ankar was aiming for. Then, two nights ago, they had broken the dam. Now the place was two and three feet deep in water and mud, all covered by the long grass growing there and the luxuriant, green, moss-like scum floating on the top. One of Caro's healers had a remarkable ability with plants, and much to everyone's surprise and delight, the heralds were able to feed him energy. Between the scum they'd cultured with tender care on the temporary lake for the past month and the accelerated growth of the past two nights, they now had the kind of cover that normally took half the summer to grow. It looked just like solid land, until you tried to walk on it. Now was when Caro missed her mages the most. They would have been able to create illusions of solid land and phantoms of Valdemar forces along with those illusions. 
That would have lured Ankar's people into a charge right into the worst of the muck. And once the charge had started, the momentum of the troops behind the front line would have driven the rest even deeper. Whole wars had been won with blunders like that. Instead, she could only wait for his front line to wander into the swamp and bring her skirmishers around to harry him deeper into the mire. Supposedly, there was a herald out there, also diverting water from a nearby spring to come up behind him, so that he'd have muck on three sides. But she wasn't counting on that. Hoof beats again in the mist, but this time the scout didn't bother to gallop up the hillside. He just waved and turned back. That was the signal Caro had been waiting for. She vaulted into her saddle and whistled. Below her, the skirmishers moved out at a careful walk, so that every part of the line stayed in contact with the part next to it. Fighting in conditions like these was hellish, and it was appallingly easy to fire on some vague shape out there, only to discover that it was one of your own. Friendly fire isn't. That was one of Tarma's Shana'in sayings, succinct and to the point. We haven't lost a skyboat to friendly fire yet, she thought as she sent her horse carefully picking her way down the slick, grassy slope. I don't want to start now. The herald and his companion followed her, silent as a pair of ghosts, and hardly more substantial in the mist. For once that white uniform was an advantage. She urged Hellsbane into a brief trot at the bottom of the hill, then reined the war steed in once they caught up with the skirmishers. She was anchoring the westernmost portion of the line, the place where Ankar's men might get around them if they weren't vigilant. They sure as hell can't go south. Another reason not to have Valdemar regulars on this action. Most of the ground to the south was booby-trapped, and Caro didn't want the green troops to wander into it. Any place horses or foot could get through was thick with tripwires, pit traps, and gopher holes. One of the heralds, it seemed, had a gift of speaking to animals and he must have called in every mole and gopher for leagues around to undermine those fields. No horse could ever get safely across those fields, and it was even risking a broken ankle to try it if you were afoot. Regulars might forget that. The Skybolts would sooner forget their pay. So the south was booby-trapped, then came the swamp on the west. The only safe ground was to the north, which was exactly where they wanted Ankar to go. That was the side they'd contest and they were going to have to make it look as if they'd come upon Ankar by accident. If he thought they were a small force of Selene's guard, which we are, small, that is, backed by nobody, which we aren't, depending mostly on the treacherous terrain to protect this section of the border, he'd be on them like a hound on a hare. Meanwhile, they'd try and stay just out of his range. If the enemy is within firing range, so are you. Tarma's voice croaked in her mind, and pick as many of his men off as they could before he extracted them from the mire. That was the heart and soul of Caro's strategy in this first engagement. Up ahead in the mist, and far to her right, Caro heard a wild horn call. It sounded exactly like a young bugler in a panic, and she mentally congratulated Geir on his imitation fear. That was the signal that the right flank was up even with the edge of the swamp, and the enemy was in sight. She took Hellsbane up to a fast walk, and the rest followed her lead. Then the mare planted all four feet and snorted. She whistled, and the line stopped moving. They'd planted the edge of the bad ground with wild onions, and the moment Hellsbane had smelled one, she'd known to stop. Right at this point it wasn't marsh, but it was waterlogged and soft and not what any of them wanted to take a horse through. Besides, in a few moments, the enemy would come to them. The mist muffled noise, but as Caro strained to hear past the sounds of her own people, she made out faint cries and things that sounded like shouted orders and curses off to her right and ahead, and they were coming closer with every moment. She whistled again, the signal was repeated up and down the line, and as if they were reflections of a single man, Every skybolt slipped his short horsebow or crossbow from its oiled case, strung or cocked it, set one arrow on the string and put another between his teeth or behind his ear. Their range with these weapons was far longer than their current range of visibility. There would be one ideal moment 
when they knew the enemy was coming. But he didn't know the sky bolts were there, when they would have the best chance of trimming down some of the front ranks. It was the best opportunity that they'd likely ever get during the march north, the point where the enemy forces would be just barely visible as vague shapes moving through the mist. No one aimed yet. Caro strained her eyes for the first sign of the enemy, knowing that every one of her people was doing the same. The skirmishers knew to fire as soon as they thought they saw anything, and never mind bothering about targets. The mist would be too deceptive to allow for accurate shooting anyway, and the more arrows that sped toward the enemy lines, the likelier the chances of actually hitting someone. Any injury is a nuisance. In a swamp, any injury could be fatal. She heard splashing, and thought she saw something, hesitated a moment. There, to the right, was that? Yes! The thought actually followed on the act of aiming, firing, and knocking a second arrow and firing again. Nor was she alone. Virtually all of the fighters in her immediate vicinity had done the same. And the shouts and screams from the billowing fog were all the reward any of them could have asked for. The enemy surged forward, became, for a moment, more than just shapes. Now they were targets, and the hail of shafts became more deadly accurate. The sky bolts fired, and fired again, while Ankar's forces tried in vain to get their own archers into position, and lost man after man to the wicked little arrows. Half of the skirmishers fired Shana in bows, powerful, out of all proportion to their size, made of laminated wood, horn, and sinew. The little arrows couldn't penetrate good armor, but they could and did find the joints, the neck, the helm's slits, all the small but numerous weak spots in a common soldier's war gear. The other half of the skybolts used heavy horse crossbows, which could penetrate armor, and often entire bodies, though the short bowmen got off four shots for every single crossbow bolt. The trade was worth it, since they made a devastating combination. Hellsbane stood as steady as a statue under her, ignoring the screams and the whirring of arrows all around her. Ankar's forces floundered in the mud for long enough to lose plenty of men, before the armored officers that weren't dropped by the crossbows pulled them back into the cover of the mist. A few moments later, Caro heard the whistled signal farther up the line, then the whir of arrows and the shouts and cries of pain started all over again, off beyond the wall of fog. We probably aren't doing more than nibble away at him, she thought, trying to judge the size of the army from the sounds in the murk. But right now, I'll bet the front rank isn't a very popular place to be. But the sun began to break through the clouds, and the drizzle lessened. Whether Ankar had weather-working mages with him, or whether it was just the time for the weather to clear, Caro couldn't tell. It looks natural enough, she decided, as the sun became a visible disk through the overcast. Well, no streak of luck runs forever. Ankar's officers had figured out what was happening, too. The sounds from out of the mist quieted, except for the moaning of those unfortunates wounded and left behind in the muck as their comrades retreated. Caro whistled another signal, also passed up the line. Geyer sounded his bugle again, still in character as a frightened youngster. As soon as the mist broke and the enemy could see them clearly, she expected a charge, and she wanted the sky bolts ready to move just before it came. The sun broke through the clouds and the fog lifted in a rush, as if frightened away by the light. That was when the sky bolts saw the true size of the force facing them. The sun blazed down on the field, as if to make up for the fact that it had hidden all morning. Carol hadn't known what size of army to expect, and had planned for the worst, but hoped for the best. In that fleeting instant, between when the enemy officers sighted them and their trumpeters sounded a charge, Carol had time first to curse, then to be very thankful that the only troops here were hers. The veteran skybolts would fake a panic and turn tail, just as the plan dictated. If Selene's green forces had been faced with this sight, the panicked flight might well have been real. She couldn't imagine unseasoned fighters being able to hold against something like this. There seemed 
no end to them. They filled the valley and spilled out over the hills beyond. She couldn't imagine where Ankar had gotten so many men. And they were all men, all that she could see, anyway. That in itself was ominous. Why not have female fighters, archers at least? Bloody hell. Better get out of range quick. She gave Hellsbane her cue and the mare reared as if spurred, screamed and slewed around on her hindquarters and lurched into a gallop. The rest of her fighters weren't far behind her. She bent over Hellsbane's neck and looked back over her shoulder. As she had expected, Ankar's officers retreated to that apparent stampede by frantically signaling a charge. But they didn't know the ground, and Caro and her native guides did. Their mounted troops were on tired beasts that had just spent the last candle mark struggling through mire, and the poor things weren't Shana in bread. They did their best, but before they'd even gotten to firm ground, the sky bolts were well out of range of even the heaviest crossbow. Once on firm ground, they still weren't a match for Shana in bread's speed and stamina. The lead continued to open. She grinned, fairly. Never reckoned on that. Did you, my lord Anka? Caro halfway expected them to give up and turn back. But they didn't. That meant it was time to give them another goading. She wheeled Hellsbane at the top of the slope and raised her hand. A heartbeat later, the rest of the skybolts joined her on the ridge, already readying another flight of arrows. And as she brought her hand down, they rained missiles down on the cavalry struggling up the slope toward them. Horses and riders alike fell screaming in pain, and as the front rank went down, they tripped the ranks behind, bringing the charge to chaos. She hated to do it, but horses were harder to replace than fighters, so horses were fair targets. This time she only allowed time for one crossbow volley, before signaling that it was time to run again. She thought that surely they'd turn back now. But when she looked back over her shoulder, as the sky bolts pounded down the other side of the hill. She saw the first of them, silhouetted against the sky, still coming. What in hell is driving these men? What could be so bad behind them that they'd rather face this? She debated stopping a second time and letting off another volley, but something deep inside her told her that might not be wise. In another moment, she was very glad she'd made that decision, for riding at the head of the charge on a strange horned creature that was not a horse was an unarmored man dressed in brilliant scarlet. A mage. She made a split-second decision. Need would protect her, but she didn't know if it could still protect the rest of her troops without Quentin there to make sure of the extension of the spell. As always, Hellsbane was in the lead, whether in retreat or in the charge. She waved to her lieutenants to go on without her and pulled the mare up, reining her around and readying her own bow. This one had better count. She raised the bow, arrow pulled to her ear, saw the mage raise his hands, a gesture, a throwing motion, felt a tingle all over her body like the pins and needles of a limb waking from being benumbed, and heard... In the back of her mind, an angry humming, as if she'd roused a hive full of enraged bees. Need? What's the damned thing doing this time? She was too far away to see the mage's face. He was really at the extreme of her best range. But he raised his hands again as she loosed her arrow, and his abrupt movement seemed to speak of anger and puzzlement. She never even saw the arrow in flight. Neither did he, or he might have been able to deflect it arcanely. But as the tingle increased, so did the humming, until it seemed to be actually in her ears. And not two lengths from him, the arrow she had loosed suddenly incandesced, and flared to an intolerable brightness as it hit him squarely in the chest, burying itself right to the feathers. He froze for a moment in mid-gesture, then slowly toppled from his mount, which turned, of all unlikely things, into a milch cow. An exhausted, gaunt cow that wandered two or three steps, 
then fell over on its side, unable to rise again. The humming stopped, and Carol was not about to wait around to see if her action stopped the pursuit. She turned Hellsbane in a pivot on her two rear hooves and continued her flight, giving the mare her head until the war steed caught up with the rest of the troops. She didn't look back. If there's anything more back there, I don't want to know about it. Hellsbane was no longer running easily. Sweat foamed on her neck, and Caro felt her sides heave under her legs. Finally, the laboring of their horses forced them to slow. And this time, when they slowed to a walk and looked back, there was no one in sight. The horses drooped, gasping great gulps of air, coats sodden with sweat. She felt guilty for having had to push them so much, and felt profoundly grateful that she wasn't going to have to push them any more. It looked as if Ancar didn't have any more mages to spare. Gods be praised. I don't think I'll get to pull that off a second time. They weren't expecting need. Now they'll be doubly careful. And damned if I know what it was she did to my arrow. She's never done anything like that before. Then again, we've never fought in service of a female monarch against a male enemy before. An enemy who wants the monarch's hide for a rug. And that's just for a beginning. The herald gave her a peculiar look when she took Hellsbane in beside him. But he didn't say anything. She wondered how much of the exchange with the mage he had seen then decided that it really didn't matter. I don't see any reason to alter the plan yet, she told him. Tell Selene to bring up a light cavalry behind us. I don't think we'll be seeing any more action today, but I didn't think they'd follow us over that first ridge either. We need a rear guard, at least for the moment. He nodded, and went off into his little trance, and his companion gave her one of those blue-eyed stares that Eldon's companion Rotha had sometimes fixed her with. She nudged the mare with her heel and moved Hellsbane ahead of them, suddenly uneasy with the penetrating intelligence behind those eyes. She had the feeling that even if the Herald had missed the mage's attack and defeat, his companion hadn't. He doesn't know what to make of me either. He's giving me one of those looks, like he had thought I was just a grunt fighter, and now he's not so sure. It was a most unnerving feeling, and she began to have an idea how Quentin and the others had felt before they'd quit Valdemar and headed home. It felt as if she was being weighed and tested against some unknown standard, and what was more, she didn't like it. Finally, she couldn't take any more of it. She dropped Hellsbane back and deliberately made eye contact with the companion. His herald was still off in the clouds somewhere, communing with his brethren, which left the field safe for what she intended to do, which was to drop shields and think directly at the creature. Look, I don't tell you how to do your job. I'm doing what I pledged Selene I'd do. And what's more, I'm doing a damned good piece of work so far. You keep your prejudices to yourself and stay the hell out of my way and my head so I can keep doing it. The companion started and jerked his head up, his eyes wide, as if she'd stung him with a pebble in the hindquarters. She slammed her shield shut again and sent Hellsbane into a tired canter that took her to the front of the troop. And when next she looked back, the companion met her gaze with a wary respect and nothing more. She couldn't help herself. She wore a smug little smile all the way back to the camp. Don't make judgment calls. You might find yourself on the other end of one. That's another one of Thomas's sayings, and right now I'm as guilty of it as that companion is. But damn if that didn't feel good. Camp was a cold camp. No fires and trail rations. Tents stayed packed up. Until they figured out the pattern Ankar's troops had, Kara wasn't going to give him any vulnerable points to hit, like a camp. Even with experienced fighters like hers, camp meant safe, in the back of their minds, and right now she didn't want anyone thinking safe. They'd bivouacked in a grove of hazelnut bushes, tucking bedrolls out of sight under the bushes themselves, helping out nature's own camouflage with artfully placed branches. From a distance, no one would ever guess there was an entire company of fighters and their horses in here. 
It looked like any deserted orchard. What with the three rings of perimeter guards, no one would get close enough to find out any differently. And that tentlessness included Caro. It was good for morale, and it made her less of a target. She did have one of the better bushes, a clump of them, actually, with thick, drooping branches, but room on the inside for three or four. And she had it alone. But there were a few advantages to being captain. The herald vanished after they'd tucked themselves up, established perimeters and set watches, and sent the specialists off to make Ankar's life interesting. She settled down on her bedroll with a piece of jerky in one hand and a tiny shielded dark lantern, focused on the detailed map spread over her knees. At some point during her study, her orderly brought her a battered tin cup full of water and said, rather too calmly, that the herald who'd been with her this morning was being replaced. She looked up, sharply, and saw the corners of his mouth twitching. Ah, she said, and left it at that. Made himself unwelcome, did he? Maybe I did a little judging, but it sounds like he did a lot more. She fell asleep with a clear conscience, and resolved not to let the replacement get on her officer's nerves as the first herald had. In the morning, as soon as she'd gotten the reports from her scouts, she gathered her officers together inside the heart of the grove, to lay out her next plan of action. While she gave each lieutenant his orders, she caught sight of something white moving up, just out of the corner of her eye. So, our first liaison couldn't handle the job. A little late, my friend, she thought to herself, and I hope you're a bit more flexible than your predecessor. But she otherwise ignored him until she'd finished briefing her officers. Only then did she turn to see who, or what, Selene had sent to her this time. And felt as if someone had just poleaxed her. Oh, she said faintly. I'm, ah, uh, the replacement, Eldon said with hesitation, playing with the ends of his companion's reins. Selene thought you'd be less likely to frighten us off, at least on purpose. I wouldn't count on that if I were her, Caro replied, around a funny feeling in her chest, still staring at him. He looked wonderful. He had an age to speak of. Her dream Eldon become substantial. We have never ridden with my troops. We're a nasty lot, and what we meet up with tends to be just as vicious as we are. That wasn't what she meant. Eldon dropped his eyes before she did, which gave her a chance to give him a quick once-over before he looked up again. He hadn't changed much, either. Maybe the white streaks in his hair were a little whiter and there were a couple of smile lines around his mouth and eyes. But otherwise he was the same. She wondered how she looked to him. It doesn't have to be me. If you don't want, uh, I mean, I don't, she interrupted him fiercely, fairly sure what he was going to say and not wanting to hear it. I can't afford a liability, not here, not now. I can't permit you to distract me from my people. If you can do your job and leave it at that, fine. Otherwise, find me someone else, and make sure it's someone with guts and a sense of humor this time. We're perilous short of both. I noticed, Eldon muttered with a flash of resentment and irritation, not quite under his breath. You... You what? She stared at him for a moment, torn between wanting to laugh and wanting to rip his face off for that. Laughter won. She leaned up against Hellsbane's saddle, then shook with silent laughter, until her knees were weak and tears ran down her face. Eldon just stood there, looking a little puzzled, but otherwise keeping his mouth shut. Oh, gods, she said, or rather gasped. Oh, dear gods, I had that coming. She pushed away from the mare and wiped her eyes with the back of her hand. You certainly did. Eldon said agreeably. Then he widened his eyes and his tone grew wheedling. Come on, Caro. You need me along just to keep you humble. I do not, she retorted, stung, 
and I don't need you pulling any Mama, may I axe on me? But as long as you're here, you might as well tag along anyway. She was tempted to jump into the saddle without using the stirrups. But that's a youngster's show-off trick. Besides, it wouldn't impress him. I wouldn't leap into the saddle like a young hero if I were you, said the familiar voice in her head. I'd have to match you, and I'm too old and tired for that. Sure you are. She'd answered him the same way, without realizing it, until she'd done so. For the first time in her life, mind speech felt as natural as audible speech. Even with Warrell, it had been an effort, and seemed wrong, like trying to walk on her hands and eat with her feet. She should have been alarmed by that. She should have been unhappy to be reminded that she had the gift. The youngster training with Tarma would have been ready to gut him. The Caro of ten years ago would have ordered him out of her company. But now, all that fuss seemed pretty stupid and awfully paranoid. It was an ability, like her perfect pitch, and a lot more useful. Now talking by mind speech felt as if she'd been doing it for years. Besides, it's about time you found out what military discipline is like. It'll do you good. And while we're in the field, it's Captain. Not Caro, not Captain Caro. Captain. Got that? He nodded, swinging up into his companion's saddle. Sorry, Captain, and I think I understand. This is a military command, and you need a different kind of attitude from everybody connected with your troops, right? Otherwise discipline breaks down. Heralds do things differently. We encourage familiarity, but we almost never get it. Heralds don't have to command a few hundred hot-blooded, hard-headed fighters, each of whom is at some time or other convinced he could captain the company better than you. She sent Hellsbane out through the bushes to the field on the other side, where the skybolts were mustering. Eldon kept right at her side, as if they'd been doing this together for years. You haven't had that particular problem for the past six fighting seasons, he retorted. Your people follow you, the way no other captain could command. Right now your only problem is that they are so confident in you that you're afraid they won't come to you when they think there's something wrong with your strategy. So don't stop feeling sorry for yourself. Since that was exactly what she'd been confiding in the dream Eldon in the last dream she'd had about him, she was understandably startled. She reined Hellsbane in so fast that the horse reared a little, snorting, as she whipped around in the saddle to face him. How did you know that? She blurted, flushing and chilling in turn. I haven't said anything to anyone about that. Except in dreams. He had gone a little pale himself. But they weren't dreams, were they? Hellsbane reacted to her unconscious signals and backed up, one slow step at a time. I thought they were, she said, and her voice shook. I thought you were. I thought I was going crazy. I thought it didn't matter if I hadn't. I'd never have said. Done. Half of what I did. Why not? He demanded, his companion Rotha matching Hellsbane's every step. The mare flattened her ears and snapped. The companion ignored her. Weren't we friends, at least? I thought we were. Oh, I admit it, that was a dirty trick I played on you with the ransom, but I had no idea how desperate your situation was. I thought your company and captain were pretty much intact. If I'd known, I'd have had Selene send you double with no strings attached, and not because I felt sorry for you, no, but because we were, are, uh, uh, friends. And friends help each other. But after that, the dreams. I thought I'd made amends. I needed to talk with you. Needed to be with you. I couldn't let you just walk out of my life like that. Caro, I... I love you. I'll take anything I can get with you. She forced herself to think rationally. After all, this wasn't much different from the way he was mind-speaking her now, and slowly relaxed. I got you back with the ransom, she reminded him. 
as she loosed her hands on the reins and Hellsbane stopped backing. He grinned at that and nodded. You certainly did, and cleverly too. And I wish you'd been there to see the old goat they sent as the guild proxy. He just gave me one look and made me feel like a small boy who's been caught trying to look up little girls' dresses. She chuckled at the image he sent her. It was a guild representative she barely recognized, but knew by reputation, which was formidable. But that's not the point, he continued. The reason I kept coming to you is that I'm your friend, before I'm anything else, Caro. Friends help each other. Friends bring their troubles to each other, especially if they can't take them anywhere else. And I confided a good share in you. Didn't I? She nodded reluctantly, once he'd called up the memory. Did you really want to strangle that idiot that much? Yes, Eldon replied. He made me angry, then made me look like a fool in front of a lot of people because I acted out of anger before I thought. I wanted to strangle him. You managed to persuade me that the best way to deal with him was to ignore him. But you know, I still want to strangle him. She laughed silently, and shook her head. All she'd done with him was talk mind to mind, which was probably why she was no longer so awkward at it, and take and give advice. The same kind she'd have taken and given if they'd been talking face to face. That wasn't so bad. In fact, she'd enjoyed it. I probably should be angry at him, but I can't be. Are you sure you're up to this job? She asked after a long pause. You don't have to be my liaison. I'm not the easiest person in the world to get along with, and I wasn't joking about calling me captain, at least in public. I have my share of wards. I'll call you anything you want. And you could do without me, you know. You're just as good at mind speech as I am. Not a chance, she snorted. Come on, tag along. I've got a war to run. Then, shyly, I love you too. But you knew that, didn't you? I told you before, in dreams. You did, he replied promptly. I can't promise it won't color things. But I can and do promise if it starts causing problems for either of us, I'll get Selenae to assign you someone else. She, she knows about us. This was her idea. That put a whole new complexion on things. I'm a captain first, and a lover second. But there just might be room for the lover now. Only if it doesn't interfere. He was adamant. So was she. Only if it doesn't interfere. So far it hasn't. Let's ride this out. He smiled. Captain, you've got yourself a bargain. And a recruit. Today the plan called for her company and Selene's cavalry to combine, and give Ankar just enough of a taste of combat to make him think that they really were trying to keep him out of Valdemar. Then they were to pretend panic and run for the next set of guards posted farther north. The trouble was that little taste turned into a rather large and painful bite. They spent most of the day leading the enemy over land, keeping just out of range, exhausting his horses while they changed off on their remounts at noon, and had fresh beasts to his tired ones. Then, just before sunset, they pretended to make a stand, teased Ankar's men into a charge, and retreated under covering fire. The spot for their stand had been carefully chosen, a rocky hillside with plenty of cover, and too many boulders for Ankar's cavalry to charge. Kara watched with a critical eye, carefully gauging the weariness of Ankar's fighters. She let three successive waves approach her position and be driven back, waiting for Ankar's officers to call in the tired men for the night. Instead, they kept coming. A fourth wave, and as the sun set, a fifth, and under torchlight, a sixth. They were running out of ammunition, energy, and still the enemy kept coming, 
though he left his dead and wounded in heaps at the foot of their stony shelter. After the eighth wave had retreated, Carol put down her bow and sagged against her boulder with exhaustion. Her arms were like a pair of lead bars. Her legs shook with weariness, and she was in relatively good shape. Selene's people, far more inclined than hers to risk themselves for a good shot, had managed to populate the rude shelter the healers had assembled with their wounded. Not too many sky bolts wore bandages yet, but if this kept up, she watched the torches bobbing and dancing out beyond firing range and longed fiercely for her mages. It looked, dear gods, like they were massing for attack wave number nine. I don't believe this, she muttered, staring at Ankar's lines. I don't either, said Shallon from the other side of the boulder, in a voice fogged with fatigue. They're not human. Or they're driven by something that isn't human, Eldon said grimly. The bastard has some kind of hold over them. They'd rather face our arrows than what he's got over there. Caro turned around and looked over her shoulder. Is that a guess or information? Eldon looked like the rest of them. His white uniform was smudged and filthy. There was dirt in his hair and sweat-streaked dust on his face. I guess, he said, staring past her at the enemy. I'm not an empath, like Talia, and they have some kind of shield over them that prevents me from reading their thoughts. But I think it's a pretty good guess. Seeing as they had one mage with them that was willing to charge right in after us, you're probably right, Caro said, turning back to look at the enemy herself. If they have mages, why haven't they used magic on us? Eldon wondered aloud. Carol gave him a sharp look out of the corner of her eye, but it didn't look as if he was being sarcastic or asking a pointed question, merely as if he really was puzzled. She shrugged. Maybe because we're inside Voldemar, she said. Maybe he only had the one mage. Maybe because he's saving the mages for when he has a target worth their while. She watched the milling of the enemy troops for a moment more then made her decision. Tell Selene and the rest that I've just changed the plan, she told Eldon. Get the foot troops out first, then Selene's horse, then we'll play rear guard. We've got the advantage of knowing this country in the dark. They don't. I don't think they plan on stopping until every last one of us is dead. And I think we'd better get our rumps out of here while we have the cover of darkness. Yes, Captain, Eldon said. He didn't wander off in a trance when he mind-spoke with someone like his fellow Harold had. He simply frowned a little, as if he was concentrating. Selene and the Lord Marshal agree, he said after a moment. The foot is already moving out. Fine. She turned to Shallon. Pass the order. The retreat is for real. And dear gods of my childhood, help us because we're in dire need of it. 23. It was a retreat, not a rout, but only because no one panicked. That retreat didn't end with morning either. When dawn broke, Caro sent scouts back, more because she believed in being too cautious than because she really expected anything. She knew there was trouble when they returned too quickly. The first one in saluted her, his face gray with exhaustion. They're right behind us, Captain, he croaked as she handed him her own water skin. He gulped down a mouthful and poured the rest on his head. I swear by Apanel, there's no way they can be behind us, and they are anyway. Some of them are dropping like whipped dogs, but the rest are still on their feet, and it don't look like they plan on giving up any time soon. She swore and gathered the officers hers and Selene's, and together they goaded their weary troopers into another push. That set the pattern for succeeding days, and sometimes nights, as they retreated farther north, and deeper into Valdemar itself. Every step westward galled Caro, like spurs in her side. Never before had she hated to give up land so much. Always before it had been a matter of indifference. What mattered was the final outcome, not whether a few farmers were overrun and burned out, 
but this time was different. The farmers pressed everything Selene's forces needed on them as they passed, then abandoned their farms with unshed tears, making their eyes bright. She knew these farmers as people, however briefly they'd met, and it made her seethe with rage to see smoke rising in their rear and know what Ankar's troops were doing to the abandoned properties. Every time she took provisioning from another farmer and watched him drive off into the west with family and whatever he could transport piled up onto pitiful little wagons with his stock herded behind him, the rage grew. It's so damned unfair, she told herself, and I know that life's unfair, but these people never did anything to earn losses like these. She'd never felt quite so powerless to help before, and she had never hated any foe other than the Carsites with the fierce hatred she developed for Ankar. The fool drove his men as if they were mindless machines. She couldn't imagine why they weren't deserting in droves. Unless the mages were somehow controlling them, either directly or through fear. That might explain why the mages hadn't attacked Selene's army. They were too busy keeping Ankar's own troops in line. She was a good leader, and she couldn't hate men who were being forced the way these were. But she certainly could hate the kind of man who forced them. Or the kind of man who tortured for the sheer pleasure of it. Eldon told her what he'd done to Talia, and she'd felt need waking during the tale with that deep, gut-fire rage that was so hard to control. But Ankar wasn't within reach, so the blade subsided, though for once, Caro agreed with it. But most important of all, one of the other officers in Selene's army, who had once lived in Hardorn, told her what he had done to his father and his people, and why they had left. Caro had encountered tyrants before, but never one who so abused his powers as this one. The way he drove his men was a fair example of the way he treated his people as a whole. Worse than cattle, for a good farmer sees his cattle cared for. She finally called her company together one night, when they dared have a fire, and told them everything she'd learned, figuring that they should know what would happen to them if they ever fell into Ankar's hands. They listened, quietly, then Shallon made a single flat statement for all of them. He's an oathbreaker, she said, her mouth set in a grim line. And he's just lucky we haven't a mage with us, or I'd set the full outcasting on him. Carol looked from one fire-gilded face to another, and saw no sign of disagreement. Several, in fact, were nodding. The guild was full of people with disparate and sometimes mutually antagonistic beliefs the one thing every mercenary in the guild commonly held sacred, was an oath. They reserved terrible punishment for an oathbreaker in their own ranks. For rulers and priests, there was another form of retribution. The outcasting. Kings were bound by oaths to protect their lands and men, usually from the time they were old enough to swear to the pledges. And Ankar had broken his oaths, as surely and as dreadfully, as had the late, unmourned, King Rashgar of Rethwellen, the monarch Tarma and Kethri had helped to unseat. Carol learned that night that she was not alone in her hatred of Ankar, as her troops had heard more tales from the hard-drawn refugees, one and all, they came to share her cold rage. It gave them an extra edge they'd never had before. But rage was not enough, not when confronted with the desperate strength of Ankar's men. They were worn thin, by running alone, and when you added the steady losses, manpower that wasn't being replaced, you had another kind of drain on them. Of course, Ankar was losing an equal number of men in those encounters, but Ankar could afford to lose them. Selene's army couldn't. Caro tried an ambush at one point, splitting her forces on either side of a river, hoping to catch him with a good part of his men still in the water. But she'd discovered, only through the vigilance of the scouts, that he had outflanked her. He brought his foot in to surround the ambush party on his bank, and only years of experience had enabled her to get them out again. Those years of experience had taught her to always have an escape route, in this case, an unlikely one, the river itself. Profiting from her escape by water, she'd engineered a more controlled version of the same, by making sure the ambushers were all strong and experienced swimmers, 
with horses capable of pulling the trick off. Even so, the escape had been a narrow one, and their luck ran down from there. Every day meant a succession of tricks and guerrilla tactics, just to keep Ankar from closing with the entire force and finishing the job. With the heralds acting as links between them, they split their forces by day, pecking away at the edges of the massive army, and rejoined by night. The individual groups, some as small as Caro's original scout group, could dart in and out to whittle away at Ankar's more cumbersome foot. But to offset that mobility, they were a great deal more vulnerable. Quite a few of those little groups vanished, Harold and all, when Ankar's troops could surround or entrap them. Every loss meant far more to them than a comparable loss meant to Ankar, if, in fact, the losses meant anything to him at all, other than the drop in manpower. I can't believe this, she muttered to Eldon, as she shaded her eyes and stared at Ankar's army, a dark carpet of them covering the fields below her vantage point, trampling the fields of new grain into mud. They should have been ready to drop. They'd been marching at a steady pace all day, and any sane commander would have them making camp now. Yet here they were, pressing on though sunset painted the sky a bloody red. I thought I'd planned for everything, including the very worst possible case, but these people aren't human. No one can follow the pace we've set. You did, Eldon pointed out. You said it. She glared sideways at him. She had a headache from wearing her helmet all day and she was in no mood for quibbling. Semantics. We're on home ground. We have the advantage of local support and supply, and we know the territory. He doesn't have any of that. He shouldn't be able to keep up with us, much less attack every chance he gets, but he's doing it. And I'll be damned if I know how. Because he's willing to sacrifice everything to get you, or rather Selene, Eldon said flatly. Everything is expendable if he gets her. He's perfectly willing to burn out every man he has to achieve that single goal. She shook her head and pounded her fist on the tree trunk beside her in anger and frustration, gashing the bark with her armored gauntlet. That's insane! I can't predict what a madman is going to do next. How can I plan against someone like that? Eldon sighed. I don't know, Captain. Strategy was never anything I was good at. Then he smiled weakly. But you'll think of something, I'm sure. We all believe in you. That was cold comfort. They believe in me. Just what I needed to hear. Especially when she was exercising all of her ingenuity just to keep them alive a little bit longer. They'd lost track of Darren a while back, and not even the farseers could find him. In fact, other than the mind speakers, the Herald's powers had been frustrated or limited by Ankar's mages. There was some kind of shield over the army that the Farseers couldn't break through, and the Foreseers reported only too many possibilities. There were only three possibilities that made any difference to Caro that Darren was still on schedule, that Darren had been turned back by more of Ankar's forces or that Darren had run afoul of those same forces and was late. No other possibilities mattered. And right now, anyway, all that really mattered was staying alive. The question haunted her as the sky bolt stopped to salt a ford with flint shards after everyone else had passed it. The little fragments were heavy enough to stay where they were, without washing downstream. Small and sharp enough to lodge in hooves and slash boots and feet to ribbons. Be careful what you ask for, she quoted to herself. You might get it. I wanted Arncar to follow us. Now I can't shake him off our trail. When she'd consulted the Lord Marshal through the agency of Eldon and the Lord Marshal's Herald, he hadn't had any suggestions either. I feel like I'm letting them down, she thought grimly. As the last of the Flint Stewards returned to the saddle and the company moved out again, they think I'm going to pull something brilliant out of my sleeve and save everyone. Not even Ardana got herself into a situation like this one. And while he lost it, Laren was so lucky he'd fall into a cesspit and come up with a handful of gold. She looked back over her shoulder, checking for strays, 
although technically Shallon and Gayer were supposed to be in charge of that. It didn't look as if any of her people had dropped out of the march, though if they hadn't been mounting Shanaan breads, they would have been by now. Even the companions were beginning to look tired. So far, the only luck we've had was that Ankar hasn't used a mage since I took out the first one. She pushed her helm up and rubbed a spot on her forehead where it pressed uncomfortably. That might not have been luck, though. It might have been that Need was sheltering the whole army, and it might also have been that the mages Ankar has left are required to keep his own people disciplined. She wished she knew which it was, or even if it was a combination. The Skybolts caught up with the rear guard of Selene's troops and became the rear guard themselves. Shallon and Gayer sent back outriders, while the rest spread themselves along the rear, resting their horses by staying at the pace set by the foot in front of them. Carol hoped the outriders would bring back word that Ankar had camped soon. Those poor souls ahead of her looked as though they were on their last gasp of energy. All that work, to get the entire army together, and we're too small to do anything but run. He must outnumber us ten to one, and that's after losses. About the only advantage we have is the heralds. We're too large and without the proper training to use as a specialist force, and too small to actually take a stand against him. It was maddening, and soon enough they'd run up against the Iftel border, which would leave them with nowhere to go except into Valdemar. Was Darren back there behind them? If not, and she had to plan for the worst, if they retreated, would Selene be able to raise enough of the common people to make a difference against trained fighters? It could be done. What had happened to the Skybolts in Sajay was proof enough of that. But it was expensive in terms of casualties. The people had to be committed to it wholeheartedly. If only we could get him to divide his army up somehow and arrange things so that we could deal with each segment alone. A foot soldier in front of her stumbled and fell, saw Hellsbane practically on top of him and blanched, scrambling onto his feet and back to his place in the wavering lines. The mayor's behavior in battle had earned her the reputation of a man-killing horse, and no one but the Skybolds wanted to be within range of those teeth and hooves. What have we got ahead of us? I wonder if there's some way I can force him to commit too many of his people on too many fronts. Can we use the terrain somehow? No, that was a stupid idea. The only thing they had ahead of them was farmland and rolling hills. She pulled off her helm and hung it on the saddle bow and wiped the sweat out of her eyes. It didn't help. She'd never been so tired, not even when running from Carsite priestesses and Carsite demons. If only my riders weren't forced to stay with the foot. Then again... Maybe they weren't. If we take the skyboats and the cavalry and circle around behind them, I wonder if we could make them think we were reinforcements, make them think we were Darren's lot. Then she gave herself a mental kick for idiocy. How in hell can I think that? It would leave them without support, and even if he fell for it, that would get him going in the wrong direction. That won't work. We don't want him going south. We certainly don't want him going west. Every new idea seemed to have less of a chance of succeeding than the last, and none of them were going to work if they didn't get a chance to rest. I feel like a hunted stag, she thought. Then froze, as she realized that she wasn't far wrong with that image. She made a quick mental review of everything Ankar had done since that first encounter, and realized with a sinking heart that they had been doing exactly what he wanted them to do. Run. Run themselves into exhaustion. What's wrong? Eldon had ridden up beside her without her even noticing his arrival. I just realized we made a monumental mistake, she replied slowly, as her spine chilled. We all thought we were leading him. We haven't been. He's been herding us like stags being herded by beaters. She looked around for one of the scout lieutenants and spotted Shallon's blonde cap of hair. Shallon! She called sharply. The scout leader looked back and reined her horse around, 
sending him loping wearily toward them. I want you to send out scouts, west and east, she said, as soon as Shallon was within easy speaking distance. Send them out about a half day's ride, on the freshest horses. Have them take heralds. If what I think is out there really is, I want to know immediately. Shallon looked thoughtful for a moment, then blanched. We've been bracketed, she asked, as her horse stood listlessly, saving his energy. Caro nodded, and looked back over her shoulder, feeling as if she half expected the enemy to come into view. I think so. I couldn't figure out where his cavalry was, and I just about decided he didn't have any. But if I had his resources, why would I field only foot fighters with less than a company of cavalry? Now I think I know where he sent them, to bracket us in either the east or the west. I'd bet east, but I want you to check inside Valdemar just to be sure. In all the confusion caused by evacuation, he could have slipped someone in. Astera, help us. If you're right, Eldon said grimly, as Shallon rode off to pick her scouts and send them on their way. He too looked back over his shoulder with a grimace. He'll have us where we plan to have him, pinned between him and the Ifdel border. I know, she replied watching as two small groups of skybolts broke off from the main body and rode off east and west. Believe me, I know. I'd give my arm to know where Darren is right now, and my leg to have him close enough to help. We must be halfway to Iftel by now. Gods, I don't know how much more of this dying territory there is. Darren flexed cramped fingers wiping the nervous sweat from his face with his sleeve, and stared up at the sun. He reined his gelding in a little to drop back beside one of the few unarmored riders in the group. How far past the Valdemar border would you say we are? He asked young Quentin, who frowned a little, and unfocused his eyes. Last thing I want is for Ancar's toadies to scent us. Far enough, the maid replied after a moment. We're out of range of whatever it is in Valdemar and Ankar's mages are too busy keeping the troops under control to try looking for us. That's devilish clever of him, keeping his mages just this side of the border. I don't know what that guardian is, my lord, but it's cursed literal-minded. Your magic can cross the border all you like, so long as you don't. And I expect that if you didn't ever do anything magical, once you were inside, it'd leave you alone. I suspect you're right. Darren replied. Quentin's a good lad. Wish I knew how Carol managed to recruit him. And I'm damned glad you went looking for us on your way back to your winter quarters. If we'd followed along the short route, we'd have lost our mages too. I didn't want to lead them in the first place, my lord, Quentin said absently. Let the guards witness it. I'd have stayed if I could. It only seemed right to track you down and warn you and maybe come with you if you figured a way around the magic problem. His gentle little mare glided along beside Darren's tall hunter, the only horse he'd ever seen besides his own that could trot without jolting a rider. Darren kept silent, wrestling with the problem of how to make up the days lost in crossing over to Hardorn, sneaking through the passes and hoping the car sites would choose to ignore this little invasion of their borders. He had double his usual complement of mages to cloak their movements. But who knew what the Carsite priests could and could not do? Perhaps they'd had their own troubles to occupy them. Since the defeat of the Prophet, there had been no more trouble from Kars, only rumors that the temple was engaging in a war of intrigue within itself, and more rumors that the chief priest of the Sun Lord was being challenged for his place by a woman. That was heresy enough, but further rumor had it that this woman affected the robes and false beard of a man, and styled herself true-born son of the sun. If even half those rumors were true, small wonder Kars paid no attention to the army of her old enemy when it was plainly going elsewhere. But once across the border into Hardorn, Darren had been tempted to turn right around and take his chances with Valdemar, and this mysterious guardian that drove mages mad. 
for from the border to a distance of three leagues within Hardorn, the land was blighted and empty. Bad enough that entire villages lay empty and abandoned. Worse came when his men poked cautiously through the tumbled-down buildings. The places had been looted, then demolished. But in the wreckage, Darren's men found the remains of women and children, and only women and children, and only those younger than three, and, presumably, older than thirty. Darren had thoughts at first that it might have been the work of bandits, but then they had encountered another village, smaller than the first, that had fared the same. Then another, and another. After the fourth such discovery, Darren forbade his men to even go near the places. They had no priest with them, but the mages, Quentin in particular, had felt an odd uneasiness there, and the healers had refused, in a hysterical body, to set foot inside the perimeters. And the land itself looked drained and ill. The rank weeds that had taken over the fields were pale, with thin, weak stems. The leaves of the trees were discolored. The only birds to be seen were an occasional crow. And so far, Darren hadn't spotted so much as a rabbit moving. It had been getting worse since the first village, and now the countryside looked to his eyes like a beautiful woman, lying ravaged by plague. He couldn't imagine how his men could bear it. Many of them were of farm stock and intended to retire to little pension farms of their own, and to see good land like this must be making them ill. What do you think happened here? He asked Quentin, as they crossed a muddy, rust-colored stream. Is it safe to be riding on this land, do you think? It's safe enough, my lord, Quentin said, but only after the mage gave him a peculiar look. Why do you ask? Darren looked around at the withered limbs of the trees, at the yellow grass, at the diseased cankers spotting the leaves, and shuddered. Because the place looks poisoned, that's why. What happened at the villages was easy enough to read. That bastard conscripted the men, took the useful women and little ones, and slaughtered the rest as an example. But I don't understand this, and I don't see how the men can accept it as easily as they do. Quentin shook his head in wonder. My lord, they don't see what you see. To them it looks perfectly ordinary, except that there's not much in the way of birds and beasts. He looked pointedly about them at the men marching calmly up the road in front of them, and tilted his shaggy, dust-dulled head to one side, as if waiting for a response. Darren cast a sharp glance at him, but the young mage's expression was entirely sober. A glamour? An illusion? Again the mage shook his head, but this time he stared into Darren's face searchingly before replying. I don't think so, my lord. Is there mage blood in your family? Some, not much, he said after a moment of thought. Of course, grandmother's family's been sprouting healers every so often, and mother's line was supposed to be some kind of earth priestess. Ah, Quentin said in satisfaction. That would be it. You have the earth sense. Many folk with the blood of the old earth priestesses in them have it. What you're seeing is the land revealed to you by the earth sense. You see what lies under the surface everyone else sees with his outer eyes. This land is sick. There's been blood magic practiced here. Too much of it for the land to absorb without harm. That was the real horror back at those villages. It wasn't just the slaughter itself. It's that it was done to invoke the powers of blood magic and death magic. Darren remembered all the rumors he'd heard about Ankar, and suddenly they began making sense. Blood magic, to control the minds of the ones he took, he asked shrewdly. Blood magic, to create a reservoir of power he can feed off. And Quentin's eyes widened. Blood magic, so that the land keeps him healthy and young, at its own expense. There's not one he-born and ten that would know that, the mage whispered, 
keep it to yourself, my lord. There's some that would say that knowing is a short step away from wanting. I don't hold by that, but even the mage schools have their fanatics. He resumed his normal tone. Probably, my lord, and it's more than the land can bear. That's why it looks sick to you. Trust your earth sense, my lord. If you learn to use it, it'll tell you more than just this. It was Darren's turn to shake his head. The land cried out to him in a way, and he couldn't help it, any more than he could bring back those poor slaughtered innocents. He wanted to beg its pardon for not healing it, to beg theirs for not being there. It was foolish, but it was very real. He understood the heralds of Valdemar far better than his brother did. He understood how it was to care for people, even if those people were not bound to you personally in any way. Ferrum would die for his people, but not those of Valdemar. He would feel badly about the slaughters here, but he would not feel them personally the way Darren did. And he also understood duty and pledges. Right now, all I care about is whether this land is safe to travel through, which you say it is, and whether or not Anka has any mages likely to detect us here. We're working to prevent that, my lord, Quentin replied dryly. And... He looked up, sharply. What is it? Darren said, reining in his horse as Quentin's mount stopped dead. The mage raised one hand to his forehead, his eyes focusing elsewhere. He looked for all the world as if he was listening to something. Quentin, Darren persisted. Quentin? The mage's eyes refocused on him. Ankar has a reserve force just ahead, he said vaguely. Several mages and three companies of cavalry and... Darren, my lord. They're mostly from here, this barren zone. Controlled, then. There's no other way he could make farmers into cavalry that quickly. He caught the attention of his officers who halted the march. Quentin, how far ahead is just ahead? Half a day's march, maybe less, not much less. Quentin didn't seem to notice Darren's sigh of relief. What are they doing there? He persisted. We haven't seen a sign of Ankar's army. What are reserves doing out here? I don't... They're... I need my bowl. Without warning, the mage scrambled off his mare's back to dig into her packs. He emerged with a completely black bowl, shiny, made of black glass or something very like it. He poured water from his own water skin into the bottom of it, sat right down in the dust of the road, and stared into it. Darren had been around enough mages to know when to keep his mouth shut. He waited, patiently, in sunlight too thin to even warm him. The army waited, just as patiently, glad for a chance to sit by the roadside and rest. Darren watched his men sprawling ungracefully against their packs, and wished he hadn't had to push them so hard. They'd had a lot of time to make up once they'd gotten down out of the hills. He had been weary at the end of the day, and he was riding. He hated to think what the foot soldiers felt like. They're waiting, Quentin said in a thin, disinterested voice, an eerie echo of his own thoughts. They are half of the claw that will capture Selene and crush Valdemar. What? Darren snapped, startled. Quentin looked up, blinking, then picked up the bowl and spilled the water out into the dust. Ankar has these reserves out here, pacing him, waiting for when he has Selene's forces worn down enough to trap, the mage said in a more normal tone of voice. Then he'll have this lot sweep in from the side and above while he cuts his main force in from below. I don't think so, Darren replied in a kind of grim satisfaction at finally having something to fight. Well, that's not all, my lord, Quentin added as he got up, shook the dust from his robes and stowed his bowl carefully away. It's who these reserves are, or rather where they're from. Like I said before, 
here, tied into obedience by the blood of their own kin. Now, you have the earth sense. You could tell me which mage is controlling them, because the earth hereabouts would tell you. It hates him, and it's bound to him, and you'll see him as it sees him. And what will happen when you break him? Darren asked, leaning forward in his saddle and clutching the pommel with one hand. How do I see these things anyway? What do you need to teach me, and have we the time to spare? Quentin paused to remount, and turned to look back at Darren only when firmly in his seat. You have the earth sense, Quentin repeated. It's a matter of instinct rather than learning. Break the controlling mage and you not only free the victims, but it's altogether possible the earth hereabouts would rise up in revolt. And it would listen to you. Follow some of your directions if you made them simple enough. It would, Quentin nodded. Darren thought about those heaps of pitiful bones and rags, looked around him at the dying land, and thought of Caro and Selene's army and pledges. And just maybe a god somewhere had just gifted him with the chance to satisfy all of them. Quentin, you're in charge of the magic folk. Get your mages. Find out everything you can and keep us cloaked. Darren turned his horse and rode off in search of the scouts, before he had a chance to hear Quentin's eager ascent. All right, Ancal, you bastard, he couldn't help thinking, with a kind of fierce exultation. I am about to visit a little retribution on you and yours. Ancar's reserves were pathetically unaware of any danger, but after all they were deep inside their own territory, and had no reason to suspect any threat. Darren himself went out with the scouts to the river valley where they camped, to get a good look at the enemy, and at the way they were conducting themselves. What he saw fit in very well with Quentin's theory of mind control. Only about a quarter of the men down there were moving about or acting in any kind of a normal fashion. The rest might as well have been puppets. In fact, watching them was rather disturbing. They moved listlessly when they moved at all, and none of them were idle. Yet they wasted no time on their chores, picking up one task, carrying it to the end, picking up another, and all without exchanging a single word with anyone, or taking a single step out of the way. Nothing was cooked, except at the camps of the officers. A small group of men handed out the tasteless ration bread Rethwell and no longer used, because of complaints from the men. These fighters took the bread, ate it methodically, and went back to their chores. By nightfall, the camp was utterly quiet. No socializing around campfires, no idle games of chance. Nothing. The men simply rolled up in their blankets and went to sleep, except for the officers and mages who had tents and were presumably doing things inside them. It was an entirely unnerving sight to someone who knew what a camp should look like and sound like because of the complete unnaturalness of it, although Darren had to admit to himself that there were times when he'd wished his men would. He stopped the thought before he could complete it, chillingly aware of how close he'd come to thinking that he'd wanted his men to be like this. Was that what those mages meant, when they said it was a short step from knowing to wanting? Horrible thought. He closed his eyes on the too quiet camp below him for a moment, then opened them. No he deliberately decided. I've never wanted that. It's worse than slavery. At least a slave has his own thoughts. These poor creatures don't even have that much. It's as bad to destroy or enslave a mind as it is to kill a body. Maybe worse, if the mind is aware of what has happened to it. The scout tugged at his sleeve, and he crawled away with the rest of them, avoiding the slack-jawed perimeter guard. They made it back to the rest of his troops without further incident, and he and his officers spent the hours until midnight, charting the next day's course. Dawn of the next day saw the Rethwellen troops poised just above the camp. It had been impossible to keep the movement of so large a group secret, but by splitting his troops in two and cutting off Ankar's fighters from their easy escape by river, Darren had forced Ankar's reserves to meet him instead of running to join the larger force, 
or escaping into the interior of Hardorn. Darren waited at the command post with Quentin, the other mages, and his under-officers. Far from being even as comfortable as a tent, the site basically had only two things to recommend it, the unobstructed view and a very tall shade tree. Can you tell who he is yet? Quentin asked in an undertone as the officers scattered off to take their places with their men. Darren shook his head. There was a kind of sink of bad feeling, a little to the right of center, but no one mage stood out. They were assuming that Ankar's mages were too strong for any single one of Darren's mages to take. They would have to wait for their one best opportunity and all hit him at once in order to break him. One of Darren's mages was effectively out of the picture. He was preventing the enemy from calling for help, at least magically, and that was all he was good for. They'd left him in trance in the healer's tent, and there he would stay even after this was over, recovering. Or not. There was always the possibility he might die, either from exhausting himself or being drained or killed by the enemy mages. And if Darren's force lost, he would almost certainly die. Mages were harder to control than captured fighters. The enemy usually did not even bother to try. Darren gave the signal to advance. No point in a charge. Mind-controlled men would not be unnerved by a charge or a battle cry. They'd simply fight until they dropped, and others took their places. Darren had given his officers careful instructions. Keep the men in formation. No hero tactics. Fight as carefully as if it was all a drill. The one advantage to fighting mind-controlled men was that they were slower. It was the difference between knowing what to do and being told what to do, between learned reflex and something that hasn't been absorbed bone-deep yet. The battle was, as a result, curiously, grimly dull. No flag-waving, no shouts, except for exclamations of pain, no charges. The only sounds being those calls and the clash of weapons the cries of horses, the scuffling of hundreds of feet and hooves. The men might as well have been those little counters he and Carol used to practice maneuvers with. Except for the blood, the wounded, the fallen. Those made it real, and made the fighting itself all the more unreal. Darren concentrated on the mages, clustered near the officer's command post, and visible because of the dull colors of their robes which were bright compared with the brown and buff leathers of the fighters and officers. But the more he concentrated, the less he seemed to see. He started to get angry and frustrated. My people are dying down there. But then he stopped himself before he stormed off to harangue Quentin. This is my problem, not his. I should be able to figure it out. Quentin said this earth sense works like instinct he thought, finally. So maybe if I don't concentrate. I used to wonder what good on earth those meditation exercises Tama insisted we both learn would do me. I thought if there was anything more useless, I could almost hear her now. Surprise, youngling. Nothing's ever wasted. He closed his eyes and dredged the exercise out of deepest memory. It wasn't as hard as he thought it was going to be, for in moments he was relaxed. He centered himself in the earth beneath his feet, as Tarma had taught him, and when he felt as if he was truly an extension of it, opened his eyes. And nearly choked! He'd never, ever seen anything like this before. And if it hadn't been that he felt fine, and had shared the same rations as everyone else this morning, he'd have suspected sickness or drugs superimposed over the fighting the battlefield was divided into fields of glowing healthy green and dull dead leprous white with edges of scarlet and vermilion where they met outside the area of fighting the landscape was the same as it had been all the way north sickly greens poisoned yellows except for one spot behind the lines in the ranks of the mages and commanders one spot of black Aurid by angry red. Get Quentin, he told his aide. We've got them. Eleven of the twelve mages materialized beside him so quickly 
he suspected they'd conjured themselves there. Where is he? Quentin said, then shook his head as Darren started to open his mouth to explain that he couldn't tell him. Never mind, I know. I am being stupid. Hardly would... A dark-haired, plump girl reached up and touched both of his temples before he could say or do anything. Got him, Quentin, she said in satisfaction. If you want to feed through me, I'm not much use for anything else right now. What are you going to do? Darren asked anxiously. I mean, I don't want you to go blasting at him and hit our people. Not a chance. Caro likes things subtle. We figured out last night that we get the same effect by killing or wounding him physically. He'll still lose his hold on the magic and on the minds he's controlling. So I'm going to give them the way to identify him, Hadley said. Quentin will bow cast a far-seeing spell, and Jem and Merkin will find a weapon to hit him with, while the rest distract him and keep his defenses all facing forward. Darren turned. Quentin was already kneeling on the ground with his bowl of water in front of him but this time there was a picture forming in it that even he could see. Hadley and two others knelt beside him, and Darren found that he could still see over their heads. What he saw was the backs of several people in robes, with coruscating colors and strange shapes appearing just beyond them. His eyes went to one in a dull blue robe, and he saw, faintly, the same overlay of black and scarlet auras he'd seen before. That's him, Hadley said, the one in the blue, with the copper belt and the serpent glyph on his sleeve. Darren, Quentin called, without taking his attention from the bowl. When we strike him, you'll feel it in the earth. There's going to be a moment of recoil, and then a hesitation. That is when you need to concentrate on what exactly you want to happen. There's a lot of power there. Think of it as a flash flood about to roll down the river. Once you get it started, you won't be able to get it to stop or even change directions. If you don't know what to do, don't think of anything. Darren refrained from making a sarcastic answer. In the bowl, a light ornamental dagger was elevating from a table behind the mages. Before he had a chance to ask what that meant, the thing snapped forward as if it had been thrown and buried itself to the hilt in Blue Robe's back. Darren had been in an earthquake once. The feeling was similar. For a moment, the earth seemed to drop out beneath him, and he was left hanging in space with a sense that something huge and ponderous was poised over him like a wave, waiting to break. Belatedly, he recalled Quentin's orders and realized the impossibility of not thinking anything. Make it simple. Dear gods, it's going to let go and I don't know what to tell it. Make it simple. Put everything back the way it was. The wave broke. He swayed and started to fall when his aide caught him, and suddenly there was noise out on the battlefield. The sound of several thousand enraged, half-mad men turning on their officers and tearing them to pieces. 24. Bodies pressed in on all sides of her. God, blessed Agnera. I got them into this. They trust me to get them out of it. How do I tell them that I can't? The camp was unusually silent. Somewhere on the Valdemar side, Selene too was breaking the bad news to her troops. The regulars, that is. The heralds already knew about it, of course. Carol wanted to look away from all those eyes staring at her with perfect confidence, to gaze up at the sky or down at the ground, anywhere but back at them. They depended on me, and I fouled up. Now what do I say? I'm sorry? Instead, she gazed directly back at them all, trying to meet each pair of eyes before she spoke to them. I haven't got any good news, she told them, finally. Ankar's fighters have managed to force us east enough for his southernmost troops to divide and get in west of us. They're doing that now, and we haven't been able to stop them. He's had cavalry to the east in his own lands that has probably moved in north as well. We've been bracketed, and now we're surrounded. 
She waited for a moment for that to sink in, then continued, rubbing the back of her neck. They outnumber us by a goodly amount. Selene's troops tried this morning to prevent the southern forces from coming west, but there were too many for them, and the farmers just aren't a match for trained fighters, not in pitched battles. It looks like the big confrontation is coming tomorrow. He has us right where he wants us, and no getting around it. She listened to them breathe for a moment. Where's Lord Durin? asked a voice from the rear. Carol looked up, above the heads of those nearest her, and attempted to find the questioner. We lost track of him, about the time he was going to come across over into the Valdemar side of the comb, somewhere in the mountains. We don't know what happened to him. There's been no word of him coming up through Valdemar like he was supposed to. He could be on the way. He could have been turned back. He could have been defeated by Ankar down in the mountains. We just don't know. So we can't count on him being here. Much less being here in time. That's the way ballads end, not real battles. They'd been in trouble before, but never this badly and never while under her command. The weight of responsibility made her ache. Now here's what we can do, she continued. We're mounted, and we're the best hit-and-hide specialists in the business. We can break out, leave this mess behind, and head back down home. There isn't a soul outside Valdemar that would blame us for doing that. We're not in this for glory, or for patriotism, or because we're fanatics. She looked around again, and saw heads nodding. We're in this for the money, pure and simply. And our guild charter and our contracts allows for this sort of thing. Ankar threw the guild out. We know he isn't going to accept a code surrender from us. Probably what he'd do if we tried is kill us out of hand. He might even stick to killing the officers only, and mind controlling you troops. I don't think I have to go any further into that. She noticed one or two nearest her shuddering at the idea, and nodded to herself. As I said, the code and the charter allow for that. We can break out and go home. This is a no-win, hopeless situation. However, we won't be able to take any wounded with us, and anyone who goes down on the way out stays behind. My guess is we'll lose about half of our troops, the ones that are left, getting out. It's not going to be easy. But staying here means worse odds, so far as I can tell. What are the heralds doing? asked one of the lieutenants. They're mounted. They're as good as we are, most of them. Good question, Carol replied. They're going to break Selene out, if they can. It's by no means certain. Ankar wants her hide, and if he finds out they're breaking her loose... He'll bring everything to bear that he has. We can use that as a diversion, of course, which makes our chances better. Then what? asked the same voice as before. Then they're going to turn back and rejoin the fight, she replied, as neutrally as she could, all but an escort force to get Selene to safe ground. A murmur of surprise and admiration rose from the troopers. Some of the heralds, Eldon, for instance, had made themselves very popular. Others, like the one Eldon had replaced, were considered nuisances. But the Skybolts could not help but admire anyone with the kind of guts it took to break free of a suicide situation, then turn and go back into it. That has little or nothing to do with us, Carol reminded them forcefully. We are mercenaries. They aren't. They have oaths to fulfill, and duties that they won't renege on. We're in this for pay. Now, the Skyboats have never been an ordinary company, and I've never been an ordinary captain. That's why I've called you all here. I'm not going to make a decision like this one alone, or even with my officers. Do we try to go, or do we stay? And do I stay your captain... The shouts of disapproval that met that question made her feel terribly self-conscious. All right, she bellowed at last, 
holding up her hands for silence. All right. If you want me that badly, you've got me. But the other question. Break out, or stay and do what we can. You know the drill. Dark-colored pebble for go, light or white for stay, and no maybe-colored rocks either. I don't want any maybes on this one. Gaia will collect your votes. She turned and sat down, waiting for the results of the vote, keeping her mind tightly sealed against their thoughts. She didn't want to know what they were thinking, and she didn't want to influence it either. She tried not to think of anything, really. As Geyer moved out with the basket into the massed fighters, someone else called out a question. What about you? I'll be going with you, since you'll have me, she said. And I'll stay with you as far as Bolthaven. I intend to call another vote then, and see if you still want me when this is over. I have my responsibilities, as much as these heralds have, and my oaths have been made to you. I don't intend to break them. She heard the murmurs, saw the looks, and knew what they were thinking as well as if she had opened her mind to them. They all knew about Eldon. Quite a few of them knew about their first meeting ten years ago. They knew what she would be sacrificing by leading them if they voted to break out. Or at least, they thought they did. She ignored the murmurs and kept her expression schooled into serenity. I made my oaths. I have my responsibilities. He knows that. It doesn't hurt any less, but there's no choice. Vows are made to be kept, and he would be the first one to agree. Finally, Geyer brought the basket around to her, and she steeled herself against the inevitable. How could they not vote to save themselves? Only a fool would stay here and die. So I'm a fool. But it isn't just Eldon. True, the odds were only fifty-fifty that any of them would make it out in the clear, and those weren't good odds. But when had a youngster ever thought he couldn't beat the odds? Then Geyer turned the basket upside down on the table. And she felt her mouth dropping open in shock. A pile, a tiny mountain of white. Pale sandstone pebbles trickled down off the top with a gentle clicking sound. She spread the pebbles out on the table with a shaking hand. No dark pebbles. None at all. They'd stay, fighting beside the Valdemar folk. No dissenting votes. She looked up at them, searched each face she could see, and found nothing there but determination. You're mad, she said flatly. You're all of you mad. We haven't a chance if we stay. Shallon stood up, awkwardly, as if she'd been appointed as spokesperson for the entire company. We don't think so, begging your pardon, Captain. Sides, what's the odds of a merc living long enough to collect his pension from the guild, eh? We all got to talking about this last night. General feeling is, these people here deserve help. Merck's likely to go down any time, but if we got a choice in going down, I'd rather do it for somebody that deserves a hand than in fighting for some pig merchant working out a fight over territory with some other hog and doing it with my sword and my life. There was a murmur of agreement from the rest, and an I that or two from the veterans old enough in service to remember Ardana and the Sajay debacle. Caro rose slowly to her feet and to Shallon's immense surprise, embraced her. She kept one arm around her old friend as she scanned their faces again, this time with her eyes burning with the effort of holding back tears. You're all fools. Thank the gods, she said huskily. Every one of you. As much fools as me. If you'd voted me out, I'd have stayed myself. All right, Skybolts, we stay. And tomorrow we show Ankar what it means to take on the finest company in the guild. The cheers could probably have been heard in Haven. And no one would ever guess, she thought, with a mixture of pride and sorrow, that they're cheering their own deaths. Poor, brave fools. This will probably be our last battle. It's ten to one it'll be mine. 
May the gods help us all. Darren stared into the stranger's flat, dead eyes and asked in frustration, So what am I supposed to do with you? The tent was hot and felt stuffy, yet every time Darren looked at this man, he got a chill down the back of his neck. Better dead. He'd have been better off dead, poor bastard. Lead us, my lord, replied the nameless man who until a year ago had been a simple farmer, with no cares of who ruled and who did not. Lead us. We got nothing now. Our families is dead, or as good as. Our homes is gone. Our fields is weeds and wild things. Lead us. Thrice dead horned, Darren muttered under his breath. Lead them, he says. Farmers on horseback. Whatever cavalry skills they had vanished when the mage controlling them died. And here I am with a horde of undisciplined, half-mad farmers, with no memory of what to do with swords and lances. And yet, they were half-mad, and had nothing to lose. Ankar had stolen everything from them, including their names, for none of them remembered exactly who he was. All they had left were the memories of what had been done to them and to their loved ones, memories so hedged about in rage that nothing the mages could do would erase them. And so those memories had been blocked off, until Darren had given the fateful, desperate command to the earth, put everything back the way it was. Some things, of course, were impossible. The dead could not be brought back to life, nor memories that had been destroyed be regained. But the troops' minds had been given back to them, and the land was already beginning to heal, free of Ankar's bondage. Professionals are predictable, ran one of Tarma's proverbs, but the world is full of amateurs. So long as he kept his troops out of their way, where was the harm in taking these men with him and unleashing them on Ankar's forces? Let me think about this, he temporized. I'm not sure I have the right to lead you. You're not my people, and, frankly, you may not like my orders. If I don't have any real hold over you, you could decide to strike out on your own, and then where would my plans be? But, the man began, when he was interrupted by the arrival of Quentin. The mage was excited, his red hair going in all directions, and he made matters worse by running his hand through it every few moments. My lord, we intercepted a mage message from Ankar's commander a few moments ago, he said. We... Then he noticed the nameless man sitting there and shut his mouth with a snap. If you'll excuse me, Darren said to the man, who, with the intractable stubbornness of farmers everywhere, opened his mouth to resume his argument, or voice a protest at the interruption. I promise I'll come back to you with an answer but I suspect that what this man has to say will make up my mind, one way or another. Before the farmer could say another word, Darren took Quentin's elbow and led him out of the tent, to a few paces away where they couldn't be overheard. Now, what was this message? he asked, and is there any chance that Ankar's people could know it was you that got it, and not his own mages? Hildre, Quentin said in satisfaction. She's the best there is at identifying and counterfeiting mage auras. Unfortunately for her, that's about all she can do, which means she's useless outside of a group. But for working within a group, she's priceless. The commander inside Valdemar sent a conventional messenger to the mages on the border, and they sent the message on here. And trust me, Hildra has them convinced it went to the right person. They're attacking Selene at dawn, my lord. He sent half of his foot around to the west, and he expects the cavalry to come in on the east and north. Caro and the Skybolts are in the middle of that. We have to do something. Darren took a deep breath and stared off at a tree, reviewing all his plans and his capabilities. My foot won't make it before the fight's over. There's no way they can make a march that's half a day's ride away in less than a day. And even if we started now, they'd be tired. Unless... Thank you, Quentin, he said, his plan set. 
We'll do something all right. With luck, we'll even get there in time. Tell the majors to get packed up. We'll be on the march in a candle mark. He returned to his tent, and as he had expected, the nameless spokesman for the farmers turned fighters was still there. Malor, the man said, getting to his feet, his chest puffed out belligerently. How many spare horses have you? Darren demanded. And can your horses carry double? Are they in any shape for a forced march? The man looked bewildered by Darren's sudden demands. We had twice as many horses as men, my lord, he replied. Speg we still got that many, and a lot fewer men, aye. They be good for a forced march and go double all right. Good, Darren replied. He looked the man in the eyes. I won't lead you, sir, but I will put you in a position to strike back at Ankar. Here's what we'll do. Enemy to the west. Enemy to the south. Caro stood beside Selene on the gentle hill they claimed as the spot for their stand, looked out over the sea of Ankar's men, and swore under her breath. Selene shook her head. It isn't ever yet, Captain, she replied as she fitted her helm over her head. In fact, it isn't even begun. Well, my lady, Caro replied as she tapped her own helm to be sure her tightly coiled braids were cushioning it properly. I won't say it's finished, but damn if I like the look of the odds. Darren may yet arrive, the queen pointed out, fitting her foot into the stirrup and mounting. And the rivers may flow backward, the moon rise in the west and Ankar find a religious vocation. Caro said nothing, though, as she swung herself up into her own saddle. With your permission, my lady, I'm off. You know the plan, such as it is. We'll try and cut a path for you and the heralds heading west. No, the queen replied stubbornly. Not yet. Not while there's still a chance we can win this. Win! Caro snorted. We can't even hold them back. The scouts say there's a force of cavalry coming in from the east. If we go head to head with them, they'll win. Their horses are fresher and there's more of them. The one chance we have to get you out is... Captain! One of the scouts came riding up, her horse lathered. Captain! Cavalry coming in, now! But they're riding double, and not all of them are wearing Ankar's colors. Caro swore and turned to Selene. My lady, no more arguments, or I'll have the healers knock you out and strap you to your companion's back with my own hands. No matter what you think, you're important to Valdemar and... Caro caught lightning-fast movement out of the corner of her eye and turned with an exclamation of recognition and astonishment. A small gray shape came hurtling through the masked enemy, then through the Valdemar cavalry, frightening horses and making them rear and dance, startling companions and making them snort and raise their heads. It headed straight for Caro and flung itself through the air in a tremendous leap, landing in the arms she reflexively held out to catch it one of Geyer's messenger hounds. More importantly, it was the odd-looking gray brindle Geyer had left with Darren. Dooley! Geyer hurled himself out of his saddle and stumbled toward them. The dog wriggled with happiness, its tail beating against Caro's side like a drumstick, and it finally squirmed out of her grasp to launch itself for Geyer and his lumps of suet. Though not before Caro had managed to get the message cylinder off his collar, she opened it and took out the slip of paper with shaking hands. We're on the way, with friends, it read. Great, blessed Agnara on a polka dot mule, she breathed. By the seven rings of Gaborah and the rock of Taylor, someone put that bastard up for sainthood. He's pulled off a friggin' miracle. By now she was shouting and everyone was staring at her, except for Geyer, who was crooning to his exhausted little dog. She turned to Selene, who had pushed her faceplate up and was looking at her as if she had gone mad, alarmed and a little fearful. That is an Ankar's cavalry coming in from the west, my lady, she exulted, trying very hard to keep her grin from wrapping around the back of her head and splitting it in two. At least it is an Ankar's cavalry now. It's Darren. And he turned him. 
I don't know how, but the bastard turned them. That must be why they're riding double. That's Darren's foot up behind the cavalry riders. I know exactly what he's doing. This is a trick we played with tokens back when we were studying together. He'll have the cavalry come in and drop his infantry in on the southern and eastern flanks to support us. Then he'll bring the cavalry in behind Ankar's foot, probably on the west. Selene's eyes widened. We'll have Ankar caught in the same trap he thought he had us in. Caro nodded and pulled her visor down. That's it, milady. That dog isn't that much faster than a horse. He'll be in place any moment. Captain! Shallon shouted, and Caro turned to see where she was pointing. Fireworks. Great splashes of color. Fire flowers against the blue, rising from three places. And Caro knew instantly why. Because it was a trick the Skybolts had used before, when their mages were too exhausted or too busy to send signals. The mages were probably unable to approach the border, much less cross it. But physical fireworks worked just fine and didn't care about any guardians, magic or otherwise. Southeast, due south, and southwest. The fiery fountain signaled Darren's attack on three fronts, and already there was confusion, some milling around, among the fighters within Caro's range of vision. The rest of the sky bolts knew what that meant and let out a whoop of joy. Caro caught Geyer's attention and gave him a hand signal. He dropped the dog, sent it back to the healer's tent with a single command, and pulled his horn around from behind his back. Prepare to charge, rang out clear and sweet, against the growing noise from Ankar's troops. Selene's buglers picked it up, and echoed the command up and down the line. Caro waited a moment more, as the skybolts readied themselves. A skirmish charge was not like a regulation charge, and she blessed the gods that her people in Selenes had ample opportunities to perfect their coordination these past few weeks, for this was the engagement that would count. The Skybolts would be in first, charging the enemy line, firing as they came, only to peel off to right and left, continuing along the line, firing until they ran out of arrows or line, and coming back in a wide arc. Behind them would be the regular cavalry, lances set, Heavy cavalry first, to hit the lines and hopefully break through, while they were still recovering from the hail of arrows. Then the light cavalry to come up through the breach, made by the heavy cavalry. Then the skybolts would return, this time arcing their arrows high, to hit behind the line of fighting, harass those enemy fighters still on their feet in the front lines, and keep the enemy from bringing foot around to engulf the cavalry. At that point it would probably get to steel, and at that point Caro herself would join the affray. The fight was still uneven, but now they had a chance. Don't go chasing any shadow lovers, you, said a voice in her mind. I don't share with anyone. She looked behind her. Eldin's companion Ratha shouldered Shallan's mare aside so that he could take her place. Shallan shrugged, grinned, then made a mocking bow and backed her mare away. You'll have to keep up with me if you want a chance to enforce that, she replied. I don't wait for anyone. Then what are you waiting for now? Nothing. She lifted her hand and signaled Geyer, who blew the charge, and behind her, at the healer's tent, she heard the explosions of their own fireworks. Evidently someone had thought quickly enough to set off their own return signal. Whoever it was, she blessed him. The first line of archers bore down on the lines, followed by Selene's heavy cavalry, and the skybolt's light mixed with Harold's and Selene's light. Dust rose in a blanket from beneath their horses' hooves, making a yellow haze over the battlefield, and making it hard to see anything. Caro counted under her breath, waiting for the archers to reappear. At the count of one hundred, they came charging up out of the cloud, turned their horses and prepared to charge again. Caro strung her bow, made sure the quiver at her saddle bow was full, and spurred her horse to join them just as they made the turn. She lost Eldon immediately as he vanished in the chaos. She trusted to Hellsbane's sure feet to keep them from going down. They sent arrows up over the solid dam of milling bodies and hoped they wouldn't hit anything friendly. 
Then it was time for Sword Edge, as a running line of foot hit them from either side with a shock. Caro cut down at a pikeman, trying to hook her out of her saddle. Hellsbane reared and bashed in the skull of another as he hooked her neighbor, a Valdemar regular. A sword came out of nowhere, and she parried it, then kicked its owner in the teeth. Five men converged on her. She got two, and Hellsbane got one. But one got underneath her, because the melee was so thick the mare couldn't maneuver. Caro saw it coming the same move that had gotten one of Hellsbane's predecessors, and she could do nothing to stop it. The mare screamed as the sword sought her heart, then collapsed as the blade found it. Carol launched herself out of the saddle as the horse buckled under her, rolled under another set of hooves, and came up looking for anything with four legs and no rider. There, a flash of something pale, yellow, no saddle, but that had never mattered to her. Must be one of ours. A couple of the scouts ride bareback. The horse seemed to sense her need. It plunged directly toward her, trampling fighters in its way, and stood still long enough for her to seize a handful of mane and drag herself up onto its back. And just in time. Darren stuffed the message into the cylinder, and Quentin sent the skinny little dog Caro's lieutenant had left with them off across the field. He could hardly believe his eyes when he saw how fast the beast moved. Like a streak of gray lightning. I hope to hell she gets that, he thought. Quentin said one of the mages was going to put directions in the dog's head. Never mind. Either she gets it or she doesn't. Are you ready? He asked the putative leader of the nameless men. The man nodded curtly. Good luck to you then. Tisn't luck we be looking for the man replied, and rode out to the head of his troops. Darren shuddered. He hadn't liked what he'd seen in the man's eyes. There's someone who is not coming back, and doesn't care, and the gods help whoever's in his way. At an unspoken signal, the troops rode out, with Darren, the officers, the Rethwell and Foot coming behind. Those riders would be the first thing that Ankar's men saw, and they should assume that they were their own allies, coming up along the wrong flank. That should confuse and anger the officers, who would assume that the cavalry officers were ignoring their orders. They passed the orchards that had screened their approach from the enemy, and as Ankar's lines came into view, Darren saw that the plan was working. The officers couldn't see what was behind the lines of horse, and they were shouting something at the lead riders. This was what was happening at three points on Ankar's lines, southeast, due south, and southwest, with Darren's foot hiding behind the eastern riders. Darren waited, and the riders kept their beasts at a slow walk, waiting for the signal. It came in a burst of colored fire overhead and to their rear. The riders broke into a gallop, skeining away into the west like a flock of birds, leaving behind the foot that they'd hidden. They would go on to attack the western and southern flanks, leaving the east to Darren. Darren's trumpeter blew the charge, and while Ankar's men were still staring in confusion, the infantry, weary from having been carried on horseback all night, hit their lines with a clash of metal on metal. They were too tired to make it much of a charge, but they were much better off than they would have been if they'd come all this way on foot instead of being carried pillion or sharing one of the riderless horses. Darren spurred his horse after them, intending to join his men on the line. At odds like these, every sword was going to make a difference. His gelding's hooves thudded on the dry ground in time with his pounding heart. All of the enemy nearby seemed to be engaged. He looked around for a target. He thought he could see a melee to his right, with horses boiling in and out of a cloud of dust but it was hard to tell if it was just a confused lot of escaped horses or a real engagement. He turned his gelding in that direction anyway, and a wild arrow shot his horse out from under him. He felt the horse start to go down, tried to save himself, but the poor beast somersaulted over, throwing him from the saddle into a bush. He fought clear of the branches and looked around frantically for another set of reins, knowing he had to get up above the foot so he could see what was going on. There, 
a white horse galloped out of the dust cloud and headed straight for him as if he'd called it. He didn't even stop to marvel at his good luck. He just grabbed for the dangling reins and looked up met a pair of blue eyes that went on forever, with a jolt like taking a mace to his skull. Oh, my. I am Jason, said an imperious voice in the back of his head. You are Darren. I choose you. Now get the hell up here on my back before you get killed. He didn't remember doing so, and the next thing he knew, he was up in the saddle and looking around for some of his own people. His attention was caught by an embattled little group on the edge of the general melee. My lord! someone shouted, and he turned. It was his aide, trying to get his attention. Somehow his own personal guard had managed to catch up with him. He didn't remember that, either. He looked back to see if the group still fought. It was fairly obvious that this group held someone important. They were besieged on all sides, and most of the fighters surrounding them kept trying to pull the members of the group from their saddles, rather than trying to kill them. Centermost was a woman. She was armored, but she'd evidently lost her helm. Her gold hair gleamed incongruously in the sunlight, confined only by... Dear gods, that's the royal coronet. She was giving a good account of herself, slashing at those around her as if she'd been taking lessons in mayhem from his old teacher, Tarma. But at those odds, she and her defenders weren't going to last too long. Over my dead body. Come on! he shouted, and started to drive his spurs into his... Dear gods! His companion launched himself at the queen's position before spur could even touch flank. Don't do that! Don't ever do that. Don't even think about it. The wind of their passing whipped the words of apology out of his throat. But it didn't matter. They hit the enemy from behind, with Jason doing as much fighting as Darren. For the first time, Darren had an idea what it was like to have a war steed. Indeed. Jason turned a man's head into red ruin with his forefeet, fastidiously dancing aside to avoid the blood. A war steed. I think not. Sorry, Darren replied weakly. And then he was much too busy to think, much less reply. Then, there was no one in front of his sword, and nothing under Jason's hooves. Selene was sheathing her sword and looking in his direction with a thousand questions in her eyes. Jason blew out a breath and relaxed. The companion paced gracefully toward the Queen of Valdemar with his head held high and stopped just close enough for Darren to reach for her hand and kiss it properly. And there was no doubt in Darren's mind that this was what his companion expected him to do. He pushed back the visor of his helm and wiped the blood from his own right hand and started to reach and met Selene's eyes. Selene's bright blue eyes and felt the words freeze on his tongue. Hmm, Jason said, smugly in his mind. See something you like? And from the look on the queen's face, she was having a similar tongue-tying experience. Caro rode up beside Geyer and slapped his arm to get his attention. Get out there, she shouted waving at the lines of Ankar's fighters who were now turning tail and running, heading for the east and even casting aside weapons and shields in order to run faster. Already some of the skybolts, carried away by battle fever, were spurring their tired horses to follow. Sound assembly! she yelled at him. Get those fools back here before they found her! Geyer nodded and cantered his horse after them. Caro sagged in her place, suddenly exhausted. It wasn't easy riding a horse without saddle or reins. Doing so in battle was doubly hard. She was just as glad now that her cousins had taught her how and drilled her in it till she was ready to drop. But this had to be the most remarkable beast she'd ever sat. Better than any of the Hellsbanes. It was uncanny, the way it had seemed to read her mind and act accordingly. She looked down at the back of the beast's head, 
so covered in yellow dust that it was impossible to say what color it was. Well, love, she said, patting his neck. Hellsbane's gone to the Star-Eyed's pastures, but you seem to have been sent by the Chenot in Lady herself. Let's get a look at you. She swung her leg over the horse's shoulder and slid down to the ground, then turned with one hand on the horse's shoulder to look into its eyes. It's blue eyes. And it was not yellow, as she saw when it shook itself and shed the dust in a cloud. It was white, tall, blue-eyed, and white, as the purest of summer clouds. Oh, my, she said weakly, caught in those eyes as the eyes were caught in her gaze. I am Savil. You are my... Look out! But Caro only turned in time to see the mace coming at her too quickly to block. Hydaltha's tits! Darren happened to look away from Selene's eyes just in time to see the dead man leap to his feet and swing his mace down on Caro's head. Jason reacted faster than he did. Before he managed to get out more than a simple, No! The companion had twisted around like a weasel and was charging Caro's attacker at a gallop. The man saw them coming, but had no chance to do more than raise his arm ineffectually before he was under Jason's hooves. Not just Jason's hooves. Another companion shouldered him aside and began pounding the man into red dust. Darren jumped off Jason with Selene right behind him and went to his knees beside Carowyn's body. He felt under her chin, then her wrist, for a pulse. Dear God, oh dear God, she's not breathing. I can't feel a pulse. Then he was shoved aside by a man in filthy, blood-flecked whites, a man who pounded Caro's chest, then clamped his mouth over hers to force air into her lungs. Darren still had Caro's wrist when, suddenly, he felt the steady beat beneath his fingers, and she coughed and took a long breath. He got out of the way as the herald fumbled with the chin strap of her helm, while Selene loosened her throat guard. The other herald was cursing the helm and cursing her, and swearing as the tears poured down his face that if she died, he was going to kill her. Her eyes opened, just as the herald got the helm off, and she looked straight up at him. That's a little extreme, isn't it, Keachar? she said mildly, just before her eyes rolled up into her head, and she passed out. Darren decided that this was a good time to go collect Caro's troops and take over the mopping up. Caro tugged at the hem of her pristine white tunic and looked out over the grounds of the Herald's Collegium from her vantage point atop an old observation tower. She scowled as she realized what she was doing and clasped her hands behind her back. As she did so, her hand brushed Need's hilt. She left it there for a moment, but there was no sign from the sword. She half expected the blade to demand to be passed to Elspeth when the fighting was all over. But it hadn't stirred at all since that single moment of recognition. Well, the tradition is that the sword passes when the new bearer is about to go do something dangerous, and Elspeth's not likely to go running off on her own any time soon. But I can't say as I'd miss the damn thing too much. Ankar, or rather his army, had run back home to Hardorn with tails tucked between legs. Bobbed tails. Those suicidal farmers Darren had brought in had done an immense amount of damage before they were cut down. Valdemar was safe, for a while at least. Then there would be more tying Valdemar to Rethwellen than just a promise. Selene was absolutely head over heels in love with, of all people, Darren. And he was just as disgustingly smitten as she was. You could hardly get them apart. Eldon swore it was a life bond. I'll have to remember to tell her he snores when he's drunk. Talia and that man mountain of hers were giggling about the situation every time Caro saw them. Even Princess Elspeth seemed to find it all very amusing. Caro wondered how amusing she'd find it, when she suddenly had infant sisters and brothers to tend. Selene was no old hag, and fertility ran in Darren's family. 
Oh, well. Faram is just going to have to learn to get along without the best Lord Marshal he's ever had. I don't think you're going to be able to pry Darren out of Voldemar without a crowbar. She caught herself tugging the hem of her tunic again and scowled down at it. How in hell could I be a Harold at my age? She demanded of the heir. I've got things to do. I've got a life and responsibilities. But unless she wanted to give up Sable, never. She was going to have to stay in Valdemar. But what am I going to do about the sky bolts? She asked aloud. I don't know, dear. The problem's never come up before. That's because you idiot horses never chose a merc captain before, she replied acidly. These aren't just people I order around. I've led them for ten years. They're practically my children. How can I just abandon them? Put them in the hands of somebody else, somebody like Ardana, who didn't give a damn and could take them right into disaster. None of your seconds are like Ardana, the companion pointed out. But none of my seconds have half my training either. She paced back and forth, just about ready to throw herself off the walls and be done with it. They're not ready, and I'm not ready. It's either leave you or leave them, and how can I make a decision like that? You're the only one who can. I told you she'd be up here. Gayer's black head peered over the edge of the observation platform. Captain, this obsession you have with heights is damned unnatural. He climbed into view, followed by Shallon, Scratcher, and a tumble of his little dogs. I agree. Feet belong on the ground. Captain, we voted again, Shallon said. We figured you'd be all tied up in knots about being stuck as a herald, and you having to stay and us going back and all. So we figured we'd make up your mind for you. We're staying. You're what? what? Caro stuttered. How? Why? Ah, uh, it's easy enough, Scratcher said with a grin. His queen offered an unlimited contract with you as permanent captain. Once you finish that schooling they want to give you. Hellfires, Carol muttered, school, at my age. Since Quentin and the rest can't cross over the border, they're going back to Boathaven and send everybody else up here. Quentin's taking over Boathaven, make a school out of it. Just like your grandmother's, Shallon interjected. Town won't suffer by it, nor will the pensioners. I was talking with your cousins before we left. They reckoned it wouldn't be a bad thing to haul some clan strings up here, where the market's better. So I spec they'll bring Talisadrine horses up here, and let another clan take over the Boathaven horse fair. And God's help anybody who messes with them. Quentin just made master. Nobody's gonna try anything sharp on them, coming, going, or in between. Caro turned her back on them feeling as if she was being humored. So you've got it all settled for me, have you? They don't need me after all. I guess I'm pretty redundant. Hellfire, Captain! Shallon snarled, so fiercely it forced Carol to turn to look at them. This was the only way these damn white coats had let us keep you. You think we're gonna let you go kiting all over this heathen country by yourself? Not likely. If you're gonna find some action, we want a piece of it. A down there, Captain. You've gone and landed us in the cream, Gayer said shrewdly. Scratcher has not told you our hire. The Queen is deeding us a border town. Can you imagine it? Scratcher chuckled. Us, landed gentry, no less. There is no way we're letting you out of our sight. You took the skybolts from half a company to landed status. We want to see what else you come up with. We may yet wind up dukes or something. Sides, Shallon growled, scuffing her boot toe against the stone. These folks need us, and some of your damn morals is rubbing off on us. High time, too. We'll see about that. You people could use a good shaking up, Sable. Caro shook her head and looked down at the pure white tunic. 
Damn. I guess I don't have a choice if I'm going to convert you ruffians to honest citizens. Geyer made a rude sound, and Shallon did her village idiot imitation. Dear gods, what have I gotten myself into? We're gonna shake him up, Captain, said Scratcher, echoing her earlier retort to Sable. They could use it, she agreed. Gods, there's one thing I'd like to do. Is there any way we can camouflage this oh-shoot-me-now uniform? Could be, Captain, Scratcher said with a wink. I'll work on it. I guess we're just gonna have to get used to a new kind of arrow, Captain. Shallon grinned. I time for that, too. We're supposed to be flexible. You can keep us all on our toes, and you can start with Elden, I think. And you should have guessed the old troopers noticed how you two feel about each other. They think this is a perfect solution for that, too. And they're taking bets on when the hound fasting's going to be. Caro chuckled. Lady, you're going to get flexible like you've never seen it before. And Elden's going to get some real surprises. In that case, I think this is going to work out. She saluted them, and all three returned the salute. Come on, she told them. Let's go scandalize Valdemar. For starters, Shallon observed, we're going to have to teach these white coats how to have a real party. As the tailor draws say, may you live in interesting times. Caro threw back her head and laughed. You got it, horse lady. And may you get, not what you deserve, but your heart's desire. You know, lovely lady, Caro sent back to her, as she followed her troopers down to tell the rest that she'd accepted their solution. I think I have. Beyond all logic and expectation, I actually think I have. This concludes By the Sword by Mercedes Lackey Narrated by Amy Landon Copyright 1991 by Mercedes R. Lackey this unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Daw Books Incorporated and was produced in the year 2020 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright there too. Please visit tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.